coming. Give me one second. My board doc is not. We are ready when you are, Mrs. Wright. Okay. Mr. Purse is with us? Yes. Great. Okay. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We will call our July 15, 2020 special meeting to order. And at this time, will Mr. Colon stand and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? The flag. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Colon. Uh, I'd like to welcome my guests at the dais and those that are joining us virtually. I have Mr. Carl Persis representing District 4. I have Mr. Ruben Colon representing District 5. Our school board attorney, Mr. Ted Doran, Ms. Erin Lieberman, our agency clerk, Ms. Jamie Haynes, representing District 1, my vice chairman, Ms. Linda Cuthbert, representing District 3, Mrs. Car Dr. Carmen Bagaban, our interim superintendent, and I'm Ida Wright, representing District 2. Items for approval on this agenda are items 4.01, 5 5.01, and 5.02. Public, participa public participation times. Time will be provided for public comments on any action uh, before, before the board takes a vote on them. A total of one hour will be provided for public comments pertaining to fall reopening presentation. And for public comments during the virtual meetings, please call area code 386-734-7190, extension 20236. Again, I'll repeat that number, area code 386-734-7190, extension 20236. At this time, because it is a special meeting, we will move right into our agenda. Uh, Dr. Bagabin, are there any agenda changes? Yes, Yes, ma'am. We are requesting items 3.01 and 4.01 related to administrative appointments to be moved from today's agenda to the July 28, 2020 regular school board agenda. And item 6.01, Ortona Osceola Consoli Consolidation and Capital Fund Presentation to be moved to the August 4, 2020 regular school board agenda. Thank you, Dr. Bagobin. Bagobin. Uh, colleagues, are any other items that we need removed or if not i will entertain a motion to approve the agenda with the necessary corrections chairwoman Wright, i do have a question so when we say we're going to limit public comment to an hour will we reopen for public comment after no we will not because this is a presentation this is not an action item when we actually vote uh on the plan we will have public participation open for the duration that's today or that would be yes and we will get to that we will have to do a call meeting because it was advertised as the presentation of the plan not as an action item so we will be reconvening to have an action item uh, actionable so, go ahead so the reason i ask is because i've all the members of the community that have reached out to me i have said to them that they i've given them the phone number and said, please call in, we will have public participation. And I would hate to think that we'd be limiting that, especially after understanding, and that's the message I've said to folks is, please call in, let us know what you think. So um, I, I, am, I think we should give folks the opportunity and I have advertised it as such to our community. So, I mean, I don't know where anybody else stands with that, but I think uh, just as other districts, we may have more than an hour worth of folks calling in. 
uh, to share their public comment. So that's my thought. And, and I hear you, and I'll open up for the rest of our colleagues to feel free to uh, give your opinion. But if we were following our, even a special meeting, if it's a non-voting item, we only give 15 minutes. So we did decide to give it an hour because this was not an actionable item. But colleagues, it is really your pleasure. Uh, Mr. Persis, I'll start with you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I just thought this might be a, a good time for uh, Mr. Doran to weigh in and maybe share some of the protocols uh, for this meeting, just so that we're all clear. Yes, that's fine. Go ahead, uh, Attorney Doran. Uh, thank you, Chairman Wright. <clears throat> I will address, uh, there have been a number of questions that have been posed to me, both by individual board members and also by some of the district staff and the superintendent, just on procedure only. And so let me just kind of run through that real quick so that everybody's on the same page and the public is also aware of, of what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how this thing will proceed. Um, we noticed this meeting from the outset as with regard to the school reopening as a presentation, which is along the lines of a workshop. Uh, that means that the board, is, the public was told in the notice that the board would not be taking any action on the item at today's meeting, but of course, we'll be taking action on the item at some point in the future. So we, we cannot, uh, and nobody's asking that we do this, but we cannot take any action on school reopening today. Now, when it comes to public input, what that means is that the public input can be restricted because we're not voting. And there will be a day and a time, and I would urge you to pick that day and time. I understand it will be sometime around a week from now where we will be taking noticing a, a meeting and taking action on the school reopening item at that point there will be unlimited uh, public input but that having been said absolutely public input can be received at any point including this presentation item and it can be anything from uh, reduced you know 15 minutes an hour or it can be unlimited. That will be at the direction of the majority of the board. So however the board decides to proceed in terms of opening this particular meeting up to the public, you have the discretion to do everything from nothing to an unlimited access at this point in time, re-emphasizing the point that the only reason that we can do that is because there will be a day, as I said, probably a week from now, when there, we will have no choice, not that we would not want to do it, but that then uh, legally the, the meeting, because you're going to take a vote, would have to be opened up to the public in an unlimited sense, everybody getting their three minutes, everybody uh, you know, speaking only one time, everybody not being able to delegate your time. You can't say, I've, got two, I've spent two minutes, but I'm going to give a minute to somebody else cannot do that uh, and of course as always uh, we all we have always encouraged the public uh, you know in the interest of time not to repeat what other people have said uh, unless they just want to make sure that the board knows that they agree with something but certainly they get their three minutes here respectively and so um, I think that covers all of the points and if there are any questions, of course, I'd be glad to answer them as far as procedurally, but that's where we are today. There's going to be, I believe, the superintendent has some documents maybe that are going to be passed out. That's fine. Discussion. Um, there is going to be a point in time, potentially, depending on where the board decides to go with some of these issues, where, and I've talked to Mr. Pendley at length, uh, and he will speak to this as well, about the fact that we will have to do maybe an emergency rulemaking procedure and that new meeting that we might set a week from now would dovetail nicely with that if if for instance a mandate for masks or something like that were uh, to be directed so madam chair unless there's any questions madam chair. that's that's the overview okay thank you mr Dorn. just a moment uh, just one moment mr Colon. Uh, I want to see if any of the other colleagues want to weigh in, and then I'll come back to you. Uh, Mr. Persis? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Mr. Doran. Um, I concur with what the uh, what the chair said. That appears to be reasonable in our. I mean, normally we don't allow any comment uh, during a workshop, if you will. So uh, I think there is some uh, um, pent up interest, let's shall we say, in, in this issue. And I think uh, most people out there perhaps thought that we were going to take some official action tonight. Uh, and uh, uh, so I certainly want to give uh, uh, people that that opportunity to weigh in. And just so uh, I can get further clarification here, uh, Madam Chair, would you be taking that input um, like after staff makes their presentations, uh, is that what you were thinking? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I would uh, agree to too. Yeah. I think that's that's the best way to do it. Often, once the uh, public hears um, what the presentation is, that kind of answers many of the questions that they had. So, uh, I think that's great. No, I understand. And my, I guess what I'm hearing from Mr. Doran is that before this meeting ends, we're going to establish our next meeting. Uh, is that correct, Madam Chair? That is correct. Okay, thank you. That's the only questions I had. Okay, Ms. Cuthbert. Um, do we have people waiting right now? I'm sure we do. Uh, I would have to find out from Kelly how many, but I'm sure we do. Okay. Is it possible those who are waiting now are guaranteed uh, to be heard if they're going to be waiting all the way through this? I think we owe it to them who've called in. Yes, and I do believe they informed them, Ms. Cuthbert, but I'll double check and let you know. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh huh. Ms. Haynes? Um, now that I know that it's the public input is going to be after the presentation, I, um, I, I'm open to whatever, you know, I think it would depend on the sheer number of callers that have called in. I do like the fact though that we're going to share the information with everyone as well as we'll be hearing it, um, so that people can formulate what it is they want to say based on what the um, district and all the committees have come up with to present to us, you know, as part of the reopening plan. If we're going to vote on this, though, at another date, and that's going to be unlimited, um, you know, if we're going to be here still at this time tomorrow, then I would say we you know, I understand extending maybe an hour, but I don't know that we need six hours. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Colon. And so amongst the confusion on this meeting, I will say that we did advertise that there will be public comment uh, in this meeting amongst that confusion. So uh, it, the confusion was set from day one in whether or not this was gonna be a meeting we were gonna be voting on or not. So we did advertise uh, public comment and did share with folks the information to have public comment as if it was going to take place. So that's my only point, thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and, and just for a point of clarification, I think we always have on there for uh, public comment. I, and then it says, too, we definitely give time for uh, items that were voted, and that was not listed as an actionable item. But uh, we, we will look at the numbers and we can address that, but I would like to go ahead. And um, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Well, you know, I take that back. We did not. Uh, is there a motion <laughs> to accept the agenda with the necessary corrections? So moved to accept the agenda by removing items 3.01, 4.01, and 6.01 and moving them to later board meeting dates. Okay, I'll second that one. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Any other uh, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, I start with you, uh, Mr. Cologne. Aye. Ms. Haynes. Yay. Mr. Persis. Yay. Ms. Cuthbert. 
Yes. And Ida Wright, yes. Thank you, colleagues. We'll move right along to our first um, action item, which is the purchase of materials and supplies under the CARES Act grant. Uh, Superintendent Balgobin. Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to call Ms. Maria Kraft, our Director of Purchasing and Warehouse Services, to present this item. Thank you, ma'am. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, Chairman of the Board, members of the Board. Thank you for your consideration to allow us to bring two agenda items to this special board meeting today. I understand there is a lot on the agenda to cover, so I'll try to be very brief. Um, agenda 5.01, we are seeking approval to utilize the CARES Act, the CARES grant fund allocated for the summer recovery program and the early learning rising kindergarten program. The supply budget for the GEARS Fund, as stated, is 767968 This is for various consumables and workbooks for the summer school. As you know, summer school started early this month. The schools are using on-hand supplies to make it work for now, but we would like to place the order as soon as possible for the students to take advantage of the products and materials before the summer is over. So this is one of the reasons why this entry could not wait until the next board meeting. Um, the intended school, uh, targeted schools for the GEARS Fund is Blue Lake, Champion, Palm Terrace, Pearson, South Daytona, Stark, Tory T, Westside, and Spirit. And the Early Learning Rising Kindergarten Program grant, the supply budget for that is 378456 And the targeted schools are Pearson, South Daytona, Stark, Westside, Spirit. Um, and that's, that's it for the first um, agenda, 5.01. Moving on to the second agenda item 5.02, we are seeking approval to secure technology devices for teachers through direct negotiation using the device as a service, as a procurement model, uh, meaning the devices will be provided by the vendor to the district with the necessary service package that can support the day-to-day -day, um, operational requirements through a monthly payment plan. It, it will provide a solid foundation for the budget, budgeting purposes um, this model should allow the district to spread the capital investment for longer term and we can scale the distribution quickly. So the initial capital investment is affordable and scalable. Um, we are targeting to replace uh, between 2,200 and 2,500 devices depending on availability and the final system configuration to determine costs and the monthly payments. Um, the availability of inventory is becoming very challenging every day. So the supply chain for raw materials and precious metals to manufacture the devices have a, um, we're having a large shortage. And that was one of the reasons why we are asking to include this agenda to this meeting um, to avoid any further delays in the acquisition process. Um, these are the two agenda items that we are seeking for your approval. We certainly hope for your consideration and um, feel free to ask any questions if you have any. Thank you for that information. Colleagues, do you have any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Colon. <laughs> so first of all, I want to thank, uh, oh, let me turn my camera on. I'd like to thank the district for including uh, Spirit Elementary as one of the school sites. I know that that definitely is going to benefit my community and our children. So again, I want to say thank you for that. Um, and so on the uh, device replacement, I do have a question for Clint, if he's available. Yes, sir, he is online. Uh, so my question for Clint is, um, here we're looking at teachers. Could you explain the why we need to do this at this time? Say that again. Can you explain to the public why it is that we are prioritizing uh, the technology and, and, and the urgency around uh, providing uh, devices that are up to date for teachers? Yes, sir. So um, we, we have a, a longer term strategic plan <clears throat> that is a little bit fast tracked that we are trying to take the district to a one to one model. And um, we hope to do that um, probably in the next 12 months, but we are working very, very diligently on a plan to accomplish that. But this is really the first stage of that. 
you can't have technology in the students' hands without adequate technology in the teachers' hands. And we wanted to include the program together. That way, if, if schools get refreshed, the teachers get refreshed on that tame, same scale. And, and part of our model that we'll be talking a little bit later about the plan, really there's a big emphasis on technology and the importance of that technology being in the teachers' hands as well as the students' hands. But as Maria mentioned, there's a backlog of ordering inventory right now. So the sooner we get this in, and hopefully we get a, a big majority of these devices in prior to the school start, that we, we can get this technology and empowered in the, in the teacher's hands to be able to utilize on the plan that we hope to roll out. And uh, the four-year plan, the goal is to never have a device in a student or teacher's hand that's older than four years. Very good, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other comments, colleagues? Go ahead, Ms. Haynes. So um, my question is actually for Dr. Balgobin. Do we, since the summer programs have already started that we're approving the GEARS um, funds tonight in order to purchase materials, do we have any, you know, student numbers yet as far as how many students are attending at each site, um, including like the, you know, pre-kinder, well, the part for rising kindergartners? And if so, and I and I don't expect you to have it with you at the moment, can we get like an updated email from you that just shares with us how many students we're actually impacting right now in those um, summer programs that are being held at those sites? Yes, ma'am. Um, as a matter of fact, Ms. Hain, that's a very good question. I did have the numbers for you as of last week. I will get them updated to date so far. But I can tell you that uh, last week we monitored Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and then the, the initial numbers that we anticipated at each school, we are right around those numbers. So I will get an updated um, copy for you to reflect this week. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Persis or Ms. Cuthbert, do you have any questions? I do not have any questions. I do appreciate uh, getting the information. Sounds like a real good plan. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there Madam a recommend? Chair? Yes. Oh. Sorry, uh, Madam Chair. Anytime we can help our rising kindergartners, it's always a good step in place. I'm a huge supporter of the pre-K programs across our county. Um, and when we address the needs of the most needy, whether it's economically, socially, um, mentally, physically, it's always, always a, a, a good thing to invest in the best investment we can make. And the other question I had has already been answered, one by Mrs. Haynes and one by Mr. Colon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Bagelman, is there a recommendation? Yes, ma'am. I would rec I'm recommending the approval to purchase the materials and supplies under the CARES Act for the GEAR Summer Recovery Grant, an Early Learning Coalition Rights and Kindergarten Program grant. Um, can I do both recommendations? Let, let, let's do one, one at, at a time. time. Okay. So, colleagues, you've heard the superintendent recommendation for item 5.01, the purchases, the purchase of materials and supplies under the CARES Act. What is your pleasure? Madam Chair, I make a motion that we approve the purchases and material supplies under the CARES Act. Thank you. Is there second. a second? Thank second. You. The motion has been properly moved and second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright, yes. Thank you. And the vote passed unanimously. Superintendent uh, Bagabin, item 5.02. Yes, Madam Chair. I would like to recommend the approval to secure the technology devices for teachers through direct negotiations using the device as a service recruitment model under district policy 702. Thank you. You heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. The motion has been properly moved and second. Any other discussion? Um, may yeah. I ask how many uh, pieces of technology are being ordered? I didn't quite see it. Yes. Colin, is it 4,000? 
Uh, at this time, we do not have the exact numbers, but we want to definitely do the secondary, and then we are looking to see um, how much we can actually get in, and that will be the original order, but at least the secondary levels and possibly more. And what that'll do is there's a lot of really good secondary devices already in teachers' hands that we're going to um, attriculate down to the elementary levels, and it will give the amount of technology and then some for everybody having a very good device as a teacher going forward. And then next year we will add to the brand new devices kind of like what we're doing with students. Anything that's over that four years or not up to par or the screen's not big enough or if it's not, you know, having the equivalent that is now our new standard for teachers, you know, touch screen, um, you know, the tablet, the all-in-one, the two-in-one, we are going to have the same technology starting that we get for all of teachers to kind of mirror what that student has in their hand. Thank you. Okay. So all secondary teachers will get a new one? That is the plan for this 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 year um, because that is the, the big chunk of the power user group but there is a I believe all of the newer devices I don't want to say all of them but a big majority of the newer devices that have been in that teachers have gotten over the last couple of years have been into the secondary. So we are going to take those devices and trickle them down and use the ones that are the bigger screens, the devices that meet our standards and fall within that couple of year time frame that are not old. And they will all have devices that are up to our new standard. So probably I would say somewhere between 2000 and 2500 is what we will obtain this go around which is probably about half of our actual teacher population. And then we will actually next year do another sweep and the following year do a sweep and then it will be a, ro a rotational basis just like the students are on. That way if we do a school, so when our plan is to do all of secondary for the one-to-one -one and then do the same methodology and trickle down the devices to elementary, so they will be on that same rotation. So then if we add in a year or two, the, the elementary with new devices, that's when we will put the new devices in the elementary's hands. That way they're all on that same interval and that same timetable of refresh of four years. Thank you very much for that clarification. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Do we have any other comments, questions? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Uh, Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright? Yes. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, we'll move now to the item of the hour, our presentation <laughs> for fall reopening. Dr. Bagabin? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Board? Okay. Can we pull up the presentation, please? I don't see it displayed yet, so you, okay, there you go. Thank you. Again, good afternoon, Madam Chair, school board members, and members of our community. It will truly be an understatement to say that the topic of reopening has not raised concerns and questions from many students, parents, and staff. I want everyone to be assured, the families and community members that have brought forward their input and suggestions to our board members and to cabinet members that your feedback is being reviewed and discussed by our teams. I want you to know that I can relate to many of the comments and concerns that, that are being shared with us. So I'm going to get a little bit personal with you today. On a personal note, I want to share something with you. I am a daughter to an elderly parent. I'm also the mother to a mental health counselor in a K-8 school setting. I am the sister to a school bookkeeper. And I'm also my other half is an assistant principal in a middle school. So here's what I want you to know. I think of each of these important people in my life while also carefully considering the important people in your life. While it's clear 
that no one has all the answers and we cannot clearly predict future circumstances, what we have learned over the last few months, it's very clear that if we come together and work together as a team, that will make us much, much, much stronger. So let's always remember that as we move forward. So a little bit about teamwork. The, it really took an incredible team to pull this together. As we get started this afternoon, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the committee members. They have worked so tirelessly, tirelessly over the last few weeks in developing this plan, our reopening plan for presentation today. Our members consist of students because they're important. That's who we are here to serve. They were part of our plan. Medical experts, because we know that we need their opinion and their, um, the factual information that they have to share with us. Our teachers, these are the individuals on a day-to-day -day basis that are in the field doing the job. Our principals, again, these are the individuals on a day-to-day -day basis, they're in the field doing the work. Our curriculum specialists, our VIEW members, our technology specialists, safety and security experts, transportation members, schoolway cafe team, parents, and community members. At the end of our presentation, we'll be sharing more information about these individuals and who have given so much of their time, talent, and experiences to make Volusia County a great place to learn. As we look at our distance learning, a couple of things I wanna share. It's important for us to know where we are going but in order to determine where we're going, we also have to look and, and, and go back and, and look at where we've been. I think it's important to pause here and review where we've been over the last few months. As you know, we're not yet, as Mr. Griffin has stated, we're not yet a one-to-one -one district, but I will tell you what, we're on our way to accomplishing this very important goal. I'm proud to share with you that during our instructional continuity uh, plan implementation, we provided over 10,000 devices to families in need. Additionally, we have continued to provide the necessary technology resources during our summer school learning experiences. We have been able to extend learning opportunities to so many homes throughout the district. It's safe to say that despite physical school buildings being closed in the spring, we continue to provide instruction thanks to our dedicated families teachers, and staff. So moving forward, let's talk a little bit about moving forward. I'm eager to share with you our plan. We all need to understand that our plan is fluid. It's a fluid plan. And here's why. What we know now could change a week from now. Actually, what we know now could change tomorrow. That's important to note. So therefore, flexibility and adaptability will have to be the norm in how we operate during these uncertain times. I'm sure, as you can imagine, safety is also the, dri the driving force as it relates to most of our decisions, and rightfully so. We have specific details within our plan to keep you abreast of those safeguards and protocols that will be implemented throughout our campuses. During the implementation of the instructional continuity plan that took place this spring and into the summer, another thing that we know is that a lot of our students have experienced greater instructional loss than ever before, especially for our most fragile students. Commonly, this is being referred to as the COVID slide, for this school year, assessing learning loss for all students is also a top priority with an, with an intense fo focus and consideration for our special population and students groups. Within our plan, we will be sharing back to school options with you and at the core of each option is our commitment to rigorous instruction for all students regardless of the learning environment. 
robust and effective progress monitoring is also a key to students' growth and success. We have heard your request, and we understand that flexibility has become essential. And last, but certainly not least, compassion. As we work together, we're so much stronger. We know that families will need to make decisions that will best meet their child's needs and personal circumstances. Also, here's another thing that we do know. On July the 6th, the Florida Department of Education issued an emergency order specifically pertaining to the re reopening of schools. In this emergency order, districts are required to open schools at least five days a week in a traditional school setting. Within the order, specific guidance was provided on the reopening requirements, which later we will elaborate on. As you can see, there are many requirements which include, and, and clearly we must provide to the state. I had like to ask at this point in time, board, for our general counsel, Mr. Kevin Pendley, who is here with us today, to share the legal connotation and implications of an emergency order and the roles and responsibilities of the board and the superintendent as it relates to an emergency order. Mr. Pendley? Thank you, Dr. Bogobin, um, Madam Chair, members of the board. The presentation that you will hear this afternoon uh, is in direct response to, uh, as Dr. Bogobin mentioned, Commissioner Corcoran's emergency order of July the 6th. As you know, the commissioner's emergency order was issued in accordance with the governor's executive orders declaring a state of emergency in response to the COVID pandemic. In essence, that order requires school districts in Florida to reopen brick and mortar schools with a full panoply of services in August of 2020. Upon the Department of Education's approval of a reopening plan consistent with the emergency order, the Department of Education may offer limited flexibility, and I stress limited, uh, in the dates fixed for opening of schools and closing of schools and the minimum days or equivalent hours during the school year that the board sets. Importantly, this limited waiver does not constitute a waiver of state statute in these areas, but it's intended to demonstrate how the district is going to adhere to those statutes and rules in light of the current circumstances for the 2020-2021 school year. The purpose of this presentation is to seek the board's guidance and input into the parameters of the district's proposed reopening plan for submission to the Department of Education. In order uh, to be in compliance with that emergency order of the department and Commissioner Corcoran, it's true, brick and mortar schools are required to reopen in August, that means prior to August 31st, 2020. They must be open for at least five days per week for all students. The reopening of brick and mortar schools will be subject to the advice and orders of the Florida Department of Health, local departments of health, or further orders, executive orders by the governor. So there is a caveat to the commissioner's order that he is, uh, let's go back one slide if we could please. Uh, we're still looking at those five tenants of what uh, should be number six, I think. Uh, absent the uh, further order of the Department of Health, uh, it is still the discretion of the local board and the superintendent to open or close individual schools. So what the, exec the emergency order talks about in this respect is that in the event that the department of health or a local department of health issues guidance or advice concerning the safety of opening schools. Certainly all schools within the district may be subject to uh, closure in the future, but in the absence of that direction, in the event that one particular school has an issue uh, related to health and safety concerns, the board and the superintendent may exercise discretion in those circumstances to close that school uh, or a portion of the school for health and safety reasons. I didn't want to uh, get into the, too much of that at this point, but I want you to understand that as a caveat within the emergency order. So what does the emergency order require in order to obtain 
the limited flexibility. We're addressing the full panoply of services that includes the full array of services that are required by law so that parents who choose to send students back to brick and mortar schools full time, five days a week, may do so. Those services must include in-person instruction, again, barring state or local health department directives, specialized instruction for students with disabilities, those in the exceptional student education program with IEPs, or live synchronous or asynchronous instruction with the same curriculum as in-person instruction and providing the students with ability to interact with each student's teacher and peers. So there is an option for synchronous or asynchronous instruction in addition to opening brick and mortar schools. The full panoply of services must consider especially the needs of the most vulnerable students among the population, including students who may be homeless, exceptional student education students, those in foster care, those who, ha who have English language learner needs, among others. I think that the presentation you'll see today demonstrates how the district is willing and able to respond to those students' needs. Reopening plans must contain robust progress monitoring uh, with data collection and reporting periodically to the Department of Education. The reopening plan must have a tiered system of supports for students not making adequate progress and an opportunity to transition those students who are in an alternative mode of education to transition to other modes of instruction if the student is not making adequate progress according to the data monitoring. You will hear in this presentation how uh, the district's plan addresses the robust data collection, monitoring, and reporting requirements that the department is seeking in order to uh, guarantee the flexibility uh, under the, under the executive component of the reopening plan requires that the design address equitable flexibility with charter schools within the district. Charter school boards must submit plans to the district for reopening and the district's reopening plan approval by Department of Education may be withheld if the district, uh, until the district's approval of charter plan reopening occurs. So that is what we are here to discuss today is how all of those components within the emergency order can be satisfied so that the district's plan can be approved by the Department of Education. The board's role and responsibilities in that are set forth um, in constitutional and statutory authority. The board obviously pursuant to Article 9, Section 4B of the Florida Constitution has the duty and responsibility to control, operate, and supervise all free public schools within the district and determine the tax rate. The board's constitutional authority is then enabled in statute that require the public schools be under the control of the school board with the district school superintendent as executive officer. As a practical matter, the board may not only act as a legislate, may only act as a legislative body at a public meeting, and no one board member alone may act for the board as a whole. Consequently, the superintendent as executive officer is responsible for carrying out the day-to-day -day operations of all applicable state and federal laws, rules, and the board's adopted policies. It is the sole and exclusive responsibility of the school board to adopt policies for the opening and closing of schools and the plans for operation of schools. This function is particularly applicable in what you will hear today. The board also has statutory duties, including establishing policies for the health, safety, and welfare of students, providing for the operation of schools for the 180-day school year or hourly equivalent, and more recently, the board's duties have grown to include requirements to provide students with access to virtual instruction programs and granting the uh, credit based on completion of those virtual courses to those students enrolled in virtual education. Most importantly, the board is charged by statute with the responsibility to ensure that all laws and rules of the State Board of Education and of this district be properly enforced. 
As I mentioned, the board acts through its executive officer. Let's go to the next slide, please, nine. The board acts through its executive officer, the superintendent of schools in the day-to-day -day operations. The superintendent also has statutory duties and responsibilities that include general oversight of the operations of the district school system, and he must report issues and recommend improvements in the public school system to this board. The superintendent is charged with making recommendations for the establishment, organization, and operation of classes and services necessary to provide educational opportunities for all students in the school district. Most importantly, the superintendent is also charged, like the board, with responsibility to ensure that all laws and rules of the State Board of Education and of this district are properly observed and report any violations to this board that the superintendent does not succeed in correcting on his own. So let's move to slide 10. The consequences of not following an emergency order are not specified in the emergency order. However, the order does address that reporting flexibility and funding necessary to provide financial continuity in the fall of 2020 are going to be considered for those districts that submit and obtain department approval of reopening plans. Districts that receive approval of the reopening plan with innovative learning models will be allowed to report those students for full-time equivalent credit. That's FTE credit, you might've heard the acronym. But students receiving virtual instruction only must be reported for full funding at the virtual rate and only upon course completion. Those students would presumably not count for a full projected FTE credit. In the event, in the unlikely event, I'll add, that the governor were to determine that the board or a board member's actions were in dereliction of duty, the board, the governor may remove that member of the board from office. So, Madam Chair, unless there are any questions, Dr. Balgobin, that concludes my remarks this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Pendley. That was a very thorough explanation. At this point, before, I do have another guest that will be joining us, um, but before we, we um, ask our second guest to join us, do we have any questions, Madam Chair, board members, for Mr. Pendley? Colleagues, do you have any questions? Uh, I'll just go around. I'll start with Mr. Persis. Uh, no, Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like to uh, hear from our, our, our next guest before I uh, ask my question. Thank you. Not a problem. Ms. Cuthbert? Madam Chair, this, there, there's so much to, to discuss. Um, and, it, and it relates a great deal to the safety. Uh, Florida Statute 1001.428 a, that the school board shall provide for the proper attention to the health, safety, and other matters relating to the welfare of students. That's the one that I think is most important right now. Um, and I do believe that all these Florida statutes are there to protect our students, um, our families, and our parents, um, and all of their families. Uh, we live in a very generational uh, school district in which in which um, spouses exist. They have children in our in our schools, uh, and I'm and you you yourself, Madam Chair. We are not exceptions to the rule. Um, I'd like to hear more about from our uh, Department of Health um, uh, young lady here because we have to make sure that even though we do have to follow these um, orders and our duties to the um, state constitution, but the primary concern is the welfare of our students. Thank you, Madam Chair. So you didn't have a question for the attorney, correct? Um, no? Good point. I think we, I think I would like for him to send us an email with all that's pertinent to this. Um, as an old school person, I need to see it printed and I need to analyze it. I need to question, I need to go back and think about it. Um, all in putting it on a PowerPoint right in front of me for 
a few minutes is not enough. Um, I would like my own copy so that I can talk to him at a later date and ask my pertinent questions. But it's very difficult to absorb all of that at one time. Okay. Um, if, if, if that could be. As a person who's made her career with analyzing, I would like to analyze the language. Thank you. Uh -huh. Mr. Colon? So I have a question for Ted, which I think would be most appropriate for Ted being our school board attorney. And it, it goes back to uh, what are the consequences if I if, if we as a board decide you know what this is not in the best uh, safety for our students and teachers what what does that look like okay so I, I think the the best way to start the answer to that is uh, I don't think anybody really can say with any <laughs> degree of certainty what exactly that would look like um, it would be a question that ultimately would have to be resolved in the courts um, the uh, the presentation you just heard lays out you know the broad principles but needless to say this is an unprecedented event um, I know that there have been inferences uh, from Tallahassee, if not direct statements, that there would be financial consequences, whether or not those could be um, legally uh, implemented uh, would be, you know, the subject of dispute, I'm sure. And uh, there are many, many questions that can be raised uh, in terms of who has the power to even invoke this executive uh, emergency order, whether or not it could be even delegated to uh, this, the Department of Education as opposed to issued by the governor, uh, whether or not uh, it can be uh, enforced without state board action. And I don't know one way or the other, but I understood that some people have raised questions about whether the state board, you know, actually met and approved the order in advance. Um, you know, the, these are very broad, uh, esoteric uh, questions, legal questions that nobody's ever had to answer. There's no precedent. There's no guidance on these other than, you know, broad existing law. Um, I do think that, you know, on its face, um, we have to accept it as valid until it's questioned and proved to be invalid, and that would only be through some sort of judicial action. So um, on its face, um, as written, I would say that it, we, we should proceed as though it is a valid order. Uh, it does contain language within it, and Mr. Penley and I have talked about this, uh, you know, somewhat extensively. It contains some language within it that, uh, you know, is maybe subject to interpretation, provides some ambiguities on some level um, in terms of, you know, you're required to do this, but there are conditions under which you're not required to do it, such as you know, health uh, department involvement or lack thereof, um, because I understand that's a possibility. I mean, in short, without going on any further, you know, the answer is uh, I don't think anybody knows really exactly how it all gets sorted out if it were uh, to be pursued to a complete resolution through the judicial branch of government. Um, but, um, um, I know other, I, at least I've heard anecdotally that other districts have, uh, you know, rejected the order, and so they may be headed down that path. Um, if that's the direction the board takes, then, you know, we'll defend any decision the board makes. But um, um, I guess to close on this point, uh, I would consider it valid, uh, as written and, uh, you know, proceed accordingly. Great. Thank you. 
I have no further questions. Ms. Haynes? I have no questions at this time. I'm looking forward to the next presentation. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Bagelman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I want to emphasize one more time that we're truly thankful also for the collaboration that we've had with our medical community and the support and engagement of Ms. Patricia Boswell. She is the administrator for the Department of Health of Volusia County. Ms. Bo Boswell will be, is with us today and um, I want everyone to know that she has worked quite a bit with us on our reopening plan and was part of our committee. Ms. Boswell, can you please join us? We have three questions for Ms. Boswell, but of course the board may ask if you have any additional questions. But the one question, the first question I would say is, what are the conditions, Ms. Boswell, that you look for when determining if it is safe for schools to open? The second question, and we'll put it up here because it's, a, it's several parts to the question, so it will be there for you to see, to see visually. What are the facts regarding the use of face coverings during this time? And our third question would be, what are the procedures that should be followed when someone is exposed to COVID-19? Again, thank you, Ms. Boswell, for joining us today. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to start with uh, a little bit of a data um, preview uh, and then go into the questions. So at this point in time, there's um, more than 300 Florida, 300,000 Florida cases and more than 4,500 deaths related to COVID-19. In Volusia County, there are 4,355 cases. That's people with positive PCR or antigen test results. We've tested 53,122. When you exclude cases in facilities, the number of cases in Volusia, Volusia County is 3,760. The median age is 42. I wanna focus in on the age and number of cases um, of those under 18. To date, we've had 51 cases between the ages of zero and four, 144 cases between five and 14 years of age, and 190 between the ages of 15 and 19. 19% 19 or 820 are between the ages of 25 and 34, and that group represents the largest group of cases. This is, these are all cumulative numbers since March when we've had our first case. Volusia County, like many counties in Florida, is experiencing significant community spread. July 1st, we had 2,372 cases. Over the past two weeks, we've added another 2,100 new cases. We're closely monitoring the metrics, including hospital emergency data, epidemiology, and healthcare capability. We want to see a downward trend of positive cases as a percent of total cases. Test results for more than 1,519 individuals re were reported to us um, at midnight on Tuesday, July 14th. So today, as of 11 a.m., there are 192 positive COVID cases and one new death. So on July 14th, 12.6% of new cases tested positive. This percentage is the number of people who test positive for the first time divided by all tests, excluding people who have previously tested positive. So in comparing the first week of July to this past week, during the first week we had 823 positive tests out of um, that's the wrong number. Uh, yes, out of 6,896 for a positivity rate of 11.93%. In comparison, this past week, we had 1,281 positive test results 
out of 11,577 total tests for a positivity rate of 11.07%. On July 14th, we've had 144 individuals hospitalized with COVID. 48 of those are in our ICU units, 27 are on a vent. And these are the highest numbers we've seen. I want to acknowledge that since March, the Volusia County Schools has risen to the challenge of this changing landscape brought on us by the COVID-19 pandemic. The challenge before us now is how to make our school environments as safe as possible. This is happening with careful measures and processes that support and keep students and staff safe, are flexible to adapt as needed to the prevalence of COVID-19. So the first question, what conditions do we look for in opening up the school? CDC offers the guidance on how to make the schools as safe as possible. That's where our role lies, to assist in meeting the challenge of making the school environment as safe as possible to help protect our students, teachers, administrators, and staff, and slow the spread of COVID-19. Using the CDC readiness and planning tool has offered, or offered us ways for the schools to help protect our students and staff and slow the spread. This tool aligns with the CDC guidance the district has been using to implement additional health and safety guidelines to mitigate the spread and safely respond to students and staff. Implementation should continue to be used um, guided by what is feasible, practical, practical, acceptable, and then tailored to meet your needs. Since the more people a student or staff person member interacts with and the longer that interaction, the higher the risk of COVID-19 spreading. Our schools are implementing several strategies to encourage behaviors that reduce spread. There'll be a number of procedures in place to ensure the safety and wellness of students, employees, and ultimately the entire community. The intent of the protocols are to decrease the spread of COVID-19, as well as address and support wellness of all who enters our school buildings. We're promoting healthy behaviors, environments, and operations that will help us reduce the spread. Staying home when appropriate. That is critical to educate our staff and families about when they or their children should stay home and when they can return to school. Teaching and reinforcing hand washing with soap and water for at least 20 seconds and then increasing monitoring to ensure that adherence is happening among our students and staff. Teaching and reinforcing the use of cloth face coverings. I know it can be challenging for students, especially our younger ones, to wear in an all day setting such as school. Face coverings should be worn by staff and students as feasible and are most essential in times when physical distancing is difficult. Individuals should not be should be re frequently reminded not to touch the face covering and to wash their hands frequently. Information needs to be provided to the staff, students, the students' families on proper use, removal, and washing of face coverings. We need to post signs in highly visible locations that promote everyday protective measures and that describe how to stop the spread of germs. You can broadcast announcements as well. You can use videos about behaviors that prevent the spread, especially when you're communicating with not only our students, but staff and families. Use websites, emails, social media accounts. Cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces, discouraging the sharing of items that are difficult to clean or disinfect, Keep each child's belongings separated from others and, in, and labeled. Spacing seats and desk at least six feet apart when feasible. Turning the desk in the same direction. Creating distances between tr children on school buses. And most importantly, be prepared when someone gets sick. 
what to do, what do people need to know regarding the use of mask? A cloth face covering may not protect the person that's wearing it, but it certainly keeps others, the, the person that's wearing it from spreading the virus to others. COVID-19 spreads mainly from person to person through respiratory droplets produced when an infected person coughs, sneezes, talks, or raises their voice. These droplets can land in the mouth, nose, or eyes or of people nearby or possibly be inhaled into the lungs. Recent studies show that a significant portion of individuals with COVID-19 lack symptoms, are asymptomatic, and that even those who eventually develop symptoms, pre-symptomatic, can transmit the virus to others before showing symptoms. So to reduce the spread of COVID-19, CDC is recommending that people wear cloth face coverings in public settings when around people outside of their household, especially when other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. So cloth face coverings will help prevent people who have COVID from spreading it to others. Wearing a cloth face covering will help protect people around you, including those at higher risk for severe illness from COVID and workers who frequently come into close contact with other people. So cloth face coverings are most likely to reduce the spread when they are widely used. The spread of COVID is reduced when close cloth face coverings are used with other preventive measures, including social distancing, frequent hand washing, and cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces. And lastly, what are the procedures that should be followed when someone is exposed to COVID-19? We need to make sure that we advise those who have come into close contact with a person diagnosed with COVID-19 to stay home, self-monitor for symptoms. It's important to remember that anyone who has had close contact with someone with COVID stays home for 14 days after exposure. 14 days after exposure because that's what sometimes it can take to develop symptoms. Symptoms appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. Quarantine is used to keep someone who might have been exposed to COVID-19 away from others. It helps prevent the spread of disease that occurs before a person knows they're sick or if they've been infected with the virus without feeling symptoms. People in quarantine should stay home, separate themselves from others, monitor their health. And then if someone has symptoms of COVID-19 or has tested positive from COVID-19, they should not return to school until they have met the criteria to discontinue home, home isolation, which is three days without fever, symptoms improving, and 10 days since they had their first symptoms. When there is a case or a suspected case or a contact with the case in the school, we'll be working very closely to follow up on cases, make sure we have a dedicated team to ensure that every reported case is reviewed and handled appropriately. Subsequently, we'll be working together on investigations and contact tracings to identify the students' employees who should stay home and hopefully be able to control the spread. We'll continue to do what we've always done, which is to lean into the evidence and prioritize our children's health and safety. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boswell. At this time, board, I will ask if any of you have any additional questions. Um, I know Ms. Boswell indicated that she will remain throughout the entire presentation. I'm not sure what time this will end, but um, if we have any questions, this might be 
a good time to ask so that Ms. Boswell could probably exit the meeting after this. Thank you, Dr. Balgobin. So colleagues, uh, I'll start with Mr. Persis. Do you have any questions or for Ms. Boswell or you, or you want to reserve? Uh, thank you, Chairman Wright. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Dr. Boswell. I uh, have a question here concerning uh, uh, your comment that the that the uh, I believe you said that the spread in our county appears to be going up that we have sig significant spread in Volusia County is that correct? Uh, yes um, so Basically, at this point in time, um, we have uh, our cases are increasing, and um, many of the cases can't determine where they uh, what the source of the virus for them is. So, um, initially, when uh, back in March, when we were having you know a couple of cases a day, and we would interview these individuals infected with the virus, they were able to tell us that they had traveled um, abroad, um, come into contact. It was very um, we were able to contain the virus at that point in time through our investigation and contact tracing because we would um, monitor those individuals, ensure that they stayed home um, for the 14 days if they were uh, under uh, quarantine because they were a close contact or if they were infected uh, and isolated, they would stay home until either they had the, um, there's, you could either do a symptom-based strategy for clearance or a test base, so depending on which method they used. I see. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, I was looking at uh, trying to do some research on some other countries uh, that have managed to safely reopen their schools. And, uh, but what I've learned is uh, those countries that uh, chose to do that uh, did so with the infection rates going way, way down. And they had on-demand testing available. Uh, we don't appear to have either of those in Volusia County or, in fact, in the state of Florida. Is that correct? When you say on-demand testing, are you talking about maybe a... Um a rapid at home self administered test. Right, uh, where where you get the results? Yeah, very uh, quickly. Yes. Um, so you there's some some clinics, urgent care clinics that you can go into in Volusia County and get a rapid test and get your results pretty timely. Um, but there's no at home self administered uh, test on the market yet. Um, that would be that would be very promising, uh, just like vaccine would be in terms of. Um, bringing down the infection rate. Um, in terms of, um, you know, it was, we were hope, we were, we were glad to see that our positivity rate dropped um, this past week. Um, so that, um, that's a, a good sign. Um, but unfortunately, some of those other met metrics that I discussed um, has, they're going up. Uh, so that's that's concerning. And I do want to clarify, I, I am the administrator here. Um, I do hold a, a couple of masters, one in public health, and that's the requirement for an administrator in the uh, Department of Health in Florida. Um, and I am not an MD. Uh, um, okay, well, uh, thank you for that clar clarification. Uh, uh, you seem to be an expert in, in the area though, so that's so that's good. I thank want you. to ask you about the um, uh, the uh, cloth mask that you said. Um, I wanted to get your thinking, if you would, or share any information you might have on, on the face shields as so, opposed to the mask. Yeah, the, we, we, we see the face shield um, used quite probably the most frequent use of the face shield right now is in with the PPE. Um, so when um, first responders, healthcare workers uh, suit up in their PPE, 
um, to um, manage um, someone infected with COVID, they'll use the face shield to protect their eyes. Um, it's now being used um, in some instances where um, an individual can't use a, thought, a face cloth mask for one reason or another. Um, we have an employee here at the health department who can't use a face cloth mask. Um, and so we, um, we've we provided face shields for that individual. Uh, we also you, uh, see face shields being used for um, individuals who um, have um, hearing impairment or, uh, or hard of hearing because uh, they can't read lips, obviously, when people are wearing masks. So there's different re um, purposes for face shields. Um, um, and certainly, uh, if, I, if, I, if I didn't have a cloth mask and I had a face shield, I would use the face shield because, again, it's a, it's a measure of protection. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Persis. Uh, Ms. Cuthbert. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Boswell. Thank you for coming. I'm, um, I don't think it's very, it's been made very public about the number of cases that we have that are 18 and under. It's alarming that we have 51 in Volusia County. You said Volusia County, 51 who are zero to four years old, 144, are five to age from five to 14 and 190 age 15 to 19. And the largest median, uh, the median age is 42, which would be the average age of our parents. It alarms me that we have so many people already who are affected and schools not even in session. Um, there are cases uh, in existence, I think, when we look at when our schools were closed back in the spring, most of us did not know anyone who were um, who had been exposed or tested positive. Uh, many of the cases were the elderly and in our nursing homes. It has certainly spread in the last couple of months. Um, so I do have a huge concern for our children. I would like to speak to how you would address we have many uh, exceptional student uh, teachers and paraprofessionals who work very closely with their students. Uh, these students may not be able to understand six foot distance, uh, social distancing. Um, a lot of them might have, uh, they're in a wheelchair. How do we protect those employees who, who have to work so closely with students? Um, what is the, do you have any recommendations on how to separate students uh, once they pass classes? Or is there anything um, better that we can use in our cafeterias? Because if I remember, I think restaurants right now are at 50% capacity. How do we do 50% capacity in our cafeterias? I have a high school that is extremely overcrowded with narrow hallways at Spruce Creek High School. How do we place those students in a position that they are not going to harm one another? And if all these droplets travel, when these students eat, they're in the hallways eating, they're in the cafeteria eating, what is your recommendation that we separate these students? Um, I think all in all, I'm asking if we allow our students, we are hoping that some students go virtual and those who would come to our brick and mortar, I see it almost an impossibility to keep our students separate and to follow your very wise guidelines. Um, how do we put that into place in an overcrowded school when we really don't have the spacing um, for all of this. Our facility, have you been in our, our schools to, to look at the spacing that we do not have? So um, thank you. And uh, there, there was multiple questions in there. So yeah. please um, go back and re-ask if there's something that I should, that I should um, go over too quickly or miss. Um, so, 
let me start with um, the numbers because I think you you, you were yeah. concerned about the numbers of um, so again those were cumulative numbers since the beginning of March and I can tell you that um, many of these um, children were infected at home um, um, we started seeing after the reopening um, family gatherings big gatherings we also seen you know uh, different families coming together um, and these were families with children coming together for barbecues and different events. Um, and then um, I remember one particular um, case, it was um, two or three, three or four families maybe, 15 um, positives and out of that were pro probably four or five children. Um, so, um, you know, a couple of those events and, and you have 20 kids um, that are testing positive. Um, those are not the current number of children that are infected with COVID um, because it's cumulative and hope um, most, and it's, I hate to say recovered, I apologize for anyone who's lost a family member or is dealing with um, chronic long-term health conditions from COVID, but um, for those that have cleared uh, the virus, uh, it's usually about a third of what the numbers are. Um, but that's why I focused on the, the last two weeks because those kind of, uh, those are people that are probably still infected for the most part. Um, so the numbers can be deceiving. Um, when I say 190, 15 to 19 year olds, I don't want you to think right now in Volusia County, we have 190 um, people who are currently infected. That's over time. Um, the second part of your question in terms of, and I think it not only applies to um, students, um, that have um, come to that come to our school with um, emotional um, needs, um, and it, it could be kindergarten kids, uh, child students. And yes, I have um, a grandson. I'm proud to say I have a grandson in our in our schools here in Volusia County. So I've been in in, in um, many of the schools, um, not only from from his experience, but also um, our hurricane shelters, our special needs, and things. So, with that being said, I think that uh, the staff. Um, here in Volusia County schools have done an extraordinary job in trying to work through a lot of your questions in terms of how do we how do we um, provide lunches, how do we um, space um, classrooms, how do we move students within buildings in a safe manner. So I'm sure that's part of the presentation you're going to hear. Uh, by the superintendent and her, and her cabinet and team members, um, but they've worked on a lot of those issues. Um, and I was on one of the subcommittees and, and was part of that. They were using a lot of the CDC guidance and, and working together as a team to try to figure out what that looks like with the different floor plans at the schools and the size of the schools and the number of students. Okay, thank you. The reason why I said those numbers because there's a general myth out there that children don't get it or don't even transfer it. So if a group of people came together in a family gathering and children caught it, by nature, educators are emotional, uh, loving, touchy-feely people, um, especially at the elementary level. And if these students who haven't seen each other in months their first reaction is going to hug each other and say hello. So we're, we're teaching separation and distance. And I'm wondering if that in itself would be detrimental. Tell, kids to, tell children to stay away from each other. So that is one concern um, I do have. I'm also, I have a question. We have to have quite a few things in place. I'm sure, in order to be successful. Uh, we have to have, let's see, I have a list. Let me find my list. We have to have, uh, for success, we have to have testing, sufficient testing. It, are there enough tests for us to test our employees before they come back to school and at least once a week? And will those results be timely? Would we ha be able to contact Trace in a timely manner and have that data be accurately provided for our schools? When we have a 14-day quarantine, for example, we
we have many of our teachers are couples who teach. My husband was an administrator. I taught school. I had a daughter in the classroom. So we have three family members who are teaching, all dealing with children. So you have you can have a, a, a an elementary teacher with one class. That class would have to be quarantined. But if you have a high school drama teacher who has a large number of students in each of her classes, one of her students go to all seven classes, tests positive, all seven teachers have to quarantine, all students in those classes have to quarantine, and then her husband who teaches maybe at another school, does he have to quarantine and all his students quarantine? So we would have to know how do we establish if someone has to quarantine. Now I saw the, the, um, the we were distributed your, your, your bubble direction, who's to quarantine and what happens. But if we start up, I could very easily uh, see within two weeks us shutting completely down because of the spread. And so that is my concern, even though our spread is increasing it's going to it's like gas being added to a bonfire is what my my great concern is i so how do we contain that spread yeah i i do want to say that i'm hoping that with the older students the high school students that they would understand the importance of these mitigation measures and that if there was a student or a teacher in a high school setting that we would be able to work together, identify the close contacts, and it wouldn't be the entire class because we had students that didn't get within, remember it's 15, it's um, 15 minutes within six feet. So if I'm sitting in the back of the class and really have no interaction with the, with the student in the front of the class who's, who's uh, you know, showing symptoms, and I'm wearing a mask and, we, and our paths don't cross, but we're in the room together, I might ne not necessarily be excluded. I know in a kindergarten class, it, it, you know, they're all running around, like you said, hugging each other. So that would be a very different investigation. Um, and probably the number of students excluded being uh, the majority of the kids in the class just because of the behavior of not understanding sh social distancing and keeping masks on. So. Um, I think across the state and across the nation, public health, um, people working in public health are concerned about what it looks like in terms of excluding um, large groups of students going into a new school year right off the bat um, because um, there's no way around the 14 days. And I think that is um, something that is a practice of, uh, I'm gonna go out and get a negative test result and then, then I don't have to quarantine, but that's not, that's not the way it works. So people that should be getting tested should be people who are symptomatic, or if they work in the healthcare and they've been a close contact and they're going back to work, and certainly those in our long-term care facility should be tested um, before they go back into the facility, and that's part of the ACA uh, requirement, but just if I go out tomorrow and get a test because I'm going um, to see my mother next week and I want to make sure, you know, I'm not exposing her, I, I could have been exposed the day I got the test, still showed up negative and, and now take this virus to my mother who I don't want to infect because of her age. So, a negative test is only a negative test on the day that the test was taken. It's saying that you were negative at that moment. It doesn't mean that you weren't infected with the virus the day before or the day after. Um, so I think that, um, and we don't have the capacity um, to test, as I think someone else mentioned, uh, in, a, in a real enough time to say, all right, I went in, I took the test today, I'm, I'm negative, um, I know today that I'm negative or positive and not five days from now, which is on average how long people are waiting for test results. Um, it is taking three to five days. 
I'm sorry. sorry. Had, that's okay. I had to unmute. And my last question, because I have to leave some for my colleagues. Are you, is your office prepared to deal with the magnitude of the numbers of cases and contact tracing that if we put 63, if we open up our doors to 63,000 possible students, you, you, it's easy, to, I guess, to look at a family party or, or um, and I think we're, we're, we're losing, I guess, control over the contact tracing so when the beaches are open and when there are very, very large parties. The Volusia County Schools is the largest employer and it's the largest congregation of people anywhere. And so you have smaller schools, you have larger schools. We have schools on the east side and west side that have well over 2,500 students in a, in a smaller building. Um, it's important that you all are prepared. And see, a lot of this is based on hope hope that we have students uh, get on virtual, uh, that we hope that students do maybe uh, are another option. But it's extremely important that you, your office, is able to give us the data. Because the Mrs. Um, Robinson, the um, Florida Department of Health um, person in charge, says that it's the Department of Health that is has to do the reporting. That's who citizens have to report to, correct? It's not the school. So if a student is found that he is positive one day, it's up to the family to report it to your office. What if that person has to go to work the next day, the child is not showing symptoms and has to come to school? How do we know that child has been tested positive? So, and that's what I'm concerned about, the compliance issue as well as the reporting issue, because I, I don't know how, if, if your office is prepared, uh, and, it, and it's no fault of your own, I, I want you to understand that, but are you, how are you going to handle all of these cases? I don't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, the, the governor approved uh, significant funding for county health departments this month uh, for us to recruit. Volusia County um, will be recruiting 45 additional staff. Um, I would say half of them will be epidemiologists and contact tracers. Um, and so that's going to be um, the resource that we that we're going to have available. And I plan to create a team specifically for Volusia County Schools to work together with the staff there. Um, all um, So COVID-19 is a reportable disease and all reportable diseases are reported to the Department of Health. And so we are we receive all the labs. Um, so we, we, we know someone's positive, perhaps in many cases before they themselves know. Um, so we get those, re those labs daily. Um, and so that's that's what we do here in terms of our epidemiology. But then how do you inform the schools? Uh, it would be through that team, that dedicated team. So we would, we would have a process in place in terms of, um, it's usually through school health services that we work um, when there's a case in the school. So I would imagine we would use the same infrastructure that we've used all these years working together when we have a, a case in the school of, of a infectious disease. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate all your, your input. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Mr. Colon. And can we just make sure we ask questions because we haven't even started the presentation so that we want to so make sure you have a question. And in addition, uh, please do not allow anyone into the waiting room that will be held handled by Mr. Uh, by Clint. So they, they're controlling that. I think one of us may have hit uh, admit. So please uh, let Clint handle that with our tech team. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Colon. Beautiful. So I am going to uh, 
unlike Ms. Cuthbert, I'm not going to go down the road of hope, and I'm going to speak about uh, the responsibility that the governor has put on the Department of Health. Now, for the record, I did submit these questions to um, our wonderful health department. So this is not a gotcha moment. It's it's a true question. So um, upon consideration, so I'm looking at the actual emergency order. It reads, upon reopening in August, all school boards and charter schools governing boards must open brick and mortar schools at least five days a week for all students subject to the advice and orders of the Florida Department of Education, local departments of health, uh, executive order 2149 and subsequent uh, executive orders. And so my question to you, Ms. Boswell, is as the director of the Florida Department of Health, because uh, you have been called upon by the governor to advise the school district, do you feel that based on current data, understanding that we are talking about today, do you feel that the current COVID rates for our county are conducive to the safe reopening uh, of Volusia County Schools at this time? The Department of Health and, a, you know, all of the health officers around the state has asked the Department of Health for guidance with this question, because we're all being asked this question by school boards. And we were, we've been advised that our role here is to just advise as to what, how, what can we do to make the environment in schools as safe as possible with COVID-19? It is not to make a decision uh, on whether or not to open up a school. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, my next question is, as the director of the Florida Department of Health, will you provide this board a date stamp letter indicating that based on a time certain date, you feel that schools are safe to open. Again, the, the order reads subject to the advice and orders of the Florida Department of Health. So are you able to provide that to our board uh, for guidance? The county health departments are not providing those letters. Thank you. And my last question is, will you provide the board a letter within seven business days of the start of school indicating that your department still continues to feel that the return of students and teachers to our brick and mortar school buildings continues to be safe? It would only be advisement on how to make the environment safe. Okay, and so now I'll turn to my colleagues and say that um, one of the things that we'll have to consider is that the Department of Health is not telling us that it is safe for students and teachers to uh, come back to school. So upon that, I think it's going to really be on us to make that decision because they are not, you know, and, and again, no fault of yours, Ms. Boswell, I have dealt with your department in a professional manner, uh, both career-wise and uh, at today and all the work you've done for our school district. And it's unfortunate that the governor has put your office in a very uncomfortable position because once again, the order says subject to the advice and orders of the Florida Department of Health. And again, I understand that you, you have been given this directive. However, I, in not having the advice of the Florida Department of Health, you know, I personally don't believe that schools are safe to open. And so I am turning to the uh, folks that are being told that we are supposed to be working with and we are not getting that advice. So I have deep concern and I truly believe that this burden is going to be on us. And that was all my questions. And again, for the record, these questions I did submit before time, they were not gotcha questions. And uh, I appreciate you. You have no idea. Like I said, I've dealt with the Florida Department of Health uh, professionally, both in my uh, occupation as well as uh, your participation. And I greatly appreciate you uh, being willing to come and help us and and do the same thing we're doing face the public face the community and say hey you know we really are doing the best we can but I think we're all being put in a really really weird scenario so thank you so much I have no further questions Ms. Haynes hello Mrs. Boswell and thank you so very much for joining us today I will try to go through the questions that I have um, quickly. I'd like to start with, um, first of all, 
when you reported the numbers earlier, I did notice that you said we went from 11.93% positive to 1107 with positive rates. So actually we have slightly reduced the numbers that are positive. Is that correct? Yes, it is, ma'am. All right, also you stated that the numbers are cumulative since March. So when Mrs. Cuthbert was talking about the, um, the cases with children, and I'm going to look at just right now, the ages of five to 14 and 15 to 19, that is a total of 334, because those are actually the ages of the students um, that would have currently been in school at this time. Um, what is the total number of children in Volusia County for those age groups? Do you have like the total number of children, you know, that actually reside in Volusia County that fit in those age groups or do you not? Uh, not right with me this moment. I can certainly provide that. Okay. Well, if I just take the fact that roughly we, um, we and that does not include um, private schools, um, parents that are, you know, in virtual, already in virtual programs or um, parents that, you know, that are homeschooling, we look at approximately 63,000 students that attend um, Volusia County Schools. So if I take the 334 cases, which you agree are cumulative from March, because is March when you first started testing for this? Uh, March was when we had our first case. Okay. So, and you identified it through a test? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if I actually do the math on that, it's 0.005% at this time is what we're looking at of children that have tested positive. Now that does not mean they're still positive because that's a cumulative set of numbers, correct? Correct. All right, so yesterday in the news, it came out that um, at some of the sites where tests are being given, that the, um, the negative test results are not being reported accurately. So at the sites within Volusia County, have we had issues where we are getting inaccurate positive or inaccurate negative test results? I, um, I can't speak to the number of either one of those. What I can speak to is the fact that since July 1st, Volusia County, out of the 18,473 tests from July 1st to July 14th that were, that were reported to the Department of Health, 16,369 were negative, 2,104 were positive with a positivity rate of 11.39%. When you look at the report that was came out yesterday, and I believe it was Orlando Medical specifically, their test results for, and I don't know the period of time, were coming back at 99% positive because the lab failed to provide the negative results. So um, I do not see that happening in the data that we've been reviewing. Okay, my next question is this. Um, are you, so do you oversee in any way all of the sites within Volusia County where um, individuals are being tested? Not at all. In fact, um, the health departments are not responsible for testing. The um, State Department of Emergency Management here in Florida has probably rolled out the most testing sites in the state, including here in Volusia County. Initially, I think everybody remembers that the majority of the testing was happening at the Speedway and that was um, with Advent Health. Um, our federally qualified health center, Family Health Source, has been a um, played a, a major role in getting testing into a lot of the communities. And testing right now is available through urgent care centers, CVS, and a Publix over on the west side. Uh, we, um, our testing at, up to this point has been a majority of clearance testing, meaning for people that have tested positive and they need a clearance test to um, go back to work or some something of that nature. Um, and we also felt that 
our role in testing was to try to meet the needs of the vulnerable populations. So if you look to see where we tested, we created test sites in neighborhoods and communities that might not have had access to testing. Um, but uh, we probably do uh, fewer than um, two or 300 tests a day. Okay, thank you for that. So at this time, um, do you actually though have a list of every location within Volusia County where they are testing? Is that provided to you? That list is posted on the Volusia County um, Emergency Management website and I look at it on a pretty regular basis. All right, and with that being said, you stated that when the tests are done, the results are submitted to your office. So you receive the positive test results along with the name of the individual and the negative test results? I do, and it's done through a system called Merlin. It's a lab reporting system, so it's, a, it's an electronic lab reporting system. All right, and, and I'm it's a state system. Okay, and I'm assuming that you monitor that on a daily basis. Through, that's majority of what we are doing, and we only are we only get the residents of Volusia County reported to us. So if I work at the Tomoka Correctional Facility and I live in Flagler County and I'm positive, I am a Flagler County positive case. I'm not Volusia, even though I spend the majority of my time here working. Okay, so I appreciate that because then that does make it very clear that when you gave us the numbers earlier, those were only for Volusia County um, residents. Correct. Okay. So do you know at this time if any of the tests being used to determine whether or not someone is positive, negative, or has antibodies for COVID-19, are any of the tests being used approved by the FDA? They all are with the antibody tests receiving emergency FDA approval, some of them. The antibody test had received emergency FDA approval when it came online. I think some of them are moved off of that emergency list and have received FDA approval without that emergency caveat. But the tests we use are approved by FDA and we use PCR testing, which is the nasal oral swab. Okay. All right. Um, is, okay, because I have been reading everything that I can possibly get my hands on. Have you learned of any um, data that states whether or not the droplets stay on surfaces and someone can pick it up by touching it after a period of time. Do you have any research data on that? That data has been changing. Um, so in the beginning, it, it appeared that the virus would be on surfaces for longer um, than it currently is suggesting, uh, depending on the type of surface and um, the frequency of the touch of the surface. So it would have, to, it's those high, frequently touched surfaces like doorknobs that we're most concerned with. Okay. And, and depending on the type of surface material to, to determines how long the virus can spread. And okay. that's why hand washing is so critical. I agree with you. It's always been critical. So as far as um, when Mrs. Cuthbert was asking you about determining if you get results that someone is positive. And she said, you know, at what point would we know? My question is this, are there any type of privacy laws, including like HIPAA laws that come into play that in the event a student, teacher, staff member test positive where that information cannot be released um, to say, you know, the school system like because are there privacy laws where that information should not be released or it should be kept in confidence there are there this is um this is an individual's personal health information that we're talking about here and there's certainly hippo laws that protect it but it, when it comes to the relationship between the school district the fact that it's within your school um we have um 
the ability to discuss a case. So we say- would not we would not announce we would not give you the um, authority to announce over the loudspeaker that there's a child in Mrs. Smith's first grade cl- class with the with a positive uh, test result. It wouldn't we wouldn't want you to share individuals. Um, test results with the entire school. It would be with the school health nurse, um, the principal, the teacher, um, and then if the parents had to be notified because they can't, their students were a close contact, it's like every other type of uh, notification, we would tell the, the family that, they, that their child came into contact with, is considered a close contact of a, of a case of a student with a positive test result but we wouldn't name the student. Okay, so, and I just wanna clarify, because I I believe I understand what you're saying, but I want people to hear this very clearly. So in the event that I was teaching a first grade classroom and a student in my classroom tested positive and you received those positive results, you would notify a contact person say at the district level that is going that person's going to keep say mrs debbie fisher who's going to keep that information confidential she is going to relay that information to the principal and or school nurse and the school the classroom teacher myself but other than that i am held by privacy laws as well as the other individuals that have been told to not share the name of that child any additional details, but if there was a need to share with other children or possibly other staff that they came into contact with, they would be notified of possibly coming into contact with, mm-hmm. but they would not be told the child's name, correct? Correct. All right, because I just want to make sure that we are clear on that because I don't want any of us to end up in a situation where we break privacy laws and or share health information that should not be shared because we are all in a position where we are to protect whether it's a child or a staff member. So moving on and thank you for clearing that up for me. Um, When you talked about um, face mask and we and uh, Mr. Persis brought up the piece about face shields. I talked about face shields at our last school board meeting having taught both at the elementary and secondary levels and also having taught speech and language students and ESE students, I know that at times a mask is not um, the most appropriate thing when you're trying to teach a child to speak, to form letters and sounds and things like that. So I have just learned this week that uh, Mr. Aiken, who is our chief organizational officer, has also put in an order for face shields. So could we honestly be able to tell our students and parents that, you know, if this was an area that we're walking into, that a face shield would be appropriate versus a face mask? I believe so. All right. You also, when you talked about face masks and you talked about them being used in highly concentrated areas or areas where students and or adults could not distance, um, I'm going to take a kindergarten class for just a moment, all right? Five-year-olds. So if I heard you correctly, if they're riding, say, the school bus, that would be a spot where you would feel that they should either be wearing a face mask or a face shield on the bus unless the bus is pretty empty, which that's not the case, correct? Correct. All right. If they're in the cafeteria, say, um, I know, though, that they do have to remove one, you know, or the other to eat. Okay, but traveling to and from the cafeteria, you would expect them to wear them if they're in large groups or passing large groups. All right, if they're back in their classroom and they are spread out at their individual desk, and ideally they may not even be six feet. Um, I I believe a few of the people here today in the boardroom are a little bit closer than six feet, okay? But we've taken our mask off in order for you to understand us in this meeting. If they're back in their classroom, would it or would it not be an appropriate time, say if they have a face mask on, in order to remove that, say if they're working at their desk on their own work? If I believe that the social distancing is really the the key um, to um, the mitigation measure. 
Um, this face shield is another protective measure. Um, certainly, if they're sitting at their desk quietly, um, you know, if they're reading you know, and the only thing that you know that someone's going to, and I think it happens. We're all just now immune to it. If somebody sneezes or coughs, we all react like something terrible has just happened. Um, so I think that that might be a frightening moment for the teacher um, if the kids got the mask off and now they sneeze. So. Uh, that would be, you know, sneezing into a tissue, throwing away the tissue, uh, you know, teaching all those methods will help. Well, and those are things that parents work on. And when kids come to school, we continue to work on. I'd be honest with you, I'd rather have a tissue that they sneeze into than their mask that they're now going to That's right. keep on their face and touch. Yes. Because um, I have been watching children, even as I go into the grocery store, that are now trying to wear these masks. And they're touching their face 100 times more than what they were. All right. So just to recap, um, you also talked about the current um, hospital numbers and in ICU and the current number of individuals that have been put on ventilators. So when you're talking about those numbers and you shared them earlier, they were 144, 48, and 27. Are those only numbers tied to positive COVID cases or does that also include individuals that could possibly be in the ICU or on a ventilator due to another, like a pre-existing condition due to being in some form of an accident or something like that. That was all COVID cases. Now, are those cumulative numbers or are those current today or yesterday it's numbers? What the, it's what the hospital reported yesterday. So were those cumulative to the hospital or that's what was no. down? The so for example, on the 12th of July, the hospitals in Volusia County reported 25 on a COVID that on vent. The 14th, it was 27. So two more individuals. Now, whether some of those that were on the vent came off the vent, I don't know, but we went from 25 individuals in hospitals in Volusia County on a vent with COVID to 27 from the 12th to the 14th. May 1st, we had five. Okay. July 1st, we had seven. Right. And this is uh, self-reported by hospitals. Okay, so you, do you receive the test from those individuals showing that they are positive or you're just relying on hospitals self-reporting? all positive COVID test results come into our lab reporting system. So the individuals in the hospital that test positive for COVID are in our reporting system and we investigate them when we first get the report of a positive. Um, and in some instances we can interview, in some instances we can't depending on their condition. So when they're hospitalized, it's a little bit different in terms of the epi piece of it. Okay. So you feel confident in those numbers that you're reporting that they are accurate? Yes. Okay. All right. At this time, um, I want to once again, thank you very much. And um, I do appreciate all the time that you have given us so far this afternoon. And I know that the time you gave working with the team ahead of this, we thoroughly appreciate what you're doing. And um, I do have a better understanding now. I may at some point, if you don't mind, call and ask you some additional questions, but thank you and thank you. Ms. I welcome you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Boswell. I, I, at this time, I, I don't have questions for you right now. I had an opportunity to actually hear some of this information previously, which led to a conversation that I know we will address, um, that we've talked about delaying schools before everybody else talked about delaying their start time. So I don't want to belabor this because we really do need to get to the, the bulk of why we're here. Thank you for answering these questions. It is now 530 and colleagues, we're going to take a 10 minute break. We'll start back up at or 15. We'll start back up at 545. Thank you.
Ready? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing us to take a quick break. Now we will come back and resume our meeting. And at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Bagabin so that we can start continue with the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. As we get this evening, uh, get ready to present our options available for parents and students, I want to reaffirm our families that from our end, we will ensure that safety precautions are in place for all learners in that traditional setting. And obviously, according to our CDC guidelines. Our second goal is very clear. We need to engage all students in high levels of learning every day. And this will result in increased proficiency and growth, but most importantly, the life skills necessary for success. School board members, parents, students, and teachers, this continues to be our driving force and essential in our decision making as we move forward. So let's look at the three options. Our first is a traditional classroom setting as directed by the Florida Department of Education with health and safety guidelines in place. Our second option, that will be presented to you, and it's called Volusia Live, real, in real time streaming. In this option, students will be able to connect to their traditional school of enrollment and adhere to the existing bell schedule. I wanna note that this option is pending approval from Florida Department of Education, and we will expand a little further later during the presentation in regards to the seven assurances that must be in place for the approval of this model. And our third option is the enhanced, and let me repeat that, the enhanced Volusia online learning model. And I, I want to say to you that it's called enhanced now because there have been several features that have been added to this model to provide a more comprehensive educational experience for the learner. So now let's take a look closer at the features of each option, what to expect as a student and parent, and which options are recommended for specific scenarios. Let's look at the traditional setting. Uh, this is one of those options, obviously, that it will be recommended for students and families that feel comfortable returning to school and prefer the face-to-face -face interactions. Students will learn at their, home at their home school. They will follow a standard bell schedule and health and safety guidelines will be in place to support students and staff. You will hear many more details related to this health and safety guidelines in throughout the presentation, including risk reduction strategies. As we look at our Volusia Live, which is, will be considered our innovative learning model. This model will offer students the ability to learn from home while receiving online face-to-face -face lessons in real-time streaming. This option is recommended for students and families that at this point in time do not feel comfortable returning to their school setting, but want to maintain their connection to the school of enrollment. Instruction won't be impacted if students are fluid between the Volusia Live and traditional classroom setting. The curriculum and seat time mirrors the traditional classroom. Web conferences tools such as Zoom and Teams will be used to access the traditional classroom from home. Please note that Volusia Live does require a high level of parental support specific to the real-time access to instruction that's necessary. So we will work with DOE to ensure a plan along with the seven assurances meets the approval process for this innovative model. As we look at the enhanced Volusia online learning, we will, this model will allow students to learn from home and receive online instruction in flexible formats. So this is a very flexible format model. This option is also recommended for those students and families who still are not comfortable with returning to a traditional school setting. Students can learn at their own pace with access to Volusia County teachers and curriculum. That is an important feature. We are proud to share that Volusia Online Learning now offers from K through 12 courses 
and provides extracurricular clubs and activities for students. Here's what we understand. We understand the importance of providing students with the opportunity to socially interact with their peers in a structured and also in an unstructured setting. And this is important to their development in the areas of social and emotional skills. We had love to join, we love for the students to be able to join these clubs, environmental clubs, we have our environmental clubs, yearbooks, and book clubs. I would highly encourage that all students enrolled in this option to complete at least one semester. So why is this? It's important for uh, earning credits and for avoiding interruption into their schooling. As we look at, in a more in-depth manner at option one, the traditional classroom setting, I would like to now invite Mr. Greg Aiken. Mr. Greg Aiken is our chief operations uh, officer and he's going to provide it with uh, provide us with some of the details and I've challenged him to do some demonstrations as well for us as it relates to health and safety guidelines for this instructional model. Mr. Aiken. Uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, I want uh, to start by thanking the operational subcommittee that worked on this plan. Um, they are the health services both uh, inside the Volusia County School District, uh, Debbie Fisher and uh, Patricia Boswell uh, from the Department of Health. We also had Schoolway Cafe Transportation, Safety, uh, Security, Purchasing, ABM, and the community members that emailed me with their concerns and suggestions. I want to thank everybody there. You know, back in my military days, uh, when we talk about uh, reducing risks, there was always three things that actually popped into my mind, um, and they were time, distance, and shielding. And uh, those three words correlate to what the uh, CDC and the Department of Health guidelines are telling us to do today. Uh, you know, exposure time, um, I know Patricia talked about this a few minutes ago, uh, you know, the, if we stay away from larger groups, or we're probably safer in, those, uh, in that arena, uh, six feet apart, uh, wearing masks, hand washing, those are the things that we're really going to kind of look at today. Um, you're going to hear that quite frequently throughout the presentation. Um, our recommendations uh, were made thoughtfully and deliberately after conducting an analysis of the uh, mitigation measures developed with and by the Department of uh, CDC, uh, medical community, and input from our community uh, members. Um, one of the major things we have to look at is we need to promote the reduction through collaboration. And so we're gonna need a team effort to do this. This would be in the classroom with our teachers, um, at school with our administrative staff and others, and then at home with our parents that are there uh, with our children to reinforce the importance of uh, the three major uh, hand washing and wearing masks and social distancing. One of the key things that we have to, to really apply here um, as we move forward is our parents play a critical role to help us keep our students home if they are uh, showing any signs of illness uh, that would help us reduce the risk inside the campuses and in the classroom. Uh, parents uh, uh, need to work with us uh, so we can uh, reduce the risk uh, from the outside uh, being uh, introduced inside our classrooms as well. Um, there are several things that we have put in place. Um, we're going to have uh, multiple control entry points. Um, we're going to have hand sanitizers in each classroom, stations in common areas on campus availability of services and supplies uh, to facilitate frequent cleaning and sanitation of all surfaces used to, uh, by students and employees available right there in the classroom, which are gonna be masks, gloves, wipes, disinfectant spray, paper towels, and face shields. And I'll show you a picture of that here just later on. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we will be taking uh, and be available to screen, which is a temperature check of those students and staff uh, prior to them coming onto campus uh, daily. Next slide, please. Um, one of the major things we have to look at today is uh, besides the social distancing, uh, wearing masks, hand washing, and avoiding large crowds, um, which are central to our strategies, we will also limit uh, visitors to our schools. Um, and that would be confined only to essential act activities only. So we are uh, basically saying parents will um, have to have uh, to give up uh, eating breakfast and lunch 
uh, is with their children and also walking the children to, this, uh, to their uh, teacher's um, classroom. Uh, when, when parents actually uh, drop off their children in their vehicles, if they so choose to transport their child that way, uh, we ask them to stay in the car and let our staff there in the in parent loop um, assist their children in getting into the campus. I've already mentioned temperature screens. We're going to be doing that uh, quite frequently. Uh, we are going to limit large group settings. Uh, we're going to use some uh, communal areas uh, like the cafeteria, gyms, and auditoriums to spread out staff if we have to do that. Um, if we have uh, to have uh, uh, meetings or assemblies uh, with our faculty and students, we will be using Zoom or Microsoft Teams for those type of meetings. Um, we are also are going to uh, ask and highly recommend that students do not share food um, at all or any equipment or anything else that they have for their person um, at all at this, uh, when they come back to school. Um, next slide, please. For transportation, um, and by statute, we are required to transport students uh, outside of the two-mile walk zone and any students that has an IEP and TARS, a transportation as a related service, into the school. We have many safety measures actually put in place uh, for transportation. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is a summer school picture on the left-hand side. Our operator is wearing a mask and then the actual student is as well. So what we're going to ask parents if they don't feel comfortable uh, having their child ride the school bus to, to uh, school, uh, then they need to look at uh, uh, taking their, their child or find other means uh, to get their child to school. Um, one of the things we look at is we're going to make it toy for all uh, students uh, and our operating staff to actually wear masks um, on the bus. We will also have um, provide hand sanitizer on the bus as well. Um, and will require uh, the follow-up cleaning protocols throughout the day um, as we move forward. Uh, the cleaning of the buses will be in accordance with our CDC re recommendations uh, and they will be uh, uh, followed. We're also looking at some disposable masks if students uh, fail to have the masks uh, when they get ready to, to board the bus. What we're asking parents to also help us do is that when they're at the uh, bus stop area to assist us in ensuring that students uh, maintain social distancing and wear their masks while they're there. We will also have seating charts, uh, which are required on all of our school buses. Uh, be there, we, we are uh, looking at loading our buses from the back to the front, and then when we get to the school, from the front to the back. And so that's a, a, a process that we are putting in place for transportation. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, back up, I forgot one important thing. The, um, when the bus is actually moving, you know, uh, having some more air circulation is going to be critical. So we will uh, crack the two front windows and two back windows, and we potentially could put up our uh, uh, vents that are on top of the bus to ensure that we have adequate airflow coming through the bus while also running the air conditioning uh, for comfort for our students. Thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> for cafeteria, I want to start with that. All of our uh, kitchen employees are food safety trained annually um, by USDA regulations. So, uh, we have to offer food choices versus serving meals, uh, and that's critical to understand that process. Uh, menu items are prepackaged for selection is what we're going to be doing this year. Uh, menu items will be significantly uh, simplified. Um, this year we're going to have two, uh, two entrees for elementary schools, and then secondaries will have three. Last year, we had four entrees uh, for, for our secondary schools. We're going to have grab-and-go uh, uh, meals available. Uh, they're going to be prepackaged or boxed lunch options. Uh, we will have uh, all of our um, silverware would be wrapped uh, to make sure that they're sanitized. And all of our staff will wear their proper PPE uh, with cashiers wearing face shields as well. Um, uh, we will clean in between uh, the cafeterias. We need to uh, make sure we spread out, and you're going to hear this later on as well. We're going to spread out our lunch periods throughout uh, all of our campuses to ensure that um, we have proper time to clean all of the areas that students are sitting. Now, now everyone's favorite uh, subject is uh, cleaning. Uh, and so this slide, we're kind of talking about the cleaning and disinfecting of uh, the areas on our campus. 
Um, along with uh, social distancing, uh, wearing the masks and frequent hand washing, uh, we have enhanced our cleaning and disinfecting procedures uh, uh, and our recommendations. Currently, our contract with ABM calls for a NAPA 2 level cleaning, which allows for two days worth of dust, some streaks, some stains, and some other things. However, there are some uh, scope gaps that we must, uh, must address moving forward with the, uh, this virus that we have. Currently, ABM is a spot cleaning desks to remove graffiti. Uh, what we have in place uh, will be teacher kits, and you'll see a copy of that, or a picture of that here shortly to assist in, in, in ensuring that we disinfect uh, desk areas. Uh, currently, um, they don't wipe down chairs daily, so they, they kind of wipe those down as needed. Um, Notification of areas being cleaned is not uh, occurring at all uh, locations. There's no signage that is there. We're recommending that they put a sign saying the area was actually clean. Uh, weekly, um, they're removing fingerprints from doors, frames, and light switches, uh, kick plates, handles, and rails. Um, and what we need to do, and which we heard from um, the Department of Health, Patricia Boswell, that those areas need to be cleaned frequently. Um, and so the main office areas are only uh, serviced one time uh, daily in the evening. Um, and, and so that's something that we have some traffic through. We're going to have to address that as well. Uh, group restrooms are serviced uh, fully one, day, one time daily in the evenings uh, uh, with their uh, night staff. Uh, what we're recommending now is we maintain a th walkthrough of all of our, our restrooms multiple times throughout the day. Uh, we're going to enlist in all of our staff. Uh, that are on campuses if it looks like they're getting ready to run out of uh, toilet paper, for example, or, or soap or something like that, that they notify and get the appropriate supplies back in those restroom areas in the classrooms as soon as possible uh, to ensure we have what we need. Um, we are going to use the EPA-approved disinfectant agent uh, for uh, uh, the, the virus. Um, and then we're going to make sure that uh, we keep all of our uh, disinfectants that are uh, that we're going to supply for the for the classrooms and offices and other areas um, away from our children next slide please these are some pictures uh, so the top picture on the uh, left hand side is our uh, PPE uh, teacher kit um, and so you can see we're going to have those kits available we'll also have additional supplies uh, on campus to restock uh, those classrooms that need it, then we will be restocking those from our warehouse uh, moving forward. The, um, as you can see there, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a face shields that are gonna be there. We have gloves, masks, um, we have uh, some disinfectant sp a spray bottle, and then we have some additional cloth masks uh, that we can actually give if someone doesn't have one. The picture on the on the right hand side is deliveries that we just started receiving today and that we will be uh, stocking uh, the, those items and other items uh, for for use throughout the school district. Um, the bottom left hand picture is Lisa Davina. She's my uh, administrative secretary. <clears throat> my uh, maintenance department is making some um, plexiglass shields. Um, and somebody just showed the, 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 the thing there. And so what that does for us is it provides another level of protection. As you can see, Lisa's wearing her mask and she also has another level of protection with that shield and she'll be able to communicate and do what she needs to do. The picture on the right is actually shields, <coughs> face shields, excuse me. Uh, one's a, a larger size than the other. So one's adult, one's a child. Next slide, please. What I'd like to do now is uh, <coughs> me, turn this over to. Oh, back, back to, not only are we working uh, together, but we are also learning together as we move forward. And as Dr. Balgobin said, this is a very fluid um, process that we're going through with this COVID together. But together, we are uh, uh, considering how we can ensure the safety of all within the uh, traditional uh, classroom settings. The Servant Act will take us through the uh, considerations and best practices being made in classrooms and schools. Ms. Servanek. Thank you, Mr. Aiken. As the directors within our teaching, leading, and learning division began to work together through this process, it became very apparent that our recommendations for considerations and best practices in our classrooms and schools were extremely consistent from pre-K to 12th grade. 
This portion of our presentation will address all levels, and then we will have special considerations as they apply after to each individual level. In addition, it is imperative to point out that through workshops, district support staff will work with each school on the development of a COVID-19 safety plan. In conjunction with each school's safety and security committee, we will develop specific site-based COVID-19 safety plans for minimizing large group gatherings to the greatest extent possible based on each specific campus layout and the availability of each school staff and supervision. Each COVID-19 safety plan will also include details regarding the cleaning and disinfecting procedures for classrooms, cafeterias, restrooms, and high touch areas. Although each school's plan will be unique to that school campus and staffing ability, all plans will look to incorporate the following daily procedures to the greatest extent possible. Arrival procedures, classroom considerations, transitions, lunch considerations, dismissal considerations. Most importantly, the development of these plans will be shared at each level among schools to identify best practices and innovative approaches. Upon arriving on campus each day, students will enter through multiple points, dependent upon how they arrived at school. At each point of entry, temperatures will be taken prior to entering. All students must wear face masks, both when on property awaiting entry, as well as when they enter the campus. Students who participate in before school activities or enter campus for breakfast early will follow the same procedures regarding temperature checks, but will have a designated point of entry. Upon arrival, students will go to assigned designated areas to ensure social distancing and to keep our students safe. If students display a fever above 100.4 upon entry, the student will immediately be sent to a designated supervised isolation area where they will rest for 10 minutes. At that time, their temperature will be retaken. If their temperature has dropped below 100.4, they will be sent to class to enjoy their day. If their temperature is still above 100.4, the parent or guardian will be notified and the school will request immediate pickup. Parents will be given communication regarding the steps necessary for the student to be able to return to school at that time. Classroom considerations are gonna be very important throughout this process. Classroom furniture will be minimized to allow for maximum space between student workstations. Student workstations will be separated to the greatest extent possible. Upon entry into the classroom, all students will be asked to use hand sanitizer and to keep on their masks until all students have been seated and the instruction has begun. Students will be strongly encouraged to keep their masks on during instruction. All students will have assigned seats to assist with contact tracing if necessary. During the last two minutes of each class period in an elementary school before each transition, instruction will stop and cleaning procedures will begin in every single classroom. All student desks will be disinfected by the student assigned to that desk under teacher supervision or in primary classrooms, the teacher may need to provide support to assist in this process. Any in-class digital devices such as laptops or iPads that were used during the class period will be disinfected by the student that had used the device with teacher support and supervision. Each school will develop a system to remind their students and teachers of this two-minute cleaning requirement, either through an announcement over the intercom or through a school-specific policy that they will note in their site-specific plan. Any small group instruction will be required for both students and teachers to wear either a face mask or a face shield. 
the use of instructional materials being shared will be reduced to the greatest extent possible. Some examples would be assigning textbooks to each student when possible, using digital devices that access the curriculum, and ensuring that each student has identified personal supplies. The following two slides show examples of how classrooms can be arranged to ensure social distancing to the greatest extent possible. The first slide highlights the classroom at Campbell Middle School, where the teacher in this classroom uses tables to enhance her instruction. In this classroom, Individual desks are utilized and have been arranged to show six feet between each student desk. Students will be required to wear masks during transitions to the greatest extent possible and dependent upon each campus layout. Schools will employ social distancing strategies during transitions. Some examples include staggering the dismissal of classes one-way hallways, signage directing students along predetermined routes to avoid congestion. Supervision staff will monitor compliance of face masks and actively encourage students to follow all social distancing guidelines. In our cafeteria, cafeteria seating and procedures will employ safety and social distancing guidelines to the greatest extent possible. Consideration should include hand sanitizer stations available for students prior to eating, signs to designate a three to six feet distance in lines, assigned seating areas to assist with social distancing. Students will wear masks when they are not actively eating, such as in lines and during entry and exit to classrooms and the lunchroom. Specific lunch entry and dismissal procedures will be implemented to stagger students and ease crowds during transition. Students will be required to wear face masks during dismissal. To the greatest extent possible and dependent upon each campus layout, schools will employ social distancing strategies during dismissal such as staggering dismissal by utilizing separate dismissal calls for bus riders, our walkers, parent pickup and drivers, and students participating in after school activities, the extended day program, and even for athletics. Schools will utilize multiple points of exit. Supervision staff will monitor compliance with face masks, and actively work to discourage any students who are not following social distancing guidelines. We are happy to say that we will continue to provide our extended day and before the bell program to our community. All health and safety guidelines will be followed throughout these programs. Staff will be present at each site prior to the program to sanitize high traffic areas and to have their own individual temperatures taken. During morning check-in, each child's temperature is taken upon arrival prior to signing in. To the maximum extent possible, the same staff will be assigned to the same group of children throughout the week to minimize exposure. There are some special considerations that are specifically would apply to our elementary students. Special area and departmentalized teachers will travel, travel to students' homeroom classrooms. Schools will utilize all available resources to limit splitting homeroom classes during special area to the greatest extent possible. Physical education classes will be continue to be conducted outside following social distancing guidelines. PE teachers will be encouraged to begin the school year with physical fitness and conditioning activities to keep our students safe. Recess will be highly supervised for social distancing. Our VPK parents will be permitted to enter and exit campus daily, daily utilizing CDC guidelines to complete state mandated documentation. 
all elementary schools will extend lunch serving times to maximize social distancing. At this time, I would like our director of high school, Mrs. Carolyn Carbonell, to join us to share the special considerations needed for our middle and high school students. Good evening, and thank you, Mrs. Servanek. Ms. Servanek mentioned uh, most of the traditional school protocols and information covering all the levels, the elementary, middle school, and high school. This evening, I wanna take a couple minutes to talk about some of the items that are unique and specific to the secondary level. All middle schools will have three lunches, but this will look a little different this year. There will be additional seating areas set up, possibly outdoors and around the campus. There will be no dressing out for PE, but students will be required to wear appropriate footwear, footwear to participate actively and safely in our physical education class. In addition, there will be no locker room use. This is to help with social distancing and keeping our students safe at all times. Any extracurricular and athletic events offered at the middle school will mirror the high school return to school plan. At the high school level, there are several unique areas specific to high school. During the arrival procedures, the interior of campus will be closed until the designated staff arrives to follow all health and safety protocols, including temperature readings. Students will be directed to go immediately to a variety of holding areas to help reduce large numbers of students congregating. Campus advisors, school guardians, SROs, administrators, TOAs, and faculty and staff volunteers will help monitor the compliance with face masks and actively work to encourage any students who are not following social distancing guidelines. This part will be a challenge at the high school level and on campus, but as Dr. Balgobin stated earlier, we need to work as a team, and I know that Team Volusia will put our heads together and keep our campuses safe. At the high school level, there are some lunch considerations. Our high schools will have two or three lunch bell schedules depending on the size of the school, the student enrollment, and logistics. Off-campus lunch opportunities will continue to allow more social distancing on campus during lunch. Also, consideration will be given to opening this opportunity to all eligible drivers regardless of grade level. One of the best parts about high school is the extracurricular and the athletics program. As you all know, this is an instrumental piece for the high school level. All schools will follow the Volusia County School Board Performing Arts Recommendations document, which will cover expectations for groups such as band, chorus, dance, theater, and drama. This document also includes procedures for auditorium, gym, and for performances, assemblies, and shows. And just so everybody online knows, this document was compiled based on the guidelines and procedures and recommendations of several state and national organizations, including NFSA, Guidance for a Return to High School Marching Band, American String Teachers Association, Resuming Classroom Instruction, and the Educational Theater Association recommendations for fall reopenings, and many more. This document will be provided to all performing arts instructors. They will be posted to all school websites and posted to the district website. Just like the, perform the performing arts guidelines, all athletic programs will follow the guidelines established by Volusia County School Board, the National Federation of High Schools, and the Florida High School Athletic Association regarding the requirements and protocols and the athletic calendar. We are expecting to receive our next update on July 27th. These two will be posted on all of our school websites and Volusia County School Board website. And lastly, like middle school, PE students will not dress out at this time, but will be required to wear proper footwear to participate in their physical education courses. And locker rooms will not be utilized for PE classes until further notice. 
in our advanced programs and special programs, which we have many of those on the high school campus, students in our Cambridge program, IB, AP classes, career academies, and special programs can continue to participate in both the traditional and Volusia Live with their enrolled school. I know many of you had some concerns about the IB and the Cambridge programs and how that would look if we were going to continue it or not. Well, I am so excited about the support that we've received from the leaders of the Cambridge and the IB organizations. We are in constant communication with the IB and Cambridge leaders at the state level. They are working with us and are being very flexible, working and developing new additional resources for our teachers. They're working through uh, ideas for certain labs that have to be um, involved in the classroom. And we also are looking at strategies as far as testing and testing uh, the fidelity of the results. We also are gonna continue to communicate um, with them on how they can support us throughout the entire process. I am so excited that we can keep these programs going strong. In addition, they have frequent updates on their changes and supports that we will always give the parents and the students the most, update in, most, most updated information. We will be receiving our next update in a couple weeks. We are confident that these special programs can be effective in our Volusia Live Choice, which will be covered a little later in this presentation. Dual, en dual enrollment opportunities is another area that we will continue with the high school level. As a matter of fact, we're in conversations now with DSC where we're looking at some additional recommendations that have been presented to, to them. And we will have some, I'm sure, some good news following up today. As soon as we receive the updates, we will notify students and parents Another area we're looking to um, do at the high school is to increase the OJT offerings wherever possible. This will help with some of the social distancing on a large high school campus. And then last but not least, we want to look at our e-learning programs that are on each of our high school campuses and look at possibly increasing some flexibility in the way those classes are scheduled to assist those students that are um, needing some special assistance due to the COVID family um, issues or their own issues. So we're looking forward to a fantastic start of the beginning of the year. We know we do have some challenges at all three levels, but like I said before, I know we can pull together and Team Volusia will do always what's best for our kids, families, and the community. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Kaur, who will introduce our option two, Volusia Live. Great, thank you so thank much, you so Mrs. Carbonell. You're welcome. And Carrie for giving us uh, the update and overview of option one, which is the traditional school setting. And we are so very excited uh, to discuss option two, Volusia Live, with you all this evening. The Volusia Live option is available for those families who want to remain connected to their school and teachers, but are not yet comfortable with returning to the school campus. As stated previously, Volusia County Schools must provide an insurance assurance plan to the state for approval when offering an innovative plan such as Volusia Live. The assurances that pertain to option two include ensuring robust progress monitoring and reporting the progress monitoring to the state for all students. In addition, assuring that all students with disabilities and all ESOL students continue to receive the supports they need to be successful. It is important to note that according to Florida Department of Education, if a student receiving instruction through option two, Volusia Live, is not successful, the student must be provided additional support and the opportunity to transition to another option. Please also notice that option two, Volusia Live, may be shortened or adjusted at the school district's discretion as new information regarding COVID-19 becomes available. Next, thank you. 
With option two, Volusia Live, it is vital that parents are ensuring their child is logging on at the designated times five days per week. This schedule mirrors the traditional schedule, and you will hear more about that in a moment. Students will log into their classes from home while the teacher is instructing at the school. Training will be provided for teachers who will be giving uh, instruction through Volusia Live to the students who choose this option. Um, at this time, I'd like to pass it back to Carrie Servanak, who will share more detailed information on how this option will look on a daily basis for our students. Thank you, Ms. Kaur. At the primary level, specifically with our pre-K through second grade students, we believe it is imperative to have a dedicated digital learning teacher providing daily instruction that mirrors the content being taught in the traditional classroom setting through our online platforms. In each of these grade levels, at each of our elementary schools, a teacher will be assigned as a Volusia Live teachers. These teachers will only have students who are working at home to ensure that they can appropriately monitor students at this developmental level. Beginning in third grade, there are many variations in learning experiences and certifications. For these students, we believe a live stream option will be the best way to ensure that all students are actively involved in the learning taking place in the traditional classroom. This will also allow us to offer advanced programs such as IB and Cambridge for students who might not yet be able to attend face-to-face -face instruction. It is important to note that Volusia Live students are the rostered students for each individual teacher. This program is very fluid with our traditional classroom setting. Students in our third through 12th grade model will be able to keep their same teacher for each subject area or period throughout the school year whether they remain in Volu the Volusia Live program or if they decide to return to their home school. Our Volusia, there are several important details for families that would be considering Volusia Live. Our Volusia Live program mirrors the elementary and secondary traditional brick and mortar bell schedules. Our elementary students will log on every day from 7.50 to 2.30, breaking for lunch and recess. For our middle school students, Volusia Live hours will be from 9.30 to 4.15. And our high school students will participate from 8.30 to 3.30. One example might be a sixth grade Volusia Live student will join the live stream of his assigned math class during first period. During second period, he would join his science class. And then he would join his history class third period. The student would continue to log in to each period for the remainder of the day as was set up in his traditional brick and mortar schedule. As we mentioned at the high school level, if you are currently enrolled in Cambridge, <laughs> IB, AP, career academies, or any special program, you can continue to participate in these thro programs through our Volusia Live. Also, we felt it was important to note that if a parent chooses Volusia Live, approved school variances will continue to be honored. There are several important considerations in place to ensure that our English language learners can participate in our Volusia Live program. We will continue initial identification testing for our ESOL services. Additionally, we will conduct ELL committee meetings as needed based on progress monitoring data to determine appropriate services as follows. Classroom teacher support with accommodations and strategies, ESOL direct teacher support, ESOL paraprofessional assistance with communication. We will continue to provide extended learning opportunities when needed. As always, we will make a consistent effort from the ESOL department
for our non-English speaking families. At this time, I'm happy to introduce our newly appointed Executive Director of ESE, Ms. Amanda Wiles. Ms. Wiles will share information regarding how this option will support our students with special needs. Thank you, Ms. Servanek. We took great care and consideration when developing our plans to ensure that our students with disabilities will be able to successfully participate in our Volusia Live program. I must stress the importance for our families to communicate with their school of record if they plan to utilize Volusia Live. Early, identif early identification will allow our teams to review individualized education plans and schedule IEP meetings to address any revisions or modifications that will be necessary to ensure student success in this platform. We will maintain robust monitoring of IEP goals and objectives to ensure tiered systems of support for students not making progress toward their goals. IEP teams will reconvene when warranted or requested based on data collection and progress monitoring. The team will explore transition to another platform of instruction if necessary. The student's right to a free and appropriate public education will be determined and offered according to the data-driven decision made by the IEP team. In the Volusia Live option, our low incidence programs will have an adult to student ratio of four to one and paraprofessionals will be utilized when appropriate to assist in the live delivery of instruction for those students online. All student schedules, ESE pre-K through 12th grade will mirror their general education peer schedules allowing for services and accommodations to be delivered according to their IEP via the online platform. All student schedules will allow for other related services to be delivered, such as occupational, physical, and speech therapy, according to their IEP. At this time, Project SEARCH students will continue to receive their current services and vocational training. All service deliveries will be via Teams or Zoom. I would like to now introduce Dr. Peterson to join us to share information regarding option three, our enhanced Volusia online learning. Dr. Peterson. Thank you, Ms. Wiles. Yes, Volusia online learning is improved and has been enhanced to include uh, the following features, but these features are not limited to this list. We have highly qualified local Volusia County school teachers. We offer full and part-time options for our students in all grades, K through 12. We offer year-round enrollments into virtual courses for our part-time students. Uh, we are a VCS, a Volusia County Public School with academic advising, college planning, advanced courses being offered, um, and counseling. Uh, we have complete lessons that are accessible online, anywhere, anytime. Our full-time students will follow the standard school calendar. Uh, we're asking for a minimum semester commitment. Uh, we, we are fully accredited and NCA approved. Uh, approved school variances will continue to be honored for any family that chooses Volusia Online Learning. Of course, we will continue to work collaboratively with district departments to provide courses and supports for our students with disabilities, our English language learners, and our gifted students. Our elementary full-time students can expect their online courses to be engaging, interactive, and aligned to standards. Teachers will provide virtual live lessons with whole group and small groups, as well as one-to-one -one tutoring. Teachers will also offer flexible availability to be able to engage all students. While students are expected to engage in their courses three to five hours a day, outside of the required live lessons, it, that engagement is flexible. So students can work in the morning and go take a break and run outside and have recess. Uh, they can have lunch when they want to, um, and then they can get back on their courses before or after dinner. So it is quite flexible. Also, students can work on the weekends. Uh, elementary students also have the option, the opportunity to participate in special area classes and extracurricular clubs, such as news crew, technology club, STEM club, environmental club, and more. Our secondary full-time students can expect their, all, their courses 
to also be engaging and interactive. Teachers will provide live lessons, small group and large group and one-to-one -one tutoring. They will also offer flexible hours. Uh, we will be offering honors and AP courses for our secondary students, as well as a diverse, diverse list of electives. Do you want your student to take outdoor education? Sign up with us. Our uh, American Sign Language 1 and 2, we will offer that also. Secondary students will also have the opportunity to participate in extracurricular clubs such as yearbook, technology, and many more. Of course, success in a virtual course involves communication and collaboration between Volusia online learning faculty and staff, students, and families, as well as collaboration with the school and district department. We encourage families to act as learning coaches for their students by monitoring student progress in courses, encouraging the students to follow a schedule, creating a workspace in the home, and advocating for the student through modeling communication strategies. Our teachers will monitor all students' progression through the course on a daily basis. Our goal is personalized learning for student achievement. Uh, we focus on student learning um, every day through the monitoring of their progress. So again, our enhanced Volusia online learning, we offer all grade levels, K through 12, full-time and part-time virtual opportunities. Uh, what sets us apart is that we have local faculty and staff for unprecedented availability. We have the support of our community, Advent Health and Futures. We have year-round part-time enrollment, multiple platforms to meet the needs of all students. We have diverse course offerings. In fact, we're, we're averaging about 150 applicants a day. If you have any more questions, please join us at one of our information sessions that we hold every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 p.m. at the link found on our website. And I'm going to pass it now to Mr. West. Great. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. I appreciate that information. Um, we know the last few months have been very stressful for all of our students, teachers, parents, and stakeholders in the community. In these times of uncertainty, it's imperative that we not only support our students academically, but emotionally as well. We also want to ensure our employees have the support they need to give their best to our students. Recent research has shown that implementing specific social emotional learning strategies after a prolonged absence or during times of mobility can significantly increase student success. To that end, we're gonna be providing the following. Professional learning for teachers will take place during Volusia Learns, providing SEL strategies and activities for all of our classroom teachers. A calendar will be placed on the district website with daily activities for students in the classroom. Parents that may be struggling will have access to this information as well. Information will be provided to teachers and parents with look fors to identify students that may be struggling. This information will be placed on the website under the SEL mental health icon, and there are five specific components included in this plan. Small group supports will be held by counselors and student services when teachers submit referrals, both face-to-face -face or virtually. Individual counseling sessions will be available by school counselors, and mental health teams will assist if the counselors are getting large numbers of referrals. Well-being and mental health check-ins will be made to support students, families, and teachers. And of course, our employee assistance program is available for our faculty and staff for up to 12 free sessions. And at the end of those 12 sessions, the employees that need further services uh, will be referred to the primary care physician for additional services. So the safety precautions, which have been outlined previously for our students, are also here for our employees as well. In addition to the expectations of each employee, to take personal responsibility to social distance. There is also an expectation of wearing personal protection equipment and 
to do their part to reinforce that to our students in every way. As mentioned before by Mr. Aiken, each teacher will be provided with a kit, which includes cleaning supplies and personal protection equipment, including masks and face shields for different purposes. Plexiglass partitions will also be available where spacing is not applicable. And of course, training will be provided to all employees regarding the protocols in dealing with COVID-related situations. The next several slides will outline specific protocols to utilize if one of our students or employees are exposed to COVID-19. I want to take a minute to clarify some of the terms used in the table. Prolonged contact is considered greater than 15 minutes. Close contact is less than 15, six feet. A primary contact is an individual who has been directly exposed to a person confirmed with COVID-19. Infectious is symptomatic or within 48 hours of symptom onset. And we have two different types of clearances, test-based clearances where no symptoms are, have occurred and it resolves it, or has resulted in a negative test. And our non-test-based clearance is no symptoms with three or plus days of no fever and 10 plus days after the onset of the illness. So we are providing specific protocols for both students and employees in regards to the guidelines on how to handle exposure or potential exposure to COVID-19. So I'm gonna take just a moment to go through the chart here with specifically student protocols first. You'll notice in the first column, or in that first column, it shows different students with different types of things. And along the row there, if we take a look at the first student, that hopefully is gonna be the majority of our students with no symptoms or known exposure. They are not at risk under the procedures and practicing social distancing, wearing masks, as we have shared in our previous presentation and following CDC guidelines. The environment is daily cleaning and update as necessary with any kind of communication. They are not at risk, so quarantine is not necessary. If you'll take a look at the second row, that's a student who has symptoms consistent with COVID-19. In that case, the procedures that we will follow is that we will isolate the student, notify the administration, contact the parent for pickup, follow in the environmental procedures, which is in the next column, follow communication procedures, which is in the following column, and notify district, the district contact for um, possible tracing. Under environment, remove any student or staff that have been in the same area as that primary contact student and sanitize the area before returning. For communication, for all other students, send the letter to the parents of primary contacts upon confirmation and the teachers will be emailed immediately upon confirmation. Under quarantine, they will be quarantined and participate in distance learning if possible until a negative test is received and then re-entry is in when a student can return upon receipt of a negative test or completion of a 14-day quarantine and no symptoms. You'll notice under the third row, this is if a student reports a household member has tested positive for COVID-19. And you'll see the procedures are very similar. Um, th what we will do in step number three is to confirm the report with the parent or guardian and then have the student picked up. And then we'll follow the same environmental and communication or environmental procedures. Under communication, there will be no letter sent home since the actual student did not actually, um, was not the primary, but a secondary to the exposure. But however, the teachers will be emailed upon confirmation. In row number four, student who reports that have been tested positive for COVID-19, but has no symptoms, we will follow the same protocols 
to make sure um, in the first and second columns, and then also send the letter to parents of the primary conduct upon confirmation. So we have these protocols set up to make sure that we're ensuring the safety and that there is consistency across the entire district. And as I said, um, we will make sure that training is done for all of our employees in regarding these protocols. One other thing to mention is that um, we, during our conversations that um, siblings will be identified and protocols will be followed as the outline above. For example, in the same school or even in different schools. So on the next slide, we've established similar protocols in a response to our ex employee exposure and understanding that our employees are in many different environments, many in the classroom, but there will be instances that will need to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. But you'll notice as we go through here, and I'll just go through them quickly, and the same as we did with the students. In the first row, normal employee comes to work with no symptoms or no known exposure, not at risk, once again, practicing social distancing, wearing the mask or the face shield, following CDC guidelines. The environment, we you know, have daily cleaning, communication is just open and updates as necessary, but they are not at risk and quarantine is not necessary. If an employee has close contact with persons confirmed positive without the use of PPE, they're to immediately notify their supervisor. The supervisor notices, uh, notifies health services and human resources. The, we send the employee home to seek care and determine what that appropriate leave is, which I'll get to in just a moment. In the environment, remove any student or any other staff member that have been in the same area or in contact as the employee and sanitize that area before returning. For communication purposes, the supervisor will communicate with the employee employees and provide human resources with a list of those who have had prolonged and close contact with the employee. Employees on that list are notified, the procedures followed above, and if appropriate, will notify parents as well, as we did in the previous slide, of any students exposed to primary contact. That employee will be quarantined at home until test-based or non-test-based clearance is obtained. In the next row, any employee who has close contact with persons with constant use of PPE and social distancing will notify their supervisor. They will monitor their symptoms, document in daily temperature checks, sanitize the workplace as well, but no communication will need to be done until some either symptoms are shown or a diagnosis confirmed and isolate as much as practical, but will remain at work. And then the last scenario is an employee is symptomatic and or has confirmed a positive, been confirmed as a positive test. And of course, we'll follow the procedures there similar to the second one, um, removing any student or staff that's been in the same area. Supervisor is communicated to and then communicates to any employees that have been around that employee and then quarantined at home until test or non-test based clearance is obtained. So once that has been determined and an employee um, has a situation where they are sent home, human resources will work with the employees to determine what the appropriate leave is. If an employee is sent home by the supervisor, then human resources will determine whether a remote work environment may be approved based on their job responsibilities. If an employee is symptomatic or has risk factors that prevent them from physically working, reporting to work, then leave may be available to them. And there are a number of different options, including the FFCRE leave, sick leave, FMLA leave, any leave that's supported to them by uh, contract. So what we wanna do is make sure that we're assuring our employees that we do have, first of all, protocols in place and our parents and students as well, but also that we're taking care of our employees in an appropriate manner. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin Dissler, and Ms. Dissler will be talking about the technology support that we're providing.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. West. As we've discussed this evening, the many facets of our reopening plan, one item that is essential for success is a clearly defined technology support cycle, including the necessary digital resources, technology hardware, and training to support students and teachers. Throughout the spring, we had the opportunity to run a series of stress tests on many of our digital resources. We were able to determine what worked well and what areas were needed for improvement. One piece of feedback expressed by teachers was the desire to have the option to select from a variety of video conferencing platforms to enhance the learning and communication experience with students. This summer, we have worked to acquire district-based licensing for Zoom and will continue our implementation and strong utilization of Microsoft Teams. This will give our teachers options for how they would like to leverage these digital resources with their students. Additionally, we are working closely with our learning management system provider, Canvas, on loading our eligible instructional materials via thin common cartridge in Canvas. This will provide flexibility and content options for teachers when using Canvas. Canvas can be used in the traditional classroom setting to provide blended learning opportunities and used in Volusia Live and Volusia Online Learning to bring learning to life at home. Technology hardware. As we make strides in reaching for our goal of becoming a one-to-one -one school district, we understand the importance of teachers having the latest and greatest technology at their fingertips to best support students. We are working to provide teachers with newer technology hardware with improved cameras and audio capabilities. Additionally, our team is reviewing plug and play speakers and microphones and web cameras to assist with Volusia Live offerings where needed. Training. Training is one of the most instrumental components of the technology support cycle. We know that teachers and families and students have varying comfort levels with digital resources and technology hardware. Our team is working in conjunction with K-12 curriculum teams to provide a series of training opportunities for teachers focused on maximizing digital resources within the cl traditional classroom setting and through Volusia Live offerings. We are excited to support and emphasize the incredible impact technology can have on educational opportunities when coupled with great teaching. As we plan our next steps, it will be important that we hear from our families to determine their preference. Dr. Balgobin will be sharing information related to our next steps for our reopening plan. Thank you, Dr. Balgobin. Thank you, Ms. Caitlin, and I, I, board, I'd like to thank the, uh, all of the presenters this evening. I want you to know that we have spent many, many hours in the development of this plan. Um, so I'd like to share with you now what will be the next steps. Once this plan is approved, there will be several actions that will be taken. First, we'll be meeting with our principals by division to help and assist with the, ensuring that the proper protocol and structures are put into place. Um, we will have a portion of our website that will be dedicated to the reopening with resources available for all. We will have releasing resources in the upcoming weeks. Obviously, this will be after board approval to support categories such as our parents, specifically for parents, teachers, administrators for the upcoming year. This website will be updated and new information that's posted on this website will be released and sent immediately to our families. Um, I want to go back and emphasize a little bit that when we meet with our principals, it will be um, the first meeting will be to discuss the plan in detail. But after those meetings, we will have several workshops set up as well with cabinet members there. And we will be collaborating and working in conjunction with our principals to ensure that there are plans in place to, for the successful reopening of our schools. Um, we will also keep our um, parents updated on a weekly basis in terms of the implementation of those plans. 
we could come here today and do a beautiful presentation for everyone. But if we don't take the time to properly sit and plan and ensure that all those measures are in place, it's to no avail a beautiful presentation. So it's equally important that we have those steps and those measures in place, and we will be collaborating and working side by side with our administrators and keeping our families updated on a weekly basis in terms of how the implementation of our plan for reopening is coming along so that they can follow us and be a part of that process. Additionally, the pre-registration, there will be a pre-registration that we will be sending out and it will be very, very important. There will be a deadline for this re re pre-registration. It will be important for us to complete it as accurate as possible and there will be one for each family, but for each student, there will, there will be one completed. This will help us determine busing. It will help us determine what model our, our parents are choosing for their students and so that we can do proper planning. I will share with you uh, a little bit in some conversations that I've had with nearby districts. Um, you know, some of the districts have have, have a very similar um, options to ours. We are looking right now, based on what nearby districts have received, almost like a 20%, 20 to 26% for each, uh, for the uh, their enhanced model or their um, innovative model and for their online model. Um, so I, I want you to know that there are several other resources that we're putting together. There's a guide that will be available in the upcoming weeks. The guide will be very detailed, to, again, to support our parents, teachers, and administrators. We will include an overview, again, of the options for the school year. And all of this will be posted on our website. Or our parents will be updated, uh, as I stated, on a weekly basis. Because I'm a firm believer, and we are a firm believer here in VCS, that your plan can be successful if you if you take your time in ensuring that all the details are in place. And I hope that, that we were able to demonstrate a little bit of that tonight, as you would see that our team, as they came together and worked together, they really try to capture a, and listen to the voices in our community. And you've heard that quite a bit as it relates to the ACE, IB, Cambridge programs, and how we'll be able to facilitate that through our um, our innovative model. Um, so I want to thank again everyone for, for, for the time that you've taken to put this together to present and, and a special, very special thank you for our committee. This work began very many weeks ago and as you can see we've had the elementary division, we've got had the high school division, the middle school division, communication, um, it, and members from our community, medical community, um, and, uh, Ms. Boswell has contributed quite a bit to our plan and, and been part of those focus meetings. So it really takes a village to raise a child and time and time again we see the importance of people coming together. So if there's one thing I want to leave before I conclude this presentation tonight is that by working together we are so much stronger. We need to come together in times of uncertainty is this. We don't know how much longer this was going to permeate in our, in our community, but by coming together, we will be able to do the best that we possibly can for our students based on these circumstances in which we're dealing with. So thank you, everybody. Thank you tonight for giving us an opportunity to present our plan to you, board. Thank you, Dr. Bagelman and all of the presenters for uh, the information. That was real informative. Uh, colleagues, do you want to start with questioning or do we want to start addressing our uh, guests receiving those calls? Yes? Okay. Uh, Mr. Griffin, we're going to go ahead and start taking the calls from our public. Yes, ma'am. Um, Adrian, do you want to go ahead and control that? And we just want to remind our guests that we will not be responding, but they will have three minutes and we thank them for joining us. Ms. Wright, it's Kelly Schultz. We have Karen Weinrich, who is just been admitted into the meeting and Ms. Weinrich, if you hit star six, you can un unmute.
Mrs. Weinrich. Good evening, Mrs. Weinrich. Mrs. Schultz, I don't hear. Ah. Hi, you can hear me now? Yes, good evening, Mrs. Weinrich. Please state your name and you have three minutes to uh, address the board. Good evening, this is Karen Weinrich, um, 3892 Sunset Cove in Port Orange. Um, I've got lots of thoughts, but I know I only have three minutes, so I'm going to just try to focus in a little bit. Um, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm the parent of a rising senior, and there's nothing I like more than to reopen brick and mortar schools. Um, but after listening to the health department presentation, I do not believe it's safe to do so. Um, I listened to Governor DeSantis' press conference the other day, and he emphasized the, the three C's. And as I listened to them, I thought of my classroom. So the three C's that the um, state health department is talking about that we should avoid is number one closed spaces with poor ventilation number two crowded places and number three close contact settings and all three of those are things you see in the classroom um, you know obviously it's a closed it's an enclosed space and the ventilation is um, less than ideal when we talk about crowded my room is not big enough to keep the children six feet apart and of course, close contact settings comes when we have any kind of um, small group instruction. So I'm, I'm very concerned for the health and safety of all of our employees and all of our children and then their families as well who they go back home to. So in light of trying to bring solutions, what I would suggest is first of all, pushing the start date back as far as we can, which I believe is the last week of August. And that would give teachers time for us to get all this training and all in this presentation I kept hearing over and over there's lots of training these teachers need we need to do this training this training this training and we, we can't do that in four days of pre-planning so if you push the students start take that but bring the teachers you have time for that and then that the other thing we can do is we can go all virtual and if we push it back that would give us time where we could have appointments our students and their families could come in one at a time, they could meet us, we could give them the materials they need, and then we can start virtually and hopefully, as soon as possible, go back to brick and mortar. But at this time, I don't feel that it's safe to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller. Next, we have Miss Elizabeth Albert. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, good. I just want to make sure. So uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Balgobin, and the audience. So I just need a clarification. I know you're not going to answer me. So I'm just I'm confused if this really is a workshop or if this is a meeting. It's advertised as a special session. I noticed that we voted on items 5.01 and 5.02. Um, so I'm a little confused there. Also interested that uh, interesting that we had a change in the protocol. And so if the rules of the game were going to be changed prior to the meeting, the public should have been told. Um, each one of you had several opportunities to engage with folks in email correspondence that I was copied on. So um, I would have thought that that would have been afforded to people who were planning to participate tonight. And I do agree about working together. In a moment that we need to be able to talk to each other and work shoulder to shoulder to find solutions, this change has done nothing but confirm to me and those who are listening that maybe we aren't really interested in doing this work. And listening to the voices of educational professionals, parents, and the community members who have um, selected you to actually do this work. So if I understand the events of the evening correctly, we will not be voting tonight um, to select an, uh, to select to this plan. Um, and then we will continue to have our uh, educational prof professionals, parents, students, and community members wondering about what Volusia County Schools will look like in the coming school year. Um, and let's be reminded that kids are currently scheduled to start on August 17th. So our data shows that from the beginning of the pandemic in March, we originally had, when we originally closed our schools, 
um, through June 12th, there were only 40 positive cases of COVID in children under 18. As of yesterday, there were 191 confirmed cases of COVID in children 14 years old and under. This is a shocking rise in numbers. And let's think about what the difference could be. Uh, our schools were closed. Our uh, daycares were closed, dance studios, other activity programs were closed. Now we've reopened, and let's look at what that's causing our numbers to do. I believe all of you understand and agree that we must not reopen our schools for face-to-face -face instruction until we can honestly meet the CDC guidelines, which state there must be a reduction in positive COVID cases. As we move toward discussing the options for reopening, I would like to remind you that these options presented to you this evening still need to be refined, and the terms and conditions of work must be bargained. We are in support of all of the options, conceptually speaking, but we have significant concerns with each one. Brick and mortar, I just stated the concern. You know, we need to make sure that health and safety is the priority. Uh, VOL, um, how will those significant increases in students be managed, and what are the expectations for VOL instructors and support professionals? And Volusia Lies, you know, where do we start here? Uh, distance learning is something that we are in favor of. Um, because we want our students to stay connected, particularly to their zone schools. We want them to follow the curriculum and the pacing guides, and we want them to stay up uh, to speed. But uh, we are vehemently opposed to any plan that expects a teacher or a paraprofessional to split their attention between two groups of students. Currently, this plan is creating this barrier in grades 3 through 12. So please know that we're looking forward to engaging in the work of bargaining these items for our support and instructional personnel. And please remember that any attempt to implement any of this part plan Part of this plan prior to the completion of bargaining will result in further formal action. Thank you very much, and I appreciate being allowed to sit in the boardroom this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Albert. Our next caller. Liz Sokerka. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Sokerka. Hello, Mrs. Serkaka. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Please can state your name and you have three minutes. Yes, ma'am. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yeah. I can hear can you. you. Hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. My name is Lisa Kirka. I'm a teacher. I live at 4445 Katy Drive, New Smyrna Beach. And I just want to say I love and I miss my students. But I know in my heart that this is not the right time to bring our children back to the classroom. Yes, there were challenges with distance learning. But I am a better teacher because of them. And I believe we are a stronger district because we persevered together. I have never seen our union, teachers, tech support, district staff, administrators, parents, and students work closer together for a common goal. Students collaborated to solve technical issues and shared academic and emotional support with each other. Students took charge of their own learning and worked at their own pace. But if they had a problem or if the data I was monitoring presented an alarm, we were only a video chat away from each other. Parents often joined in, and that was wonderful. I may have even convinced <clears throat> several of my parents that this new math was really not that bad. Is distance learning perfect? No. But together, we can overcome the hurdles it presents. The one hurdle that will knock us down emotionally and leave scars that may never heal is the death of one of our students or one of our teachers or any member of our Volusia School family. For now, let us continue distance learning. With the majority of our students and staff working off campus, we could possibly work on a plan to safely open our schools five days a week by appointment for those who do not have access to internet and for those who truly need individual or small group services. If we send our young people back to air-conditioned classrooms for six to eight hours per day, five days a week, problems will arise. Governor DeSantis himself cites young people socializing in confined air-conditioned areas as fuel for the spike in COVID-19 cases. It would be like playing Russian roulette with our students and employees. For most, the virus will be kind or sneak by without being detected. 
but it does have a deadly side, <clears throat> and we have no certainty of whom it will target. We voted for you and put our trust in you. Your acceptance was a promise to ensure a safe learning environment for all students and employees. I understand opening schools has been mandated and the threat of lost funds looms over your head, but you are leaders entrusted with the lives of so many. Lead by example and teach our children that they will be faced with hard decisions and threats from bullies as well as from people with good intentions. But as leaders, they Thank must you, listen Mr. to Mr. different Scott. points of view and they make decisions based not on fear, but with courage and the well-being of the people that they... Thank, thank you very much. Okay, now we have Mr. Dylan Emmerich Brown. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown? Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you now, Mr. Brown. Go right ahead. You uh, have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Dylan Emmerich Brown, and while I live at 1720 Lobelia Drive in Lake Mary, I am an English teacher at Deltona High School. As members of the Volusia County School Board, you are in a unique and honored position. I want you to consider those two words for a moment, unique and honored. It is unique in that you are the only individuals in your position of authority and influence. It is honored in that you were chosen by the people to lead. It is easy to be a leader when the sun is shining on your face and the wind is at your back. However, the true test of a leader qualified to be in such a unique and honored position is to lead when the storms are on the horizon and shore is nowhere in sight. To lead means sometimes standing up to and doing what is seen as unpopular by the loudest in your constituency. I will not cite statistics or repeat pleas you've already heard. I simply ask that when the board votes in the near future, you temporarily mandate face masks or face shields on the enforceable dress code for the first semester, quarter at the very least. The district plan presented this evening requires students wear face masks on school buses requires students wear face masks to come on campus, requires students to wear face masks during transitions. However, in an enclosed, poorly ventilated classroom with dozens of other students talking in prolonged and close contact, face masks are only strongly recommended. Where's the logic in that? All of the mountains of evidence from medical professionals around the world have shown that based on how COVID-19 spreads, face masks are the best way to ensure a safe learning environment for our students faculty, staff, and the families we return home to each day. Given that this is within your power, claiming that it is up to the state or the county commissioners is a dereliction of that unique and honored position you now hold. A strongly worded recommendation to wear face masks in a public school during the worst viral pandemic in American history, which has already claimed well over 100,000 lives in this country alone, would reflect the handing off of responsibility we have placed in your hands to the loudest opponents of science, compassion, and that very essential element of society you have vowed to uphold, education. Regarding the numbers that have been reflected today, it only takes one person to cause an outbreak, but it only takes five people to vote to keep 63,000 students safe. The option to save lives is in your hands, and what you do with it will have consequences but you have asked for the privilege to make that choice and we made the decision to elect you in times of need to make it on our behalf. Please do not let us down. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next caller. Up next is Mr. Jonathan Walters. Good evening, Mr. Walters. Good evening. Um, my name is Jonathan Walters, 1718 Westview Drive in Deland. Uh, good evening and thank you very much for your time. I'm a Daytona Beach native and veteran, but most importantly, I'm a proud spouse of a highly skilled VCS elementary teacher who is just one of so many dedicated professionals tirelessly serving students and families in this county. I'm also a parent of three, two of which attend elementary school within the county. While understanding that this is not an actionable voting item today, I am here to implore you all to act compassionately and decisively with the children, family, and staff you serve primarily in mind. 
If you do choose to enforce politically motivated state and federal directives to move forward with opening brick and mortar institutions prematurely in any capacity at this time, it must be implemented in a completely voluntary manner that fully addresses stakeholder concerns, which I honestly didn't feel were, were properly addressed in the, in the presentation. Any planning must also accommodate BCS employees who have reservations about placing themselves at risk, and they should not be penalized or have to risk loss of income at a time when we as a county are struggling with a 14.4% unemployment rate that exceeds state and national trends and which could potentially precipitate an exodus of skilled educators at a critical point. Educators who opt out to teach, I'm sorry, who opt to teach in physical settings must also not fear unreasonable guidelines or procedural red tape should they become infected and face extended absences that may affect livelihoods. For any educators mandated to return to classrooms and not presented with alternative positions or paid leave options, or for families that choose or through their economic circumstances are forced to return their students to brick and mortar settings, the county must draft and publicly present a supplemental action plan that acknowledges and addresses the legal implications of that decision and the potential litiga litigation risk associated with exposing students, educators, staff, and families to a potentially deadly virus during an unprecedented pandemic at a time when our state is one of the hot spots of the entire world. And finally, uh, this board must not push the cost of managing this pandemic on its already hard-pressed educators, staff, and families. Uh, I saw the presentation, but I note this because I know what my wife spends out of pocket every year. I implore you and fully expect that going forward, you all willingly risk your positions in order to act rationally in, in your decision making and thoughtfully consider all local stakeholders involved, local stakeholders, and choose the morally correct path forward that does not put lives at risk for political expediency or place greater value on economic concerns over student, teacher, and family lives. Thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Walters. Next caller. Next up is Danielle Lester. Ms. Lester? Hello. Good afternoon, Ms. Ms. Mr. Lester? Yes, actually, my wife is putting the, our one-year-old to bed right now, so I'm filling oh, okay. in for her. But, but I am a paraprofessional in an EBD classroom with Volusia County, um, and I've been listening to the uh, the meeting all night tonight. And uh, I have to be honest, I was very surprised with the uh, the number of cases that we had in Volusia County. It was very shocking to me, um, and I, I have my own concerns. You know, uh, being a first-time father. Um, it, it does scare me uh, going to work and, and the fact that we live with my mother-in-law who is in her uh, 60s that, uh, you know, potentially uh, contracting something and bringing it home to my family uh, is a scary idea. Uh, but not only that, due to the fact that I work in an EBD classroom, the, the students that I work with um, are students that uh, may have uh, crisis situations and um, wearing protective uh, materials like masks or shields on our faces um, and having to deal with a student in crisis um, is a concern as well because, you know, it, sometimes things can be violent and they can grab at your face or your protective materials and trying to keep that on and manage it while also trying to attend to that student and help them through their situation um, it is a concern and in, in how we're going to keep um, staff safe in those kind of scenarios. Not only that, but uh, parents that have to work with... Um, students in multi-VE classrooms that have compromised immune systems that would be very much of all, um, vulnerable to this virus is, is also a concern of, of mine, and I know many others. Um, it, it's, it's one of those things that uh, right now um, our concern in my family is, is keeping everybody safe and, and hoping that uh, we'd be able to keep all of the sta uh, staff and faculty at our schools um, safe um, from you know, bringing something home to the family or even children who get picked up by their grandparents because a lot of the, the kids in my class have grandparents who drop them off and pick them up at the end of the day because parents are at work. And we know that the elderly people are more susceptible to catching this virus. And um, I would hate to have that on my conscience that, you know, a grandparent or a family member could be exposed to uh, something like that by just doing what they need to do 
on a daily basis with their routine by ch taking care of their grandchildren. Thank you, Mr. Lester. Thank you. Next caller. Next up is Mr. Joseph Sweeney. Good evening, Mr. Sweeney. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for um, the job that you're doing for us, um, teachers. I'm a teacher, uh, multi-VE. Uh, my name is Joseph Sweeney, uh, 2477 Del Barton Avenue. Um, I have a daughter also that attends school at my school at Spirit. Um, so I wanted to speak specifically on the angle of multi-VE. I'm a multi-VE teacher. And very concerning to me because my students require a lot of um, hands-on attention. Um, I, uh, I'm NCI trained. I often have to, wouldn't say often, but often enough have to restrain children. Um, they bite, they spit, um, they need to be changed in the bathroom. They are, they hit each other. They, they do a lot of things that are, um, outside of what uh, normal, I would just say, general education de teacher deals with. And um, I just think about the, also the, like, I'm bet piggybacking on what someone had said before about health concerns. I'm very familiar with the nurse at our school. Um, our kids have a lot of, um, they cough, they have, they come runny nose, they have, it's, it's almost like a circulating thing in um, our whole department. And I'm just really concerned about their safety. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually excited about going back to school um, in the sense that I miss my kids. And I'm kind of stir crazy sitting here in the house all day. And um, it was a challenge um, teaching uh, Florida virtual and having a student and helping her at the same time. But at this time, I feel at least for the very near foreseeable future that that's our best option. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Next is Mr. Scott Balin. Good evening, Mr. Balin. Good evening, Mr. Balin. Mr. Scott Balin. Hello? Yes, Mr. Balin. Hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Uh, you have three minutes to address the board. Go oh, right okay. ahead. You know, I'm sorry. I didn't even know that I was That's online. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I, first thing I wanted to do is just to say thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, I, I'm a first time uh, viewer. First time I've ever been to a school board meeting. So, uh, you guys did a fantastic job. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, what I wanted to really just focus on quickly was um, I'm hoping that they'll put a copy of the presentation online so I can download it. I didn't. I, I, did, I missed some of the slides. So I'm hoping to get a chance to read some of it. But I really wanted to take a chance too, to thank thank you and thank all the teachers. Um, I learned uh, over this past spring semester that I am not smart enough to be a teacher and don't have the skills. Uh, to teach my kids. I have a kid that's going into high school and one that's still in, a, in elementary school. And uh, I just have a great deal of respect for what everybody did. Um, regarding the plans for this coming school year, my biggest concerns uh, seem to be answered. I'm hoping in that um, uh, both of my kids are on a variant, so they'll uh, uh, hopefully uh, they won't lose their variants with their schools. Um, I don't know if it'll be specified later on whether uh, when you sign up for a program, it's for the entire year or whether you can switch, say, if it's between uh, Volusia Live and brick and mortar, if things hopefully get better, that you can then go uh, to back to school instead of being uh, on the live or vice versa if they start in brick and mortar and go back. Um, the other concern I hope they specify a little better is just regarding uh, as far as identifying kids. If anyone is identified as positive, I know they said in the uh, presentation that um, – you would only be isolating children that are, you know, within six feet of a student, say, who's positive or, and for a 15 minute time period. But certainly, uh, it'd be pretty easy, I think, for kids to be able to figure out uh, who's sick, 
even though they're not going to be announcing the names if it's kind of a small area like that. But hopefully uh, there will also be options available for kids to continue their education. I know this limits on absenteeism. If for some reason that happens multiple times in a year, the thought of a student having to be out of school for a couple of weeks at a time just to quarantining uh, due to exposure, I don't know how that would affect their attendance record and their ability to continue learning. But uh, that was it. Thank you guys again. God bless. Uh, stay you. safe. And uh, we'll hope for the best. And thank you again to all the teachers. Thank Bye-bye. you. And, and, and this will be posted. Thank you. Next caller. Next is Mr. Kenneth Ashby. Good evening, Mr. Ashby. Mr. Ashby. Mr. Ashby. You might have some difficulty unmuting his phone. If you hit star six, Mr. Ashby, you can unmute your phone. We can move on to the next person if okay. you would like. Yes, and then we could come okay. back to Mr. Ashby. Yes. Okay, next would be Johnny Helms, Mr. Johnny Helms. Good evening, Mr. Helms. Good evening, Mr. Helms. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Mr. Helms. Uh, just state your name. Uh, we have three is... minutes to address the board. Awesome. My name is uh, Johnny Helms. I am the husband of a elementary school teacher here in Delano, Florida. Um, I, I do want to start off by saying thank you to you guys. It was a very informative um, board meeting. Um, I've been listening to it since the beginning. Um, I just want to state a couple concerns um, as far as opening brick and mortar schools. My first concern is is this idea of being able to contain um, the spread in any really meaningful way. Um, because according to the majority of statistics I've looked at, the majority of numbers, many people that are contracting this disease, I think according to the London School of Hygiene, um, four out of five people that have contracted this disease in their particular survey under the age of 20 are asymptomatic. So I think this idea of which you would be able to contain the spread in a brick and mortar environment by identifying children that are, are sick is just not a reality with this particular disease. I also would like to highlight the uh, um, another situation, which is in a contained bus situation. I'm unsure, I understand that there are procedures and protocols that are put in place, but I think that having um, the bus driver being able to control a bunch of, especially elementary school kids for keeping their mask on or not, or maintaining any type of social distance, I really think is, is not, is not reasonable to assume that's going to be able to be taken place every day, all the time. Another um, big area of concern of which I have is my, my wife teaches children with uh, special educational needs of which she has to change some of these children, um, of which some of these children have, I wouldn't say excessively severe, but definitely require additional attention. Um, I don't know how the expectation is that between changing them, between um, generally them maintaining not not wonderful hygiene in their current state, how putting a mask on them and they're going to be able to keep it on, when in reality, again, I just, I, I doubt the realistic, that any of those have realistic ex- expectations of actually being able to follow through in a brick and mortar scenario. However, um, and the last thing that I also want to mention is I don't understand how schools being closed in April when our caseload was so minuscule. Now, as cases are continuing to rise and the death toll is continuing to rise and the hospitalizations are continuing to rise, how it makes any logical sense to open a brick and mortar school at this time. I work in the healthcare field, so if my wife were to bring this home, I work with primarily elderly people. So this, I, so all it would take was her to bring it home to me, and if I'm asymptomatic, I might not even know I have it and give it to somebody outside of the school system in itself. So I think that 
I just want to remind you guys that the effect of this decision will have much larger impacts than just in the school system because these people are going to bring it to their families and so on and so forth. Um, that's all I have to say, but I do want to thank that's you guys. Um, and I hope you have a great evening. You too, Mr. Helms. Thank you. Next caller. Mr. Kenneth Ashby. Okay. Good evening, Mr. Ashby. Mr. Ashby? Mr. Ashby? Okay, it appears he's in the meeting but not answering. We can move on to the next person if you'd like. Mateus Cabeza? Okay. Mr. Cabeza? Hello. Yes, Mr. Cabeza. Yes. Good afternoon, school board members. My name is Matias Cabeza, and I'm a student at Tabriz High School. I have had the chance to watch your presentation of the fall 2020 reopening plan. Well, I do believe it has many good elements. It does not go far enough to protect your stakeholders, and I hardly believe that it will be able to be enacted to the extent that you all would like it to. I will register for Volusia Live and abstain from the train wreck that will be Volusia County Schools this fall reopening, but teachers don't have such a simple choice and you have an obligation to only present options that are safe. While I have heard that you are in a tough place with pressure from state and federal leaders, while I am aware of this pressure, you were not elected to stand idly by while higher officials put politically motivated initiatives into place. You were elected to stand up to these authorities and fight for your stakeholders. Not only will this plan be put into effect poorly, it doesn't exactly go far enough. Masks reduce infections by 70%, but our school board of Volusia County does not plan on mandating these masks. Social distancing will not be possible in our classrooms as much as you wish it would be. BCS has already had enough issues with custodial services, yet you expect to add it onto their workload and think that it will go well. There are a host of other issues, but I've been limited to three minutes and you've decided to limit the public participation to an hour. A hybrid model has not been presented and it is too expensive according to our district, but you know what's really expensive? The lawsuits that will ensue from opening brick and mortar schools. As the Florida Constitution states, we have a right to be safe in our schools. We most certainly will not be safe in our schools with the community spread of COVID-19 being at the rate that it currently is. I want you to make this decision like you will be in the classroom five days a week, eight hours a day. You know it isn't safe. As Mr. Cologne said, the Department of Health won't even say it's safe for us to go back. But what you also know, you won't be in these classrooms. Teachers and students will be. What you've shown is a disregard for teachers, parents, and students, and that is what your voting constituents will show for you when they are in the polling booth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cabeza. Next caller. Next up is Mr. Brian Manny. Did, did we get Mr. Ashby back yet? Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Manny. Yes, my I have a few questions. Now, my concerns are the numbers are starting to spike up again in Florida, and my I have a special needs kids um, who are go to special ed classes and stuff like that, and it's hard enough for the teacher to get them him to do his work and stuff because he's autistic he has ADHD if he has seizures the teacher has to run over put a magnet on him how are they expected to get these kids who have special disabilities to wear a mask all day and if they have respiratory problems another thing I didn't hear about is my daughter who worked very hard to get into the IB program if I put her on virtual learning, will she be able to go back into the IB program once school restarts? And so, Mr. Manning, normally we don't do this, but we'll make sure we post the presentation because, yes, the second option will allow students that are, are enrolled in IB, Cambridge, and other programs to participate. Okay, because as I said, is I don't feel safe sending my kids back. I think it's at a bigger risk right now with the numbers going up and 33%.
of them are children. And I was just wondering uh, about the fact is, what are their plans for the special needs students? Like, I have a child who's in 11th grade, but he has a mentality of like a four or five year old. So how are these teachers going to be able to make them wear a mask all day and tell them that they can't get up and not socialize when they don't really have the mentality to do it? So, Mr. Manning, we'll make sure that when we will go to our next caller, but I'll make sure that they take your number so someone from the district can give you a call back and answer that very specific question. That's okay with you. Okay, that'll be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Kelly, can you get his number, please? Yes, I will. Thank yep, you. Next call. We have it here. We have okay. it here. Um, um, up next is uh, Ms. Kim Short. Good evening, Mrs. Short. Ms. Short? Um, good evening. Sorry, I was having a, a moment trying to unmute this. Um, do I need to do I need to do anything besides just say my name, Ida? No, you're good. You got three minutes. Okay, okay. Um, thank you very much um, for the presentation, uh, everybody. This is a little strange calling in, but uh, <laughs> I did want to say that you guys did an excellent job. It was very thorough. Um, I tonight I really just want to focus on a couple things. One, I think that um, after reviewing most of the plans that the other districts have put out. I would urge the board to seriously consider that we, we're we going to need more time. I think we're going to need more time to open up our doors for people to feel comfortable. I think that if the goal is to provide choices to our families, that we're going to need to make sure that we are fully prepared. And in doing that, we're going to need time to have our people go through training to make sure that we have the right teachers in the right places and that our administrators are also 100% comfortable with the cleaning, cleaning procedures that um, are going to need to be increased on our campuses. From speaking to families um, and to teachers, the number one thing that has been shared to me that would be something that um, they would make them feel much better is if they felt better about the cleaning procedures. And I think that it all sounds really good in the, in the, in the way that you guys laid everything out. But, you know, the, the, the details is where the excellence lies. And we all have to feel comfortable that that's actually going to happen. So that would be something that I would stress as, as an overall um, arching concern. The, the other thing is that I know that some of our teachers have had some concerns with the live option. Um, I hope that maybe some of that is going to be set aside after hearing that it would be a dedicated teacher, not somebody who's doing both at the same time. Uh, as a parent, I, I really think that's a very important option to preserve. And I would urge the board and remind the board that the primary, the primary thing that we're all here to do or that you're all there to do and that everybody in this whole county is supposed to be doing is worrying about student achievement. And we need to be able to find multiple pathways for our children to have those successes in front of them and that eliminating options from them should be the last thing that we want to do. So I would urge that we, um, that we you know, keep that in mind with whatever it is that you're, that you're going to be considering. Um, there's nothing better than being back in school. And I know that where there's a will, there's a way. And that if you guys all, you know, work together, we all work together as a community, we can find a way to make this work. So I think that's really all I wanted to say to you guys. Thank you so much. I cannot even possibly imagine the situation that you're all in right now and how difficult this is. If there's anything that, you know, I can do to support you or if there's anything that you think that, you know, our community needs, please, please let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Short. Next caller. Next up is Ms. Mary D. Padova. Good evening, Mrs. Padova. Hi. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, I teach first grade, 
I'm concerned for my health and my safety. We're looking to you to make decisions to protect all of us. The decision to return to school based on the fact that students have less serious reactions as compared with adults tells us that teachers and staff are being left out of the equation. Mandating masks is the very minimum I ask that you do for us. Tissues are no substitutes for masks. The plans presented sound exactly like the plans that were accidentally released over the weekend. I believe it would be a mistake to go back too soon. My idea for a solution is to delay the opening of schools until after Labor Day. Schools up north do this already. We're not being held to the 180 days this, of school this year, so let's take this time to get the virus under control. Teachers can report remotely at our normally scheduled date and time. We can use this time wisely to compute complete any PD for the year. Anything mandated, including reading endorsement, ESOL endorsement, this would alleviate the need for ERPD, and we can double down on working through the entire day on Wednesday per negotiation. We can use this time also planning for when students come back. We could make sure our children have access to technology, broadband, and meals. We can take the time before Labor Day to plan for the digital learning. I also like the idea of inviting individual and small groups of children into the classroom who need extra help when we start going back. This idea was not presented, yet live streaming of our classrooms, which would be ineffective in managing and monitoring student learning on two platforms and an extremely invasive plan for students and teachers alike was. I appreciate the cohorts for elementary. If we must go back, I support this new idea to some extent. Please consider the teacher who will be in that classroom for the entire day with the same group of students and their droplets. Consider any other adult coming into the classroom and the germs they will carry with them from room to room, perhaps carrying the virus unknowingly with them. Consider the age and inefficiency of our HVAC system and how the air will be circulated from room to room and the classrooms whose windows don't open. Consider the teachers who are health compromised with autoimmune or other health issues. We all know what happened in the VPK classroom. This was five students. What will we do when we have 20 plus students? Can you in good conscience send us back if you're not certain that we will all live through this? I know that your thought must be on your mind. You must provide a safe environment for students and employees. Are you certain beyond a doubt that you can do this? Florida is the epicenter of COVID-19. The fact that is that we cannot be sure. So why push for face-to-face? -face? I'm sure that you want all of us Ms. to be safe. Ms. Padova, sure Ms. Padova, I'm gonna let yes. I'm gonna need you to wrap it up because uh, you're at your three minutes, but go right ahead. Finish your last sentence. My last sentence is please, please think about delaying the school year. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Next caller. Next up is Ms. Catherine Fess. Are, are you saying Fest? F? Fest as in Frank, starting with the letter F. Frank. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mrs. Fest. Good evening. Ms. Schultz, she needs to hit what, star six? Star six. Ms. Fest, if you could hit star six on your phone, please. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Not bad. Um, all right, I am a 79-year-old guardian of a fourth grader. My concern is that when I was listening to the presentation, when the health department said that they had 300-plus students that had became ill, I felt like those tests were not accurate with the way it, most of these testing grounds are adults. I see very few children that are tested. They even tell you on the television. Let's get the adults in there. First it's the older ones, and now it's the ones who have been out, you know, out in the public, but not the children. The children are usually tested when they are showing signs of the disease and need to be going to one of the urgent cares. So I think the numbers are way off. But anyway, in spite of all that, it is not safe when our own health department can't back us up. And so it's my desire that you all would wait and put this off until it's a safer time. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. 
I, we have one other person in the lobby. We don't recognize the number. Did Mr. Ashby ever come back? No, he ended up dropping off the call. We can try to reach out to him. Okay. If you could bring in the last call and see, can you reach out? I'll, I'll appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Can you please state your name? And you have three minutes. Uh, I am Kenneth Ashby. My address oh, okay. is 1952 Yellowfin Drive. Tried another phone, so hopefully it works this time. Yeah, they were uh, actually calling you on another line, Mr. Ashby, but go right ahead. Oh, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Thank you for taking my call. Um, I am a local parent, spouse of a VCS teacher, and teacher advocate for the group Volusia Teachers for a Safe Reopening. I'm here to urge you to do all in your power to act in the best interest of our teachers, students, and staff. I volunteered to call today because whenever, like many times when I see a teacher voice legitimate concerns on social media, they're told to, quote, quit complaining or just get a new job. I'm sure you can imagine that if teachers heeded this advice, this would not help, not help our already concerning teacher shortage crisis. Whatever options the board approves, I hope the public understands this year will not look like any other. Unfortunately, the HEROES Act is not going anywhere in the Senate. The feds have kicked the can to the states. The governor has done the same to school boards, and many are not looking at, looking at the best interest of teachers. I feel for board members and superintendents that should not have been put in this position. But that is where we are. Please do not abdicate your responsibility. The board members of VCS need to advocate and require a much stronger and fully thought out back to school plan. At least some of the surrounding counties are giving both teachers and parents flexibility and uh, with, with ideas like Seminole Connect and Launch Ed. Both teachers and students should not have to leave their home school for virtual instruction choices. While Volusia Live will appease your vocal IB and ACE parents, it does nothing to ensure the safety of our teachers. It would e I would even argue that it poses a genuine threat to teacher mental health and may be detrimental, there may be detrimental repercussions and privacy issues for classroom students. A few non-mandatory masks and some cleaning supplies that will likely not last a few weeks won't cut it, especially even when there is no detailed plan for what to do when an outbreak occurs. Just hoping is not enough. Our group has sent out a list of detailed questions to board members and the interim superintendent. I hope to see direct answers to those questions. Mrs. Wright, thank you for requiring this desperately needed meeting. Mrs. Cuthbert, as a former t teacher, I'm sure you appreciate this unprecedented burden we would be placing on our, on our staff. Ms. Haynes, I applaud you for um, making ABM on notice as the cleanliness situation in our classrooms in the past has been deplorable. Mr. Colon, I applaud you for not only listening to the public, but also monitoring concerns through social media. Finally, Mr. Per Persis, I appreciate your push and reminder that we all need to be flexible this year. Board members, please do what is, in, what is right and require a more flexible option for our teachers. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you, Mr. Ashby. Ms. Schultz, do we have another caller? We have no one else in the lobby. Okay. Colleagues, it is 7.51. Let's take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back and start our discussion. Thank you.
thank you, uh, listening audience and colleagues, for allowing us to take that quick break. Uh, we now will resume this part of the meeting where we will have our conversation as it relates to the presentation that we received. But I do want to, uh, before we go into that, uh, Dr. Bagelman, uh, is it possible that we can talk about uh, the de delayed start so that you will know, colleagues, uh, both, uh, I, I want to uh, publicly thank Ms., uh, Dr. Bagelman and Ms. Albert for meeting with me last week. And as we talked through some of the concerns that we heard from parents, uh, teachers, and, and just concerns we knew that were general. One of the things we talked about was a delayed start. And so we did ask, uh, and this is prior to any other district, just want you to know we were ahead of this before any other district start uh, talking about a delayed start. But I would like for them to present that information so that as we have our conversation, you are aware that uh, we, we did, we heard all of your concerns over the last seven or eight days. Um, we talked about it and with that, we did direct district staff to give some information background on uh, delayed start. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Bagelman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as you stated, yes, we did have a few conversations so far, a few meetings. And um, the first one, actually, Madam Chair, was with you and myself and Ms. Albert. And we talked about the possibility of what it would entail for us to look at a delayed start for the year. Um, after that meeting, we had approximately two to three other meetings after that where we start looking at some of the details of what it would entail. As of today, right now, I have where I can share with, with everyone that we have two options that we're possibly looking at. Um, if And, and I, so I want to share a little bit of the details of both options. And I also have Mr. West here who's participated in that meeting along with Ms. Rachel Hazel, who is part of the calendar committee. So at some point, if it's, a, you know, both of them are available as well. So option one, we're looking at the possibility of a start date of August 24th, 2020. If we were to um, enact on this start date, which is August 24th, 2020, a couple of things to note. Uh, August 11, 2020, there will be no change to the teacher start date. It will remain the same of August 11, 2020. No change. Pre-planning, we will be looking at nine days of pre-planning. Out of the nine days of pre-planning, nine of those half a days of pre-planning could be utilized, and we will strongly uh, encourage and focus in this area in terms of trainings for our teachers as it relates to safety protocols. Some of, We've talked about a few of those throughout our presentation. Technology training for our teachers, um, how to facilitate synchronous and asynchronous instruction in an online format, mental health training, distance learning training, curriculum training, and other trainings to support the safe opening of our schools. The pay date for our teachers will be the same. Um, the teacher first pay date would remain August 31st, 2020. As we look at the student calendar, we're, what we're seeing here is that students will be able to attend 175 days of the school year. Um, the minutes could be observed without impact in the last day of school, early release, or teacher duty days. The semester could still end at winter break, and the semester split would be 75 days for the first semester and 100 days for the second semester. Now, as we look at some comparison of surrounding counties, I would like to share that uh, Seminole, their, their original start date was supposed to be August 10th, but they are looking at a, at a um, delayed start of August the 17th. Orange County, their original start date is August 10th, but to this point, I believe they're undecided. Osceola County, um, their original start date was August 10th, and they're looking at a new start date of August 24th. Flagler, um, they had an original start date of August 10th, so uh, to, to date, they're undecided. St. John's, uh, they had an original start date of August 10th, and their proposed um, new start date will be August 24th. And Polk County, um, their original start date August 10th and their proposed new start date August 24th. Um, 
if this is a direction in which we would like to head into, obviously we will have to direct a calendar committee to convene to provide input regarding this option and for us to vote at a later, um, uh, perhaps the July 28th um, board meeting. Want to also share, uh, Madam Chair and board members, that FADS, um, they strongly recommend August 24th to be considered by districts as a delayed start date. Um, option two, we're looking at a proposed start date of August 31st, 2020. Um, the teacher start date will remain August 11th with no change. Uh, pre-planning now, we're looking at 14 days of pre-planning. 14 half a days, uh, 14 half a days of those pre-planning days could be again dedicated to um, safety protocols, technology training, mental health training, distance learning, curriculum training, and other training to support the safe opening of our schools. The teacher pay date for their first uh, check would be August 31st, 2020. Um, for, in terms of the student calendar, we will, we will be looking at where students will be attending 170 days of, of the school year. Five days could be observed without impact in the last day of school, early release, or teacher duty days. We will be looking at makeup options for five days, which could be the uh, September PD day, three teacher duty days, and at least five early release days, or teachers uh, September PD day, three teacher duty days, and one post planning day or all release days, which will amount to, I believe, 34 hours. The semester would need to be adjusted to end after spring break. And if we're looking at the semester split, we're lo we are looking at 10 days after the return of winter break, which amounts to eight, 80 days for the first semester and 90 days for the second semester. Um, again, if this was the direction in which we would like to head into, we would have to have again our calendar committee reconvene and uh, provide their input into the, this op for this option and be voted upon at a later um, school board uh, convening. I know that Mr. West and Ms. Hazel were part of those meetings. Uh, Mr. West and Ms. Hazel, is there anything else that you would like to add that was not mentioned? Um, no, ma'am, you've actually hit on the key points there. Um, just to clarify, what option two would do would push our first semester break um, after the winter holiday. And I know that that has been a kind of a, a point of concern um, in, from what I understand as being part of that committee um, in the past um, because we would have to actually make up those days and, and reshift uh, the actual semester because part of the days would be made up in the first semester and the second semester but we'd have to change those semester dates in order to do so uh, and the benefit of option one is that we would not actually have to shift that schedule significantly um, and, and change those but either way we're going to have to take it back to the calendar committee to reconvene so thank you thank you mr west Uh, thank you, Dr. Badwin and Mr. West, for that information. And um, I'm going to open up, colleagues, the floor. And if we want to take a section out of time, and, and I'll correct me, uh, but I, I believe other than maybe health issues and cleanliness, option one and option three are what we traditionally offer now. It is option two that we need to have some discussion about. Um, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on um, some feedback on your thoughts as it relates to a delayed start date, colleagues. So who would like to go first? I can go first. Go, go ahead, Mr. Colon. And so I am in favor of a delayed start, I think, as I made the point earlier. Um, <clears throat> It would provide us an opportunity to see a downward trend in the numbers and the positivity rate. And so, um, you know, 
in this case, I would uh, defer to, you know, I know it's our decision, but I'd, I'd be curious to see what our uh, teacher representatives would, would have to say and what their thought process is. Um, so I, I'd be, you know, and we wouldn't be voting on this today, so I'd have an opportunity to do that. But um, I am definitely in favor of a delayed start of school uh, for the school year. And again, <clears throat> most districts were set to start on the 10th and uh, we were set to, set to start on the 17th. So this would take it even further on. So um, again, I support that. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Kalala? Not on. Sorry. Any questions as relates to the presentation? No good? questions. Okay. I'm good. Uh, Ms. Haynes? Thank you, Mrs. Wright. So I'm in favor of a delayed start date because I would like to give the teachers and staff time to be prepared for um, the different options that the district has presented to us tonight. I believe, you know, everyone needs some technology training, feeling um, comfortable with using the technology in all ways. I mean, even in the past years, people could have used additional time to become familiar with technology and learn more ways to utilize it with their students. I also want to make sure that everybody um, has a chance to understand safety protocols, and I really do think we need to delve into the social emotional learning piece, um, not only just for our students, but also for our staff. I think when you have an opportunity to just learn and understand what everyone has been living with, because when you ask people to go into their homes and not exit their homes, it even if you think it's not impacting you in some way, it does impact. So I'd like for them to have that opportunity to have that training because so many times pre-planning week is just filled with meetings and teachers don't even have a chance to get things ready to start and they have to hit the ground running. So um, I can support either of the options for the delayed start date. I, I don't have a preference. I think it needs to be what's going to work best um, for our teachers and staff, but I do appreciate that we're going to give everybody a chance to have time to learn and figure out what to do as we move forward. I do have a few questions. Um, some of them are actually not about option two. They're more about some of the um, procedures that um, were highlighted upon about keeping, you know, everybody safe. So let me just go back to my notes. I apologize for a moment because I made some notes as we were doing this. But one of the questions I have is when we're looking at um, students riding in on buses or coming in on you know, cars with parents dropping them off and everything, and we talked about the temperature check piece, I'd like to know who's going to be responsible for that temperature check. You know, is it going to be the responsibility of the bus driver prior to them getting on the bus, the bus driver or an assistant when they're getting off the bus, or, you know, is it the classroom teacher's responsibility? Is it the administrator's responsibility? That just really wasn't clear when we were looking at um, talking about that piece. We said, you know, it's going to happen. Or I've also read some things where it's talked about doing um, a cohort group, you know, like Glant High, not testing all 3,000 plus students each day, but testing cohort groups. So. I, I don't know who is prepared to answer that this evening. I don't know, you know, Dr. Balgobin, if it's you or if it's Mr. Aiken, but I need a little further information on that piece. Thank you, Ms. Haynes, for that question. Actually, um, Mr. Greg Aiken sat on that committee and directed that committee, so I will ask him to share with you the proposal that was uh, provided. And um, Carrie Servanek, you will share with Ms. Haynes regarding the testing um, protocols that were discussed in your group. Okay, so so this is Greg. Uh, great question, thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Haynes, for for that question. Uh, we're right now we're exploring some uh, multi temperature check uh, iPads that when students walk through, uh, um, it automatically uh, checks their temperatures. 
Um, we're hoping to uh, have a, another demo this week and hopefully select something and um, be able to purchase something for our uh, three locations on our campuses. Um, as far as uh, the handhelds, we have those as well. Uh, any student that comes through that their temperature is above 104 point, I mean 100.4 or greater, uh, we put them in the holding area, an isolated area or room. Um, we allow them to cool down because a lot of kids like to play at that point in time, then we retake their temperature at that point in time. As far as staff, uh, what staff are gonna be responsible for that? Um, we didn't get to those details yet. It'd be those that are assigned uh, based uh, based on their, their current duties that they have uh, during a parent pickup or drop off and bus duty. Okay, so, it, so basically then, we won't be checking students as they get on the buses. So we'll be checking them once they arrive on campus and they're exiting the buses? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the buses, we can't hold the buses up uh, very long on the roadway. So we need to load and go. Um, and then we would actually take the, take the temperatures um, at the school themselves. Even if we checked them uh, prior to students getting on the bus, we can't turn any students away. We're required to bring them into school. Okay. So one of the things, um, and I know that I've even mentioned this, is, and I've, and I've watched some of the other presentations from other um, surrounding districts, and where they have stated, you know, parents, you have got to be responsible for checking your child's health and well-being before you send them to school. With that being said, we know that most of the time that doesn't happen, but, um, I'm in favor, if it's at all possible, of some type of a document where we spell this out for parents, you know, that this is the expectation that, you know, these are the things you're going to look for before you send your child to school. And if they do send their child to school and their child is not well, um, I would like some type of doctor documentation before the children are allowed back on campus so that we can help put teachers at ease because, you know, as somebody said, everybody stops now and looks if somebody coughs or sneezes or whatever. But the truth of the matter is there's so many other things out there that kids just pick up during the year. They pick up colds, they get strep throat, you know, they pick up flu or, you know, whatever, or, you know, they eat something that doesn't agree with them and all that. But I just would like to ensure that if, the parent has not done their part and they do send them in and they are ill, that when they pick them up in order to send them back, we have to have some kind of clearance. Now, with that being said, I'd like to say the same thing about teachers and staff because we have teachers and staff that come on campus ill and I think they also need to be responsible for self-checking themselves before they leave the house, you know, if for option number one, before they come on campus because we need them to also arrive healthy. Um, it, if we're all gonna work together and as a team, then I think this needs to happen. And so I wanted to um, touch on that. And then I had another meeting this week um, with Mr. Aiken and some of the employees that are um, part of Volusia County Schools team on inspecting the cleanliness or lack of cleanliness at our schools. Today marked the 81st day. Well, let me state this, the 81st work day. My, you know, all holidays and weekends have been removed, but today marked the 81st work day that ABM has had since students exited on March 12th and teachers and staff exited on March 13th for spring break to clean, disinfect and sanitize and prepare our schools for them to be ready for students to return whenever that is. I am still very disappointed in the fact that there's been 81 work days and that, and that, you know, includes the four 10-hour days and that our schools are not where they need to be. 
Now, I have asked a lot of questions and I think our public deserves to know this. We have a contract with ABM and they are supposed to provide specific cleaning and that cleaning is not happening on our campuses. So I did ask Mr. Aiken to look into it and it's my understanding that, and, and you know, you can, you can give whatever explanation you like, but staff has not been working at full schedules for cleaning. Hours have been reduced sometimes to 20 hours to 28 hours. It's my understanding some custodians were given unemployment paperwork, you know, like a packet to fill out for unemployment. I don't understand why we would be laying anyone off from cleaning. What I haven't seen is I have not seen a reduction in any funds that we have had to pay or release to ABM. We have had to continue to pay them at what the contract states, but yet we're not receiving the services. With that being said, I have asked for data about the inspections that are done on campuses. And unfortunately this week, one of my elementary schools actually wrote an email over to ABM to the, like, the site manager who oversees this particular school expressing the concerns of what still had not been accomplished on that campus even down to the trash not being empty. So they leave on a Thursday, it's, they've come back on Monday, it's still Tuesday, the trash is not emptied. Okay, that's just absolutely not acceptable. So I just watched the exchange of the emails until such point that the ABM manager fired back and blamed the principal the assistant principal and the secretary basically and the teacher saying well it's your fault you know that your school's not finished and it's not ready and you know this was 79 work days in and they try to say well because teachers have come on campus and things such as that that's not acceptable at that point I did step in Dr. Balgobin and I need you to know that and I wrote an email and just said this is not acceptable your response is not acceptable you know, pointing the finger at our staff that are on campuses working when that, you know, trash is not emptied, it's not emptied. I mean, you, you don't have a right to get away with that. But I just don't understand how they can reduce the hours of the custodians. And so when I talk to Mr. Aiken, and Mr. Aiken, if I speak out of turn, please correct me, you know, but statements were made about, well, you know, some of them had childcare issues. Well, when you take a job, um, you know, especially custodians, they know they're gonna work during the summer on a daytime schedule, you know, and so he tried to say, well, they weren't showing up for work or their hours were reduced because they had children at home. That's not what I'm hearing from some of the custodians. I'm hearing that they reduced their work hours or they're not giving them the supplies and things that we need. And so I know at this time, our hands are tied and I can't correct or have, I can't even offer a solution to get us out of the mess that we're in. I, I wasn't on the board at the time, but I knew it was wrong to outsource, you know, and we're on the second company, even though that, you know, this company has gone through two names, but it's just, it's not acceptable. And so when I look at this entire presentation today and I thank everyone that worked on it and all of the time that went into it and all the committees and everything, but we're hinging on classrooms being clean and not just the daily cleaning that would need to take place once students and teachers and staff return, but we're talking about them walking in on day one to a very clean environment. And that's not what we have. Now, I was told that there are 15 schools based on our in own in-house inspectors that are deficient at this time. What surprised me was the bulk of those were on the east side of the county and I've visited all these schools. The west side only had one school deficient and then two schools that had 
grounds that were deficient. I've been to my schools, they're deficient. So I don't know what happened and how the inspections, and the school I'm talking about, Manatee Cove, wasn't even on the list of being deficient, and yet the floors aren't finished. The pressure washing hasn't been done. You know, I said on June 23rd, I've been watching those reports coming in from ABM, and when the percentage of completion has not changed since April, you have to wonder what's going on. And so, in order to make everybody feel safe, we've got to have a clean environment. And I really, I need other board members, I need the district, I need us to figure out how to make this happen. Because even Brewster's not clean. Okay, we've, we've, had, we've had staff, 12 month staff back here since June 1st. And we're asking them to work in buildings that are not clean. And they haven't been inspected even, you know, to hold them accountable. So I, I, wanna, I wanna help you, but I don't know how at this point. And I thank you for expressing those concerns, Ms. Haynes, as you know, we know this is not the first time this has been an ongoing trend. I want to share with you a little bit, as, as concerned as you are, we are. Um, a couple of things I want you to know that we've done so far. I, I did have a very good discussion with Mr. Doran regarding the contract. I also spoke to Kevin Pendley regarding the contract. I had a meeting yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, with Ms. Cutberg, the two inspector from the east and west side. And we pretty much talked about the processes that, that's been in place. We had a very heart to heart, very good discussion. And I am, because when I talked about the implementation of a plan and really planning in a detailed format, every, this is like a puzzle. And every piece needs to be in place in order for this to be effective. So one of the things that I've shared in that meeting is that I would like for us to have another meeting, but with ABM. And in the meanwhile, Mr. Pendley is also looking at that contract one more time. Mr. Doran did share with me some ideas for moving forward that maybe we, we could consider in implementing to assist in ensuring that uh, after inspections are done, what the work that should be taking place is taking place in a timely manner. So we had a, approximately an hour and a 15 minutes discussion yesterday regarding this. And I know that I've asked Mr. Um, Aiken to set up another meeting, which I think it's already set up with ABM. And I'll be presenting to them our reopening plan and having a very candid discussion in terms of what our expectations would be um, as we move forward and hear from them some concrete ideas of two systems or processes that would look differently from before as we move forward to ensure, to ensure that we have systems in place for the outcome that we're seeking to achieve. So we do have another meeting that's being set up. I think Greg, you already set it up. Um, and uh, I'll tell you, Ms. Cutberg was, was in that meeting with me yesterday with, um, with Mr. Aiken and Mr. Pendley and the two inspectors, but the next will be directly with ABM. Yes, ma'am, it's July 22nd at 10 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bagelman. And with that also being said, um, in looking at some of the facilities and maintenance pieces, which I realize that they don't fall on ABM because I did ask those questions also, because what I've been hearing from people is everybody is, you know, stating, you know, talking about the age of our HVAC systems and things like that. I actually know that we have actually put a lot of money into upgrading um, HVAC systems. And so I think it would be important if um, Mr. Aiken and or Mr. Young could provide an update on that so that um, teachers, parents, staff, and community realizes that some of the information being shared on that is actually not accurate. I also, um, I did ask Mr. Aiken this about, well, whose responsibility is it about the filters? How often are they changed? I, I think with the situation we're in, you know, ABM's actually leaving like a checklist in classrooms, even though it's, it's checked off, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's finished. But although we've got some schools that I will tell you 
they're doing a phenomenal job, okay? But, you know, I think they work really well with administrators. Then we have other spots where, you know, as I said, they're not. But I think what we need to do is we need to share the information very clearly with people on, you know, how the um, AC systems are maintained, you know, how often filters are changed, you know, because I, I, there's a lot of misconception out there. And even in the time that, um, you know, I've been on the board, we have voted and approved under consent items for numerous, you know, replacements, new duct work and everything for the HVAC systems. Even most recently, we approved some more because I called and asked about the different types that we were updating to and installing. So the one thing I, when people are gonna share information, I just want the information to be accurate because when it, incorrect information is shared, it just becomes its own beast, I'll be honest with you, on social media. and. People believe everything that they read, and sometimes, you know, we're just, we're not accurate. And I don't want to find fault with individuals when what we're sharing is not accurate. Um, but with that being said, you know, I think at this time, our maintenance and facilities individuals should be out there and checking out all of these systems, verifying that the filters have been changed, but I think there needs to be a schedule. And even if that is left and posted somewhere with like um, the principal secretary and everything, so that if anybody ever wanted to check on that, they could see, you know, what the, the schedule's being followed and that our systems are being maintained or they're new and that the filters are being replaced. Because we've got to show everyone in good faith that we are, you know, we've employed people and they are doing what is required so that our campuses, as far as those aspects, are safe. And I think we've got to make a true commitment. And I thank Mr. Aiken for the things that he's already like ordered and the packets he's already putting together. But this is not a one-time shot. We've got to make the commitment to continue to have um, those materials and supplies on campuses and available at all times. I don't want to get any more emails or phone calls that there's no soap, toilet paper, you know, um, paper towels and hand sanitizer in these classrooms because that just should have never happened before. And for the community members that are listening, parents, I need you to have a frank conversation with your children that are in middle and high school about not tearing dis dispensers off of walls in bathrooms um, because that's been an issue at our middle and high. And, you know, that is a cost factor. So. We all need to work together on this so that we can provide safe environments at such time that we do return so that our kids don't have to think about that and parents don't. But those were just some of my parts um, on that. And at this time, I don't have any um, questions about option two. I kind of need to study um, what was presented tonight and take a look at my notes. But I just want to make sure that we've got you know, clean buildings and everybody's returning to an area that is ready for them to come into. We shouldn't ask anybody to come into an area that's not clean because it needs to be clean when we start so we can keep it clean, but thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. I'm coming back to you, Mr. Colon. So first of all, I want to apologize to my colleagues. I thought we were just talking about the delay of start of school. <clears throat> and so I won't belabor anything that Ms. Haynes said. I totally, absolutely agree. I've agreed since day one, and uh, I think we have a lot to do there. Since uh, Ms. Haynes took advantage and shared some of her concerns, even with our brick and mortar, I'm going to very quickly uh, take a different spin on it. And it was a, a conversation I had today with some of our teams regarding uh, the school clinics and our preparations, our PPE, and all of these things, which I've had the pleasure in my healthcare role to be a part of. And so I have a lot of concerns uh, about that, uh, which I'm sure we will uh, be able to uh, iron out in cooperation with the many 
uh, healthcare entities that we have partnerships with to help us do what is right for students. As far as option two, you know, as as folks are hearing this for the first time and seeing the details for the first time, um, we have to present a plan to the state. And I will start off by saying that there is no place that will be safer than your home, parents, for your kids. That's we're, in no way are we trying to exceed the expectation of, of uh, where your child um, should go. That is a decision for every parent to make. And so what we're doing is we're trying to provide options to parents uh, for their children to be educated. That's what we have been tasked by the state to do. We were tasked to uh, come up with innovative uh, plans and uh, submit them to the state for approval. Uh, now, that doesn't change anything that I've already said. However, th I will say there is still a lot of work that has to be done. These details have to be ironed out. I know a lot of the teachers are having heartburn, they're having ache, they're having headaches, migraines over all of this. And I, I want you to know that, you know, one of the reasons why I am in favor of extending the start date of students is so that we can have the time to figure these thing out, things out, to have several classrooms on the network at the same time and see that the infrastructure can support it. These are all things that we only can do with folks in the building. And so, you know, a lot of work has gone in. I, I you know, folks have no idea that for the past months, uh, they've been work the district has been working on these plans to try to make them you know, as best as possible. No, not every detail is worked out. Yes, there's a lot of work to be done with our teachers, technology, uh, but we in turn do have to submit a plan to the state and get their approval. Uh, with that being said, um, I think a lot of our parents in these special programs, for example, Cambridge and, and, and academies and all that, again, all of the details are not worked out. I know everybody's anxious to find out every detail. A lot of work to be done still. Um, I am supportive of submitting the plan to the state um, as it relates to this innovative plan. And again, that is acknowledging and one more thing I want to put out there, and, and um, I expressed this to the district when this plan was presented to me, is that I also realized that this is going to put additional burden and task on teachers. I, I personally believe that. Um, I have not been um, convinced otherwise. So, you know, however, I think that we are all having to do a little bit more and that sounds really you know uh, I want to acknowledge that it, it's it's going to take a little more and so if if this is what it's going to take to be able to provide an opportunity for several parents to decide to not send their child to school because they do have the ability to stay home then that will give space for other students to be able to socially distance and be safe in the classroom again this is going to take an effort from everybody. There is no right answer. There is no answer that's going to make everybody happy. There is no solution that is going to meet every need. But we are working tirelessly, and I want to, again, encourage everyone, if you come up with an idea this work is not done, please email us. Please email Dr. Balgobin. Uh, please email, uh, <clears throat> you know, the the divisional leaders for high school, elementary. You know, we, we still require that feedback, but we are all here working together and uh, that's all I have to say. So I am supportive of submitting option two to the state and uh, for consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colon. Uh, Mr. Persis. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. It's been a very, very informative uh, school board meeting. I really want to thank our district staff, everybody who was involved uh, putting together uh, all of those options, uh, really did an amazing job. All the people that served on the reopening committees, uh, kudos to you. Uh, tremendous amount of detail in, in each of these uh, plans, and I know everyone is trying to do their best. Uh, as, as Mr. Colon and Ms. Haynes said, we've all said about giving as many options as uh, 
as we possibly can. Um, Madam Chair, I did have a question concerning uh, ESE, uh, VPK ESE versus general VPK. Um, I had some questions about that and uh, I didn't know whether there was somebody still listening that could provide an answer from district staff. I I'm sure there he is, Mr. Persis, because I was like, why is he asking me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Dr. Bagovin, she's here. She can um, have either she can answer or she can have somebody jump on with us. Go right thank ahead, you, Mr. Madam Persis. Chair. Thank you. So I do have. A, thank you, Mr. Persis. I have our our expert here, our executive director for ESC, who's been working on this plan for option two and the assurances that will have to be provided to DOE. So I think she will be able to provide you with specificity as it relates to those two um, uh, points that you've mentioned as it relates to this plan. Uh, Ms. Wiles? Yes, good evening. Hi, Mr. Persis. Hello, Ms. Question? Hello, Ms. Wiles. <laughs> Could you repeat your question for me, please? Yes, uh, I had a question uh, uh, from a couple of people about uh, VPK, just general VPK, how that's going to look, and uh, yeah, are, are there any options for general VPK, and then are there any um, instructional options for ESE VPK? ESE pre-K will, yes. yes, ESE pre-K will be serviced through Volusia Live just as kindergarten, first and second grade will. We will have a teacher dedicated for ESE pre-K for Volusia Live. And the other option would be the brick and mortar the brick option? And mortar. Brick and mortar, yes sir. Okay. That's for ESE pre-K. Got it. It's different than VPK. I, I, I don't have the answers for VPK because that's not an ESE classroom, but for sure. ESE pre-K. So ESE pre-K, pre though, you take three and four-year-olds, correct? I believe so, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. And VPK, of course, would just be four-year-olds. Right. Right. And uh, so I think the difference was, I know it went by kind of fast, but I think it was that VPK does not have the live, Volusia live option. It's just the brick and mortar option. But I, yes, sir, I believe that's correct, but I think Ms. Servanak is still on. Uh, Ms. Servanak, if you can help us with the VPK. Um, Ms. Mr. Persis, if you don't mind, I can actually give you some information on VPK. Is that okay? Hey, I am open for information. You know that, Ms. Haynes. Okay. So, Mrs. Wiles was talking about the pre-K ESE, which right. does fall under ESE. And if you look in option number two on the one page, it says that we will serve the pre-K um, group under option number two. But there is that asked or asterisk there that says the option is not available for VPK. So VPK is the voluntary pre-kindergarten where the state issues a voucher for yep. any child that is four and will be going to kindergarten the following school year. Yeah. The, the problem is that is also managed by the Early Learning Coalition, Volusia. which we have the Volusia and Flagler Early Learning Coalition. and. There are certain specifics and requirements that are in place for that. That is the program where Ms. when Mr. Aiken was talking about those children being on campus, how those are the parents that will actually enter campus to sign them in and sign them out each day. So yeah. even yeah. for this summer, the state did not waive the right to do VPK virtually. So that's why we have VPK programs on our campuses this summer. So the state has not made any adjustments or agreements to allow VPK to be serviced in any other model other than face-to-face -face instruction. And so that's why it, option two and option three do not work for voluntary pre-kindergarten. Yeah, I understand that and I understand, uh, uh, thank you though. I, I, I understand uh, that there's a, there are many private Pro providers out there um, um, uh, putting out the VPK uh, service. Um, uh, it, it just seems to me it'd be very difficult 
uh, to do ESE pre-K with Volusia Live if you had an equal number of students at home and in the classroom. That would that'd be quite the challenge. Now, so who, yes, sir. Um, how that would turn out, but. For ESE pre-K, kindergarten, first and second grade, the teacher will not have students in front of them. They will oh, good. Okay. only okay. be That's teachers. right, that's right. That's, that started at third grade, didn't it? That's right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, answering me with, with that. I, I feel much more knowledgeable now. I, uh, I want to say that... Uh, uh, in regard to the elementary uh, options uh, there, it, it seems like uh, while the, the plan I think is excellent and the details are well thought out, a lot of the responsibility uh, seems to fall on the students as well as the teachers, like in terms of uh, cleaning things and, and, and so on. And, uh, I, I, I just don't have a lot of faith in, in that happening uh, consistently um, every day. You know, it's, it's hard just to be a teacher, just a teacher and with a regular class of kids. But when you just add on a, a additional things that you're going to be responsible for, and to expect those uh, young students, particularly I'm talking about these young young students now, uh, to do these things. Uh, I, I think it's I think we're kidding ourselves if we think uh, that that's going to happen. Uh, I am concerned uh, about starting. Uh, first, let me say that I am in favor of uh, pushing back the start date to um, August 24th. I, I think that's great. Uh, however, I'm not convinced that uh, that it would be safe um, on August the 24th to have a brick and uh, brick and, and mortar option. Uh, uh, you know, I, I if 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 we were expecting to start schools um, August 1st, I would say, you know, absolutely, you know, not. Uh, um, and now we're saying August 24th. Uh, well, you know, let's hope things are things are trending uh, much differently than they are trending now. Um, and I think what makes all of this so difficult is that if we knew with the three options that only oh 20, 25 percent of the parents were going to send their kids to to school. Uh, then I think we could perhaps have a better chance of uh, safely uh, keeping schools running and being able to protect our staff as as well as our as as well as our children. But the fact is, as a few people have mentioned, uh, we haven't had uh, children together in a long time, and we think about opening up these 70 facilities with 63,000 children and our 4,500 or so teachers and other staff, uh, all of them in enclosed buildings for seven hours every, every day. Uh, you know, people are going to get sick. I mean, people are going to get sick. And uh, we don't know, even as a as a country, uh, we don't know what's going to happen when when schools start in the fall and children are back in in a brick and mortar situation. Uh, it could just ex explode, and uh, and and that's what I'm fearful of. Um, uh, I know as a as a parent, if, if I had children right now, um, I wouldn't send them to school uh, on August 24th, based on what I know now. Now, could things change by August 21st? Yeah, probably. But uh, based on the what what I'm what I'm hearing, and uh, I would certainly take a sit back and 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 wait approach. 
and I think I wanted to make sure that parents understood that if they did choose for the uh, Volusia Live option, Dr. Balgobin, you may want to make sure I'm right here. If they choose the Volusia Live option, they could start the year being at home, but let's say by October, uh, parents feel a lot more confident and uh, they could then send their children to the school. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. It's a fluid model. Um, the platform is already there. So as we've stated before, you know, there's so many uncertainties. This plan yeah. is presented today, but we may look at next Monday and something might change drastically, right? And even more so as we look at perhaps the 24th. Yeah. So we will continue to monitor what's happening in, you know, in our environment and what's taking place and, and CDC guidelines. But what we're very proud of is that this platform will afford you with the flexibility if you had to go either or. So okay. let's say we had to, um, you know, it's, it's getting a whole lot better and more students wants to transition back into the brick and mortar setting. The, it's, it's there, they're already tied to that teacher from third grade up, right? So right. that would be an easy transition. And yeah. let's say we had to go back more into having more children get, get into the Volusia Live model. Well, then it's already there. They're tied to their teacher in a brick and mortar setting. It's just transitioning that model into the, the virtual model. Yeah. Not the virtual, but the Volusia Live, which would right. be live and, streaming. Right. And the uh, Volusia Online, the virt Volusia Virtual model, that is the one that if they sign up for that one, our expectation is they would need to stay in that model for at least one semester. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, sir. We're, we're really recommending that because it will truly benefit the student. Um, first of all, they will be able to obtain their credit, right? Completion right. of credit, and that's really important. And then the second piece, it's, it's that inter it, it will not, uh, the, the student will not e experience interruption to their schooling or interrupting schooling, so to speak, because we're, we're talking from one platform to another, there is some adjustments that will need to take place. So it will be a much cleaner transition if they were to complete that semester, receive their credit, and then if they were to opt into choosing a different model. I see, okay. So you well, stated it very well. Well, um, I, I just uh, really, again, I want to commend the, uh, the staff. Uh, um, I like that you, all, that you all met with Ms. Albert too and uh, worked out uh, the uh, pros and cons of uh, August the 24th and August the 31st, I think it was, as far as a, a pushback starting date. Um, I think all, all of that is, is just excellent. Uh, I just, uh, you know, if if I if I were king, you know, I I, I, I would say uh, we aren't going to start school until we have a a vaccine. You know, I mean, I mean that's what I would want. And 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 I understand there's there are um, economic pressures out there, and uh, and I and I know. And, and I know also how important it is for kids to be in school. I mean, I know kids need to see other, other kids. Uh, there is uh, an, an, an intangible benefit about being social and, and interacting with other human beings. Uh, we learn and, and we grow uh, just from that. And, and, and uh, keeping kids away from that for a long, 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 long time is uh, stressful for them too. However, if, if, if with everything, you know, whenever we're faced with tough decisions, we, we always err on, on the side of well, what's in the best health and safety interest of, of everyone. And, and so, you know, if I had to, if I had to make a difficult choice, that's where I would be. Uh, but again, I will, I will close. I think this presentation has been excellent. And my only last question that I had, I guess, was for the chair. Uh, uh, and that would be, um, uh, Chair uh, Wright, uh, are you anticipating that this evening we're going to decide when our next meeting will be? Is that? Yes. 
what you want and am, yes. and, and am I thinking that's going to be in about a week is that about, what uh, <laughs> if, if I could have it Friday I would but okay. um, we are probably but looking what at are those are those are those lawyers telling you that we can't do, do that is that what's happening <laughs> no, uh, no 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 but uh, I, I, I want to check your schedules actually so uh, yeah. definitely Monday or Tuesday of next week but I want to see what your schedules look like yeah I just know that parents want to know you know as as soon as possible so yeah that's why I, I agree yeah. I agree thank you madam chair excellent meeting excellent thank meeting. you yeah Miss Cuthbert Hi, good evening. Um, I guess we all have to realize, I guess, the realities of what all this is going to be like. Um, again, the presentations were well thought out, a lot of background information, but I think we need um, to go into more realities. It's extremely important that we address what we're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what um, Ms. Boswell said from the Department of Health, she said that there are uh, three things that we have to have in place. For a child, um, the, it, there, there's a criteria. If somebody gets sick, there's a criteria in which to return. You have to have three days without a fever and 10 days without symptoms but we quarantine for 14. So there's some kind of discrepancy there. Are we gonna do 10 or 14? Um, and and who's going to verify that return? So that's, I'm not, it's a rhetorical question. That's something we have to find. Who's going to, who's going to make sure that that's the correct thing that's been done at home? And that is a signal to a lot of what we are basing so much of our our present our three options on and that's on compliance it's on cooperation from our students and our parents we know very well there are many oppositions out there um, one is that the virus doesn't exist at all another is that masks are absolutely ridiculous um, there's a um, that I don't have to you know wear one if I don't want to so what do we do and I, and I know the protocol is to come, get your temperature taken, uh, to come into the, a brick and mortar with a mask on maybe. But what happens if a student gets on a bus or even comes to school and refuses to put on a mask or refuses to have a temperature taken? We let kids come in with, without a collared shirt on. How can we enforce all of this when we were not very successful with enforcing our own dress code. Uh, so these are all rhetorical questions that I just want to make sure we bring up. And we are educators. We're not medical personnel. Because last year, this time last year, the issue was guns. Our state government wanted our teachers to be armed to protect our students. This year, too, they want them to be armed, only a completely different manner. Time and time again, our educators, our administration staff, our parents even have to make very difficult choices when we send our children to school. We spend a whole year dedicating money, time, and effort by our maintenance people and our operations to build fences and to build plexiglass fronts in all of our schools. Well, the plexiglass fronts are, are nice now because it'll help prevent spread of the COVID. However, we need to make sure that whatever we do is for the best interest of every person, whether it's a visitor, an educator, a student, a parent, a volunteer who enters our schools. So, Who's going to be in charge of testing? I personally would love to see all of our employees be tested before they step foot in a classroom. I would like to have I would like to have some kind of assurance that we have substitutes who are willing to come into the classroom if a teacher has to leave and be quarantined. I would like teachers to know, for example, especially brand new teachers who don't have insurance yet because their insurance doesn't start until October 1st, 
what do they do when they are forced to quarantine for 14 days? They're out of the classroom for 10 days. That is a whole year of sick leave gone. What do they do? There has to be answers to all of this. And who's in charge of all of this monitoring that we have to do? Who's going to be monitoring our bathrooms? Because last time I checked, the bathrooms as well as the toilets are not social distanced in the restrooms. And and as much as we know how kids like to put toilet paper in those, um, those toilets, who's going to be monitoring that not only is are they clean, but are they well cared for and not damaged? And if we have efficient soap, is the soap going to stay in the canisters? And, and I'm just trying to be very realistic on what we have to make sure we have in place. So we can't really depend on compliance unless we have complete one voice in this county. That's from our county council, from all of our city commissions. We have 16 communities that we're responsible for and they are responsible to us because we touch every single family in this county. We're the largest employer. We are the major uh, economic drive, I would think, in this county. So many others are saying, it's not my problem. It's all on your shoulder, school district. You have to make the decision. We would never want to overstep your power. So, so somebody has to come up and say, okay, then we will do it, but you have to do it with us. We have to depend on parents to make sure their children are healthy and fed when they come to school. We give them breakfast, we feed them, we fed them last spring. Bless their hearts, we gave them technology. And about two out of what every three computers came back, but there's still that almost 30%, 25% of students who need to return their computers. That's a lot of money still out there. The Department of Health has to be a complete partner with us. I hear um, at the state level and here tonight, they tell us what we need to do, but nobody says, well, how do you put it into place? How do you implement? That decision is now based upon our school district. And even all of us are kind of scratching our heads. What is the best way to do it? Because we know we are now fighting an invisible invader that could actually harm or kill us. And that is scary as one who is compromised. If a room has in the Volusia, on, uh, the Volusia Live, in theory, it's a fabulous idea. But to have one teacher in with those children is not enough. If you're going to think about it, there should be two. One to do the teaching and one to do the monitoring with the children one person to stay out of the camera and one in front of the camera because the teacher one teacher in the front cannot manage going back and forth to students and to make sure that that camera on the on the laptop is always in view it's it's impossible to manage that i would i mean i i remember and it wasn't that long ago i was in the classroom it's crazy to always think where where you are in the classroom so your, your, your mind is no longer on the curriculum and teaching. It's all on placement. And am I doing this right? Who's watching? Um, is this person in the back? You have to, we're depending on our children to behave themselves. And children tend not to behave themselves. We know that very well. Bless, you know, bless them. But it's very important that we take that under consideration. Um, we have to make sure that we understand what the students do very simply. I was listening to Mr. West, very complicated do's and don'ts in the stages. We need to, when we put posters out, I'm sure he's already come up with the idea to make it nice and simple. Do three basic steps, don't three basic steps. I do wanna say a special thank you for those who uh, investigated and cajoled the IB the AP and the Cambridge communities as well as dual enrollment. Um, that was not easy for those companies 
and uh, DSC especially to let go of their programs to be put online. So I'm extremely grateful and I know a lot of other parents are too. I personally have no faith in ABM. I honest to goodness don't. I do not blame the workers more or less themselves. They are working without benefits. They're working in the heat without air conditioning. They're asked to do um, mundane topics and to clean every single day for very little pay and no benefits. Um, their hours were cut this summer to 28 hours. How can you keep a school in good condition? And I'd like to know what management has been doing all this time. I think what's happened is there are too many managers and not enough workers. And so, you know, they, they are our employee. So we have to make sure we keep on top of them. Um, I'm very concerned about our bus drivers, our schoolway cafe workers. Um, the lunch line will not be social distance. Even we can have, I mean, I go to the bank, um, I stand in line at the grocery store, um, I watched people at Marshall's. They are not standing in social distance lines. I can't even get enough people to wear their masks. I went into a, a store and I was the only one in a mask. And so with that kind of prevalence in our society, how are we going to get it into our classroom? Um, I kind of like Ms. Uh, Sakurka's idea about making an appointment. At one point, if we have to open schools, could it be done with students with a laptop instead, and they would sit in the classes and we would be able to monitor their work and they would do the work online or on virtual. Um, I'm trying to address some of the needs of parents who both have to work and they don't want to leave young children at home. Somehow, some way they can receive, because that was a big complaint of teachers, they had a hard time reaching and helping one-on-one uh, -on -one with students. But again, we have to do it social distancing. We have to do it with a mask on. So again, that's compliance. But I think we need to definitely do more one-on-one. -on -one. And with our ESC, especially our most needy um, students, with our paraprofessionals and our ESC personnel, I don't know what the answer is. I just, it's an impossible situation. Um, we need adequate testing in this county, and we need our county state personnel to help us get it because we have the largest number of employees. We have to have excellent contact tracing. We are not going to get anybody well, especially we have a breakout if we don't have accurate contact tracing. And the 14-day quarantine has to be observed. So we have to dedicate our own personnel to make sure that's all taken care of. If the basketball players can all get together in a bubble in Orlando and, and just play amongst each other, if NASCAR can, and can have a race and they just race each other in their cars, we can figure out a way. This county found a way to have graduation. Uh, it wasn't the most popular, but I'll tell you, it was the most gratifying. Now, of course, we are all wishing our graduates goodbye. We are wishing them well, but they are going straight to college, the workforce, uh, the Air Force, or maybe just taking a year off, but they're taking their lives out also into a social world, and I wish them well. I think we should delay, I'm 100% for that, but I think it should be all the way at the end of August. That's six and a half weeks. If we can have 14 days, two full weeks of declining tests, uh, positive cases, that would help us so much. But to send our children back in just several weeks is not a good idea. Now, I noticed uh, a lot of the, the uh, districts who wanted to start, they, their start date was originally the 10th of August, and ours is the 17th. So if we, they added two weeks to go to the 24th, I think it should be good for our faculty and our staff and our administration to also to have that two weeks. I do not mind 
the uh, semester going in into January. We've done it many, many times before. Um, and I welcome the, uh, the work from the union as well as the calendar committee to help us work all of this out. Um, making sure I've covered everything. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone is healthy and what do they do? Who do they report to? What about their sick leave, leave and their insurance? Because that, those are huge concerns. And I heard about um, the waiver that students were asked to sign. But if a campaign can ask for that, um, why is it wrong elsewhere? Um, I don't understand. It's not that we're wrong or we're right. It's just that I see the disparity in some being allowed to do that and others not. I, it's not fair for those. So I am, um, I'm very grateful for the presentation this afternoon, this evening. It was extremely well done, well thought out, very well presented. Um, I personally would like more logistics, down to earth logistics, and I most certainly do not wanna go back to a brick and mortar until we have 14 days of declining cases. And it has to be definitely not at a 7% positivity rate. It has to be much, much lower, much, much lower. So um, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mrs. Cuthbert. Um, I too have concerns about the rate. Um, one of the reasons why we talked about a delay, uh, I too would agree with the 31st. I think our plan, we have to have something in a start school before the 31st, because if I had it my way, we would go the 8th, September 8th after Labor Day. I know it would cause some um, our calendar committee a little uh, creative, but as we continue to navigate this, I don't want us to think that we can't, uh, you know, change our plan or petition the, the, the state to say in best interest for us. And so I'm, I'm sure the public is, is probably wondering why I, I'm really kind of pushing the delay. Like many of our counties, unfortunately, um, as you heard my vice chair state, we do not have one-to-one -one technology in our district. In addition to not having one-to-one, -one, um, our students nor our teachers have been taught or trained how to use uh, the technology in this environment. And so when we talk about, uh, or, or and, and I hear the teachers and I'm very empathetic about you know going virtually, I, I can't vote for that for me um, because we did not do a good job when we were forced to number one. Number two, we do not have the technology. And number three, it will affect the poorest children in our, in our district. They, will, they don't necessarily have the hot spot. I know our Pearson Taylor, right now we got to find a creative way to make sure if we did that, that they had access to the internet. Uh, we have a population that do not own devices. Uh, one of the questions I know that during some of the conversation, did we have enough devices for our high school students to potentially be 100% virtual. And if I'm not mistaken, we're not there yet. So the concern is for public education, it is our responsibility to be safe. And so delaying, if delaying a start, will make sure we're safe, I'm, I'm for that. But a virtual environment, you are really, we are really putting a, a true population of children at a great disadvantage. And I, I cannot, I, I just cannot say I would agree with that. Uh, as far as our second option, I think it is, it is good. I think we may see quite a few parents actually take um, advantage of that. Again, my concern with that is the training to make sure our teachers are trained and, and some kind of way we gotta create some type of virtual training step by step of showing parents how to log in, how to utilize the technology, how to follow uh, the instructor, um, so for someone who teaches online, I would say it's not teachers, it's not as tough as you think, uh, delivering the modality with live students and students watching online, it, it really is not. But again, I understand your apprehension because it's not something that you are accustomed to doing and that's why training is important. But trust me, it, it really 
it is it is not double duty it's not extra work it actually will flow naturally because it will engage your students that are in the virtual environment and your students that are in the classroom to really have some meaningful dialogue and and actually you can have a lot of fun with it but i do understand the apprehension and so uh dr bell goldman i know linda uh stated that maybe having two teachers i don't think you would need two teachers we may want to look at having paraprofessional or somebody else in the classroom to help navigate the process. But as teachers become comfortable with having the one-on-one -on -one technology and being comfortable in being a digital environment, they will see that that is not needed. But right now, we may have to consider that recommendation. The one thing I, I want to bring forth, um, my concern with the brick and mortar is, not, is that we are not six feet apart. And so if I think the average classroom for elementary is about 20 students, 18? 18 for elementary? Okay, 18 or 22. And so if we look at six feet apart, we're talking about maybe 13 students per classroom. And so my question is that, um, say we have a classroom that all of the students would like to return to brick and mortar. Is it that we, we can't find an alternate space where we could split that class? Because I really, if we, if we, and we do have to provide brick and mortar, we're not saying parents have to take that option, but we do have to provide it. Um, I think we, we gotta find some kind of way to make sure that we're able to social distance um, in a smart way. And last but not least, I, I do have to agree with my colleagues as it relates to the cleanliness. That would actually, that is more of my concern than anything else, that our schools are clean um, and they're clean properly, properly daily, and that we, during the day, will have more staff on hand than night, just in case um, we need to address some needs and to make sure uh, that we have all the supplies. We cannot run out of supplies. Um, I know. Mr. Akins, during his presentation, showed the plexiglass, and we're trying to work through and navigate through that to even potentially have plexiglass on our students' desk. So again, that too would help with the need of maybe having on a mask. If they have plexiglass at their desk, they may not necessarily have to wear a mask. We do have quite a bit to uh, drill down to, but overall, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased with the plan. Quite naturally, we all will have some questions some parents have some questions, um, but I trust that the district staff, our teachers, and our um, administrators, we will solve this problem one way or the other. But that, that is my only uh, two cents. Uh, if, if 31st for me, uh, I, I prefer the 31st. Again, I am very amenable to even starting after Labor Day, depending on the times, but I, I know I've heard the challenges. I've seen the information. Um, it would cause us a little angst, but if that is if that will make people feel comfortable, and we see there is a trend, and giving us more time to make sure we have all of our ducks in a row, I would support that. But I'll allow you all to look at all of that, all of those scenarios. And now, colleagues, we need to decide when we can reconvene to um, vote on this and take action. Um, today is the 15th, and can you look at your calendars and let me know what is the best day for you next week, um, next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because this will be an emergency meeting. And I don't think Friday will give our district uh, enough time to really sit down and go back through some of uh, what we've discussed and, and how we need to address it, and as well as meet with... Um, you know, the necessary uh, our, our support of uh, faculty and staff to get this done. So what is your pleasure, colleagues? Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, how about Monday, the tw Monday the 20th? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, Monday the 20th, Madam Chair? Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Doran, please interject, sorry. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, um, the single biggest concern is giving us enough time to 
properly advertise the meeting. So basically, we need to just go for next Wednesday the 22nd. That'll give us one week. Well, that certainly would do it. I think we could do it by next Tuesday if that's what you wanted, but certainly Wednesday would be sufficient time. But, you know, we, we can't even start the process, obviously, till tomorrow morning, and we okay. have to have days. So, Polly, the 22nd, are you, is, is everyone available next Wednesday, a week from today, so that we can properly advertise? Uh, Madam Chair, as long as it's not in the morning. Okay. Mr. Colon, will that work for you? Would Tuesday be better for you? Tuesday would definitely be better. Uh, would Tuesday be better for you? Yeah, I can do Tuesday. Okay, so uh, Mr. Doran, would Tuesday provide, oh, just a moment, go ahead. It would have to be at four o'clock or later for me if it's going to be Tuesday. Okay. So all we're really voting on is submitting the option two to the state, correct? Right, but we... we and comment. Uh, right. Public participation may take longer. Okay. I'm good with Tuesday. At the four? It can be four or later. Okay. Uh, Carl? Uh, Madam Chair, are we just going to have uh, two items on the agenda? What was the second item, Mr. Persis? Well, are we going to are we going to <laughs> are we going to have the the new start date as one? Oh, okay. Right. I was we just putting that all together with our rollout plan, but yes, we would have just those two items. You're correct, Mr. Persis. Okay. Yes, I'm. I'm. I'm good with whatever you all want. Just let me know, and I'll zoom in, or my team's in, or something. <laughs> Call in from my phone. I don't know. That's fine. Not a problem. Uh, so, Mr. Doran, with next Tuesday at at four thirty, work. It works fine for me, and that would be sufficient time to get everything noticed. So. Okay. So we will go ahead and plan for next Tuesday, July 21st at 4.30 p.m. So that'll give you a chance to do what you need to do. Uh, the three of us will reconvene here, and our other two colleagues will join us virtual. Sounds good. So you said 4.30? 4.30, yes. Okay. Okay. It's fine with me, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Thank um, you. Any, you're very welcome. Anything else for the good of the body? Good meeting. Thank you, Dr. Gogoba, and I turn it over to you for last comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, board members. Um, just a couple things quickly I want to interject and state. Um, Ms. Haynes, you had mentioned regarding the compact agreement regarding uh, teachers and students. That was That's one of the items that we've discussed and that would be part of the implementation plan. Just wanted you to know that. Um, Ms. Ms. Wright, Chairman Wright, you've mentioned the trainings for teachers. We have already been working on trainings for teachers and that is going to be part of our rollout plan as well. In terms of the social distancing, just to let you know that if we anticipate a, a percentage of enrollment that will be uh, increasing for Volusia Online and also our live streaming, which is our Volusia Live, that will reduce the total number in the traditional setting so therefore we should have more space and that's one of the considerations we'll have as we start discussing implementation with our principals for each division. Mm -hmm. And one more item, the ABM meeting that we have set up, that's not the first and only meeting. We will have bi-weekly reoccurring meetings as well for ongoing feedback. So I will ask the calendar committee, Ms. Hazel and um, Mr. West to go ahead and convene.
look at those dates and we will have our plan um, on Tuesday ready for you. And part of that plan will be the delayed start um, date for the year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Anything else, Go ahead, Mr. Dorn. <laughs> well, I, I hate to be flying the ointment, but I just want to make sure that, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of specific conversation about whether or not we would do mandatory masks. Um, maybe that was part of the rollout, but yes. I just... I just want to mention that we do have to do go through emergency rulemaking uh, actions to mm -hmm. amend. You know, we can do that on an emergency basis. Um, and so I'm just pointing out that that is something that we will have to go through. And I don't, I don't, Mr. Uh, Penley may have a, an, an opinion on this, but I don't think we can do that by next Tuesday. Um, or do you think we can? Is he still in the meeting? I am still here, uh, Mr. Doran, and uh, I will. My office will be prepared to go forward at the board's pleasure and at the superintendent's direction. Of course, uh, we have a an emergency rule that we have uh, drafted and can be put in place as uh, soon as the board gives us that direction. Okay, so is 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 that the direction, uh, Dr. Balgovin or, or and board members? Are we are we doing mandatory masks? Because if we are, there's we have to leap into action to get us into an emergency rulemaking mode, and then that buys us time to go through the rulemaking process to to formally permanently put that in place. Just a minute. Go ahead, Ms. Haynes. Okay, so I stated this on June 23rd, so I just want to restate it. Um, I do believe that it should be a choice, but I do realize that more than likely that is not what it's going to be. So I would like at least the option, if we're moving forward with this, that it be a choice between a mask or a shield because a shield will work for some individuals where a mask will not. And as I stated, when we're looking at our youngest children, our ESE children, there needs to be some other options because they need to see, you need to be able to see their face and they need to be able to see your face in a lot of those settings, speech and language, when they're learning how to read and things like that. So even though I still feel it should be a parental and staff choice, other than maybe areas where they're congregated together. I would at least like, if we're doing a policy, that they have a choice between a mask or a shield. Thank you. Uh, just correct me if I'm incorrect. I, I thought, according to the plan, they only needed to have on face covering in the general areas, on the bus, but when they have go into the classroom, especially if they're going to have plexiglass, they would not need that. So I think that's what the plan was like if they were congregating is where it would become mandatory. That is correct. Okay. That is correct according to the plan. Okay. And so yeah. just to clarify, because the question has come up repeatedly, um, if they're outdoors for PE activities and they're being expected to run or, you know, do relays or whatever, will they have to have them on? Because that's the number one question of a concern for parents is that we're going to put them out in the heat with masks on and make them wear them while they're running and things like that. And I know that wouldn't work for me if you put me out there. So I think if we're going to go this route, it needs to be just spelled out clearly so that people are sure of what it is that we're expecting. For each scenario. For scenarios, yes, please. And um, and I and I'd like the option of a choice between, you know, mask or shield. And I think we do need to take into account 
our multi-VE children and the fact that even though we'd like to say that they could wear one, unless you've been in one of those classrooms, I, I'm not going, I am not going to support doing harm to a child or putting them into a situation where they become very stressed and act out because we're trying to force them and they don't understand what we're doing. Just that's where I stand on that. Point noted, Ms. Cutford. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Colon. And so, and so I've, one of the things I've always said is, you know, we are a policy making body and this is probably the only policy that's actually going to come before us for a vote, uh, which is the dress code policy if we uh, opt to amend it um, to uh, the mask uh, considerations that have been brought forth. And so um, I today visited a school and played around with seats and tried to figure out how to get 24 seats in a middle school in a English class to work and it there were still other tables because there weren't enough desks in the room which is obvious that they use that uh, and so um, that I think there's a lot of challenges and so there will be scenarios and going back to what Ms. Haynes said there will be scenarios where we really need to spell it out um, you know what will that look like for a band class mm -hmm. where the kids are playing instruments and they barely fit in the room right now and so I think having some of that consideration and you know with that I'll also say you know just to, to level set expectation you know this is going to be a school by school program by program uh, scenario there is no one size fits all for every classroom every school is different some schools like my enterprise was built in 1917 and uh, and other schools were just built recently so um, with that being said um, I think we you know there's definitely going to be uh, individual consideration for each of those so I think we should open or be prepared to open that up for rulemaking Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Haynes. Mr. Flood, white buildings across the street are no longer on the street. Can't hear you. Okay. The white building across the street that's no longer on the campus is the 1917 building, so it's not being used as part of the school at Enterprise. Okay, and I do I do agree with Mr. Cologne that you know we kind of have to look at the different scenarios and everything, but to piggyback off of what he was talking about when he stopped in at a middle school and he tried to figure out how to fit students. Um, Dr. Balgobin, and I already know the answer to this question. It was something that I thought maybe I would talk about next time, but I think it needs to be said tonight. People, okay, there's some misconceptions out there. So the reason why we were able to continue in the spring and meet the salaries for every individual that was employed as we walked out the door in March was because we had already gone through the state October and February FTE. We'd already gone through the federal surveys, which you know collect the data on how many migrant children you have, ESOL children, title, you know, Title I based on free and reduced lunch. And so we had received the final funding to finish out the school year. Correct. And so we had that money and could pay everybody through June 30th. What I think needs to be clearly stated tonight is whenever you start a new fiscal year on July 1, you don't receive your, to your total pot of money. That's not what happens. You know, they don't give us 800 million from the state on July 1st and, and then $18.2 million grant from Title I and, you know, 2 million from Title II and, and 12 million for IDA. What they do on July 1st of every year is they give you basically a proportionate amount that accounts for 20 to 25% of what they believe you're going to be funded for that year and they base it on either the last survey or the February FTE. I, this is why I was waiting for tonight to see what we were going to do. And I have been monitoring what's been happening as parents are making choices. 
And I just, I, I think people don't understand mm -hmm. that as the surveys come up and we have to report how many migrant children are being educated in a Volusia County school setting, an approved one that the state has approved, or ESOL children, Title I children, and even just the kids within our classrooms, the state and the federal government is gonna adjust our funding based on the numbers. All of the finance training that I've attended over the years, even for federal grants, what you learn is if your numbers decrease, if you lose students, they, they move, they go to charter, they go to private, they go to homeschool, they go to FLVS, they go to K-12, the money leaves with them. Right. And our largest expense each year is salaries. The largest part of the money that we receive is spent to pay salaries. If we don't have those children on our roster as we reach those survey dates and the October FTE date, and they're not being serviced in a state approved plan where attendance is taken and it is documented that we are providing their educational learning and opportunities, we are going to lose funding. And the loss of funding is the loss of jobs. All right. So, I didn't come out and make a statement about this tonight other than, you know, I appreciate what all of you've done, but I support all three options because already I can tell you based on watching where parents have said they've chosen homeschooling or FLVS or K-12, we are already losing funding. So when Mr. Clone talked about not being able to fit 24 students into a middle school classroom, what everyone also needs to know, it's not a choice for us of like, we'd like to only give you 10 kids in a room. The state didn't is not going to give us funding to hire double or triple the teachers to spread everyone out. The state at this time, because I've not read anything that's come out differently, they're holding us to 18 students, pre K through third, and they're holding us to 22 for our fourth and fifth, and the 24 for six through 12. So if we're not servicing those students, we're losing money and we're losing staff. I don't want to lose staff. I don't want to be sitting here and have to talk about laying people off. But I, everybody needs to know that that is the reality that we are facing because the formulas haven't changed, the funding hasn't changed, and the rules that if the kids are not attached to us have not changed. And I thank you for all of the work you've done. But option number one is going to need to happen. I'm hoping by delaying, we will be at a safer point for it to happen. But I don't want anyone to get the idea that we can hire additional staff with less students, you know, to meet the needs. You're absolutely correct, Ms. Haynes. Everything that you've stated to date still, still, still stands. So that is the funding formula that as of right now that our uh, state is still adhering to. And just to Mr. Colon's point, just wanted to share with you, and again, this will be part as we start brainstorming implementation and what the plan would look like. But one of the ideas that we've discussed is that we would really look at the space in classrooms and any excess furniture or any excess item will be removed to kind of hopefully create that space that we would need. And if, if that doesn't work, we might look into another setting for that class since we may have a reduction in the total number that usually attends that, that traditional setting. But point well taken. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Persis or Ms. Cuthbert. Any final comments? No, I, we're, I just, we're gonna come back I, to you, Mr. Uh, Doran. Yeah, okay. uh, I just wanted to clarify, uh, Chairman uh, Wright, our, so are we gonna have like a separate issue uh, on the agenda next week about face masks? Is that gonna be like a separate item? Is that what you're saying? Or Ted saying? Is, is that what you're saying, Mr. Doran? I am because okay. if it, yes, because if if uh, as Ms. Haynes has said, she would like to see some variations, etc. That that's going to have to be discussed and approved by the board in a very specific way for us to prepare the emergency orders rules that you know uh, will go into place. I mean, we we've got to know it can't just be a broad. Well, we're going to have everybody wear masks, but then later say, uh, you know, well, some can wear masks, some can, you know, have something else. Um, and I also want to, and I, and I don't think this is anything that has to be decided tonight for sure, because it's pretty clear the beginning date of school is going to get pushed back. And I think we've got plenty of time to work on this and get it in place. Once you all decide in six days, if you will, in six days, take this up and reach some sort of resolution among yourselves on it. I think we got plenty of time to put it in place. But the last thought I want to also throw out there is that I think if you're going to mandate um, masks, you're also going to have to be in a position to provide masks for kids that, uh, you know, whose parents either can't afford them or just choose not to participate in providing them and those kind of things. And so I just want to give everybody a heads up that that's going to be a necessity. You can't, you know, bring the kids to school and say, write an essay, but we're not going to provide you a pencil. Okay. So what we'll do, uh, colleagues, we'll put that as a discussion item next week. And Mr. Doran, is it possible that you or the district attorney can maybe bring us some options so that we can review, please, sir? Ab absolutely. We'll work okay. together on it. Okay, perfect. And uh, Chairman Wright, sure. Go ahead. Uh, uh, if we could just also, just to clarify, I think it'd be uh, obviously in the teacher's best interest uh, to wear a face shield or a mask. I personally uh, believe a face shield would be better for the teacher. It'd be better for the teacher uh, and better for the student, so the student could actually see the see the teacher. Uh, see the teacher smile, see the teacher, you know, speaking, particularly as, as a, uh, teachers are teaching young, young children how to read, uh, how to make the sounds with their mouths and so forth. It, it, and, and besides that, you can hear the person's voice much, much more clearly when they're wearing a shield than when they're muffled up uh, with a cloth covering their, their um, mouth. The other thing about the shields is that is uh, people don't re realize is uh, you can you can clean them. You just clean them with soap and water or any kind of sanitizing thing that you want, and 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 uh, you know put it back on. Uh, the cloth mask, you know, we're really they they recommend that we're supposed to wash those every day. You're supposed to have a, a fresh mask every day. Uh, as soon as your cloth mask gets a little bit moist. You know that you you're not supposed to keep wearing that thing. So um, uh, I I think shields may initially cost a little more, but you wouldn't have to keep changing them and be much easier to care for. Uh, I just think they're they are a a better option. But um, moving away from that, Madam Madam Chair, I I don't think we stated this evening when it is that we would expect parents to let us know which option they would choose. And so do we gonna have a firm deadline on that? Like, would that be by August 1st? Or maybe Dr. Balgoman would wanna weigh in on that one. Yeah, and I'll yield to her because we, we I believe they have a date uh, once we vote, uh, and I don't wanna misspeak, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, go right ahead. So that is correct, Madam Chair and Board Members. We were looking at as to as soon as the, the plan is approved to go ahead and send the survey out. Well, 
it's a pre-registration that we'll be sending out to obtain those numbers so that we can begin the planning process. But if you would like, I mean, the plan is not approved, but if you would like for us to just go ahead and capture some data between now, and again, it will be a very short, uh, you know, if, if we were to send it out tomorrow, we just have the weekend and Monday to obtain that data. I don't think it's, it's enough time. At least we want to be able to provide a full week um, to our parents to be able to submit that information to us. But we will follow your, your direction either way. Well, I, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Sure. Yes, I was just going to say I would think that uh, uh, that's a very important decision uh, for each for each parent, and I'm, I'm sure some of them are going to really, uh, you know, have a little angst over that, and uh, would probably want to wait to the last minute to kind of see how things are going. Um, but on the same time, I realize from the staffing side of it, uh, the district would need to know, you know, how many children are going to be in each option so that you can staff teachers and assign the teachers and then give the teachers the appropriate training that they'll need to be ready for the type of instruction they're going to be expected to deliver. Um, so Dr. Balgobin, I don't know what the right answer is on that. I don't know how much lead time uh, obviously, if we don't start school to the 24th or the 31st or whatever day it is, are you thinking that you need three weeks out from the start date of school? Or uh, the more, more time, the more time we have, Mr. Persis, the better. Um, if it's okay with the board, I would prefer to send us be able to send a survey out tomorrow to start capturing that data for this innovative model. Obviously, it's pending. Um, it will be pending approval by um, Florida DOE, and we need to hash out some more details with Ms. Halbert. But if it's okay with everyone, I'll, I like. I would like to send it out early. But if not, we can always wait for okay. after the plan is approved. Yeah, and then as far as a deadline goes, though, when would you, you know, really want to have it? Like I said, the earlier, the, be the better for us. Um, but we know that we have a meeting next Tuesday for the, the reopening plan to be approved. So I would say any time after that, um, as soon as we can get those results, it would be best. So if, if I were to do, um, I would say not, probably not next week, but I would hope that we can have some numbers in by the following Monday. Okay, so we can so convene with our teams and start looking at the um, staffing and what, um, how many numbers we have for each model, what would that entail, and begin the detailed planning that would be required. So then perhaps uh, July 27th, that one, um, give I'm parents to think about it over, the, over that weekend, too? Yep. Uh, yes, sir. I don't have my schedule up here, but let me see. Yep. Yep. Yes, sir. And then, of course, of course, here's the here's the other side of that. Uh, parents can tell us one thing on July 27th and have the right to change their mind, right? Uh, on August 23rd. Uh, I mean, I'm sure. Correct. Uh, yeah. Correct. That's going to happen. And, and there will be a process. Once we receive those um, pre-registration, there will be a system that we will put in place to start looking, it will be by school. We will lo be looking for each school, you know, for each school. It, we will have principals involved, so it will be a whole team of us that will be working on, on those uh, pre-registration forms. Yeah, and sounds... there, will be, there will be communication going out to the parents that if they were to had an opportunity, if they were to change their mind on their option, what the process would be to follow. Great, great, so thank you so much. Out. Thank you, Madam Chair, sorry to, uh keep the conversation going. I know you're trying to wrap it up. No, no, no you're fine. No, because this is, this is our time. Go, go ahead, Mr. Colon. And so I also agree with doing the survey actually after we finalize the plan, because at that point, the parents will have the final information, whether, you know, what precautions, whether we decide on mask, face shield, whatever, you know, to put it out right now, maybe uh, sort of um, early, especially for those who are considered in that option B. 
Now, for parents who are absolutely positively sure that they, uh, after hearing the preliminaries of this, you're absolutely sure and you are able and you think you're going to be doing virtual school, the sooner you can sign up, the better, because we have to plan and allocate teachers that way. So if you've already made up your mind, you were on the fence, if you need to see more information, then absolutely after that. But uh, you could visit our Volusia online website. And again, the, the more leeway we have, the more prepared we could be to get those teachers ready to be able to be uh, prepared in time to serve our students because this is going to be a moving target. It's going to be like, uh, what do they say, nailing jello on the wall. Um, and I want to I want to close with one last statement, and it's this, is having lived COVID on the healthcare side of it as well as in education, I can tell you that although August will be here tomorrow in COVID years, August is like 10 years away. Uh, things change every single day, and so... Uh, like the superintendent started with early, this is a uh, fluid plan, and, and I don't want to, I can't emphasize that enough. I've seen how um, a lot of the practices that we've had have changed in just a few weeks. So uh, if you're going to sign up for VOL, do it. It's awesome, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cuthbert? Ah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, make make whether you have a, fe a mask or shield, it needs to be simple, um, because kids will forget where they wear it and where they don't wear it. Whatever they put on, they should have on the, the whole day. That's the best practice, um, except for maybe lunch when they're eating. A bus driver should be wearing a shield, maybe not a mask. We don't want to impede any sight, but I think it's very important to make it as simple to follow as possible and you have to remember if teachers are on campus then they're the ones that are going to have to end up enforcing all this and so it's it as long as the kids can remember it it's just like cell phones first of all you can only have it on in class for a short while with B BYO and uh, bring your own and then it was you could only have them in the hallways and then they're they're all everywhere so it's kind of gotten away with us. So we, we have to make it simple. And my last comment, um, I just want to say congratulations to Dr. Balgobin on her first meeting as <laughs> interim superintendent. I know um, she bit off the big piece of cheese today uh, with this uh, tremendous, probably one of the most controversial meetings uh, she will have besides maybe next week. So thank you. Uh, you are a real trooper tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Cupcake. And good night, everyone. Uh -huh. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Uh, do you have something to say? No? Okay. Well, with that said, thank you for joining, and we look forward to seeing all of you next Tuesday at 4.30. Have a good evening. Good evening. Good, good evening. Turn.